Periphysian Book 4. In the first book of this our philosophy of nature it was our object to prove that the uncreated creative cause of all things which exist and all things which do not exist, the sole principle, origin, and universal source of all, which itself proceeds from nothing while from it proceed all things, the trinity which in three substances is co-essential, and which, itself, that is, without beginning, is the beginning and the end, the one good, the one God, and that is, co-essential and super-essential, is in fact an or super-essential nature, that was our principal theme. For a Saint Epiphanius, the Bishop of Constantia in Cyprus, says in his Ancaratus, or Discourse on Faith, the three holies have a common holiness, and the three agents a common activity, the three designers design in unity and the three workers are three who work as one, and the three which subsist have a subsistence common to all three, each existing for the sake of the others. This is called the Holy Trinity, in which there are three who exist, one accord, one deity of the same essence, of the same power, of the same subsistence, and holding all similar things in common likewise, for the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit operates an equality of grace. But how they are what they are we must leave to them to teach us. For no one has known the Father save the Son, and no one has known the Son save the Father, and him to whomsoever the Son has revealed himself, and this revelation is brought about through the Holy Spirit. Therefore these three existence, existence from himself, through himself or in himself, are suitably known by each one in proportion as, that is light, fire and spirit, reveal themselves. Such, as I say, was the teaching of Epiphanius to supply an orthodox answer to the question, what ought we to believe about the three in the Holy Trinity? And what about the one? And to instruct those who seek after faith. And it seems to me that he was employing the allegory of light, fire, and heat, substituting spirit for the last. It need not worry us that he puts light before fire, for the Father is light and fire and heat, and the Son is light and fire and heat, and the Holy Spirit light and fire and heat. For the Father illumines, the Son illumines, and the Holy Spirit illumines, that is to say, all wisdom and knowledge are the gifts of all three the Father burns, the Son burns, and the Holy Spirit burns, for together they burn away our transgressions and transmute us, a burnt offering, by the action of our deification, into the unity which is theirs the Father warms, the Son warms, and the Holy Spirit warms, for with one and the same heat of love they cherish us and nourish us, and so lead us forth from the kind of formlessness of our imperfection which was the result of the transgression of the first man, to the perfection of man when the era of Christ shall be fulfilled. Now, the perfection of man is Christ, in whom all is consummated, and the fulfillment of his era is the consummation of the salvation of the Catholic Church, which is established among angels and among men. In the second book we considered the nature which creates and is created, and decided that it subsists in the principles of things, or their primordial causes. For this nature on the one hand is created by that single universal cause and supreme goodness whose property it is by its unspeakable power to lead all things forth from non-existence into existence, and on the other hand does not cease to create the things which come after it, by means of their participation in it. The third book treats of the nature which is created but does not create, that is to say, of the ultimate effects of the primordial causes. These hold the lowest estate of nature. For the devolution of the universe ceases with them having no further place whither to descend, for it is now established in the realm of corporeal objects. But in this book we also gave considerable attention to the primordial causes and to God, to his image which is reflected in mind, reason, and sense, and we inquired what kind of nothing that was from which God created all things, and how it could be that the only begotten word of God both makes all things and is made in all. We also briefly discussed the works of the first intelligible week, up to the sixth day. Now we come to the fourth book which starts with the works of the sixth prophetic meditation of the creation of the universe, goes on to consider the return of all things into that nature which neither creates nor is created, and so brings our work to its conclusion. The difficulty of this part of our theme, the conflict and clash of different interpretations, I find so formidable that in comparison to it the first three books seem like a smooth sea upon which, because of the calmness of the waves, readers could sail without fear of shipwreck, steering a safe course. Now, however, we enter upon a voyage where the course has to be picked from the mass of tortuous digressions, where we have to climb the steeps of obscure doctrines, encounter the region of the Surtees, that is to say, the dangers of the currents of unfamiliar teaching, ever in immediate danger of shipwreck in the obscurity of the subtlest intellects, which like concealed rocks may suddenly split our vessel, and the length of this course is such that we must endure it even into a fifth. Book.
nevertheless, with the mercy of God as our captain and steersman and our sails filled with the propitious wind of his spirit. We shall pick through all these dangers the true and safe course. And reach the harbour which we seek, free and unhurt after a smooth voyage. Let us spread sails, then, and set out to sea. For reason, not inexperienced in these waters, fearing neither the threats of the waves nor windings nor the surties nor rocks, shall speed our course, indeed she finds it sweeter to exercise her skill in the hidden straits of the ocean of divinity than idly to bask in the smooth and open waters, where she cannot display her power. For, in the sweat of her brow is she to get her bread, so is she commanded by the word of God, and to till the field of holy scripture, prolific as it is of thorns and thistles, that is to give herself to the narrow density of divine understandings, and to follow with the unflagging steps of investigation the study of wisdom, undaunted by the seeming impassibility of the path, until she find the place of the Lord, the tabernacle of the God of Jacob, that is to say, until the grace of God leading and helping and aiding and moving her by patient and assiduous study of the Holy Scriptures. She may return and reach again that which in the fall of the first man she had lost. The contemplation of truth, and reaching it she may love it, and loving it she may abide in it, and abiding in it she may there find her rest. God also said, Let the earth bring forth a living soul in its genus, cattle and reptiles and the beasts of the field according to their species, etc. Let the earth bring forth a living soul. That is to say, let the earth bring forth a living animal. This figure of speech, very common in the scriptural writings, is called or conceptio, for the concept of the whole is implied in the naming of the part, or that of the part in the naming of the whole. So the word soul by itself frequently in the scriptures signifies the whole animal. Thus in the Acts of the Apostles it is said, we were in the ship 270 souls, the souls, of course, were not there without the bodies. And in Genesis, all the souls of the house of Jacob which entered into Egypt were seventy. In the Gospel the word flesh signifies the whole man, and the word was made flesh means that the word was made a complete man, consisting of flesh, soul and mind. And where it is said in another place, the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak, by the flesh is meant the whole of his humanity. And by the spirit the Holy Spirit, which was indeed in the stress of his passion a ready helper for him in his task of redeeming the human race. It is that spirit which when he was nailed to the cross he commended to his father, saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, which is as much as to say, into thy hands I commend the spirit which proceedeth from thee and from me, for he is incapable of suffering. I alone shall suffer in the flesh, for I alone put on flesh, and was made flesh. I do not mean that even he, in his Godhead, is capable of suffering but that with the humanity which he alone put on he was subjected to the capacity for suffering, its actual passion and its death. These things he suffered together with the manhood which he had taken into the unity of his substance. Since then it is rightly said that he partook of the suffering of his manhood, it is equally true to say that he suffered. For the substance of the word and of the man is one, and is not divided in the passion. And if you require a more certain support from authority, hear what the same Epiphanius says in his discourse on faith, he died for us once. Consenting to bear suffering for our sufferings. He once tasted death, even the death of the cross, willingly for us the word encountered death, that it might destroy death, the word was made flesh. And while it did not suffer in its Godhead, in its incapacity for suffering it partook of the suffering of its manhood. It remains incapable of passion, and yet the passion is attributed to it, death is attributed to it, and yet it remains in immortality, for he himself has said, I am the life, and life never dies, but accepting death on our behalf, he came to bring us life. For life came to us not through man, nor hope through the flesh. For, cursed be he, he says, who places his hope in man, and, whoso putteth his trust in man is like the tamarisk of the field. What conclusion, then, shall we draw from this? Does it not appear from what we have said that Christ is man? That he is so must be clear to everyone, for we unreservedly confess that the word our Lord was made man, this is not a matter of opinion but of truth. But the man was not one who had achieved Godhead. For not in man did our hope of salvation lie, not one of all the men since Adam could have achieved it. But God the word was made man that our hope should not depend upon man but upon the true and living God made man. For it is written that every high priest chosen from amongst men is constituted for the service of men. Therefore the Lord when he came took flesh of our humanity, and God the Word was made man for us, so that in his Godhead we might obtain salvation, while in his manhood he might bear the sufferings of us men, by his passion resolving our passion and by his death slaying death itself. 
but suffering is attributed to the deity, and yet the deity does not suffer, suffering is attributed to the deity because so the word, which is holy and cannot suffer, willed when it came. We may think in this connection of a man who puts on a garment which has been soiled by stains of blood, although the blood is upon the garment it does not touch the body of him who wears it. Although it be said of the wearer that he is soiled by the blood, in just such a way Christ is said to have suffered in the flesh. That is to say, in the man whom our Lord became, and such a change in himself wrought the holy God the word when he came down from heaven, as the blessed Peter writes, mortified in the flesh, but living in the spirit, and again, therefore Christ suffering for us in the flesh, we ourselves are fortified by this knowledge, thus as the blood upon the garment is attributed to the wearer, so the passion of the flesh is attributed in his case to the Godhead, although the Godhead suffers. Nothing. So that the world's hope reposes not in men but in the man whom the Lord became, but when he took upon himself again his Godhead, the passion was attributed thereto, so that the world might owe its salvation to the impassable Godhead. As the passion was endured in the flesh, so the attribution of passion was endured in the Godhead, who neither suffered nor endured, that the scripture might be fulfilled which says, if they had known they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. So he is crucified, the Lord is crucified, and we adore him crucified, buried, rising on the third day, and ascending to the heavens. But that you may know that it was concerning none other than the Spirit that was spoken the words, Father into thy hands I commend my spirit, refer once again to the same treatise of Epiphanius, when you hear it said that he ascended to the right hand of the Father and obtained from the Father the promise of the Spirit, or the words, to await the promise of the Father which you heard from me or, the Spirit sent him into the wilderness, or the words which he himself spake, give no thought of what ye shall say, for it is the Spirit of my Father which speaketh in you, or, but if I by the Spirit of God cast out devils, or, but whosoever blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, etc. Or, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, or, but the boy grew and was strengthened by the spirit, but Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan, or, Jesus returned in the power of the spirit, or, that which is born of the spirit is spirit, or, and I shall ask my father, and he shall send you another comforter, the spirit of truth, or, because Satan has filled your heart, said Peter to Ananias. You lie to the Holy Spirit, and later on, you did not lie to them, but to God, from all these it follows that from God proceeds God, that is, the Holy Spirit. So much from Epiphanius. Although this digression seems to have taken us some way from our subject, it is valuable for those who wish to understand the Holy Scriptures. For from it we have learnt that the Godhead of the Word is incapable of suffering, and yet shares in the suffering of its humanity. And this agrees with what our Lord has said in his gospel, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, and again, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, where he is speaking of no other spirit than the Holy Spirit. But we must return to our subject. Let the earth bring forth the living soul, that is to say, let the earth bring forth the living animal. Note the beauty of this figure, mentioned already, of the part for the whole, whereby the whole animal is indicated by its better part, the soul. And since of the whole animal the lower part, the body, is derived from the earth, this same phrase is a command to the whole animal, body and soul, to be produced from the earth. For although the soul has nothing earthly about it since it is not a body, yet since it combines with the body to produce the unity of the animal, the scriptures can say that it too is formed from the earth. But if an inquiry is desired into the higher meaning of this passage, it can be interpreted in another way, we are wont to use the word earth, to signify the constant mass of the totality of substantial nature. Including both the visibles and the invisibles, everything in fact which we speculated to have come into being on the third day. Hence, when the Apostle says, mortify your members which are above the earth, he means us to mortify the members of our wickedness which are ours not because God created them, but as a result of our disobedience, so that above the earth, that is, in addition to the mass of nature which was created by God, we have built up, as it were, the body of universal sin. It is this that we must mortify lest we be any longer defiled by it. And in the place of the members of wickedness which we have destroyed, we should establish the members of righteousness, that is to say, the virtues, so that in the same way as we, by our various vices, constructed upon the nature which God had created an abominable temple fit only for the habitation of the devil, so we should now build anew from the bricks of our virtues, which by the grace of God have been supplied to us, a house acceptable to its creator, that is, to the creator of nature itself, from which all taint of evil should be cleansed and done away. This interpretation accords with the words of the psalmist, sinners and evildoers shall perish from the earth so as not to be. 
For here by another figure the effect signifies the cause, and by sinners and evildoers are meant sins and evils, which shall perish from the earth of nature when it is freed from all evil. So as no longer to exist for as long as our nature is held subject to sin and evil. So long will they appear to be, although in fact they are not, but when our nature is purged of them and returns to her former purity, all things which have no subsistence of themselves, that is to say, sin and evil, shall revert to utter nothingness, so as no longer to exist. In another place the psalmist in the name of a righteous liver bestows his blessing upon all the righteous. They shall be like a tree that is planted by the waterside, that is to say, like the word which was made flesh for our sakes at the end of all the ages. For the apostle says that upon us, the ends of the ages have come down, using the plural for the singular end of all, namely Christ. For he is, the ends of the ages, because he is the consummation of all things. The psalmist continues, not thus shall it be with the wicked, not thus but they shall be as the dust which the wind bloweth from the face of the earth. Calling the dispensation of the righteous judgment a wind because it is by that. With a winnowing fan in his hand, that he dispels the dust of all evil from the surface of the earth, that is to say, from the loveliness of the substance of nature. In another psalm the writer says of this earth, his spirit shall go forth and shall return again unto his own country. Whose spirit, surely his who, when nailed to the cross for us, drooped his head and gave up his spirit. And whither is it to go forth? He descended into hell. For what purpose? To lead out our human nature which had been held in bondage there, for he led captivity captive. But since death was not able to hold captive him in whom she found no sin, he returns again to his own country, he reverts to his own nature, the nature which he had created, redeemed, and made his own, he puts on the body of immortality, the first state of man's nature, and in addition the glory of his own resurrection and that you may know that he who promised that his spirit should go forth alone, shall himself return not alone, but bringing the whole of human nature with him, hear his very words, if a grain of wheat fall not into the earth and die, it remains alone, but if it shall have died it beareth much fruit. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, he says, and shalt renew the face of the earth, that is to say, thou shalt restore the integrity of nature. And the spirit may be taken to refer to the soul of Christ which, at the drooping of his head, signifying the condescension of the deity to participation in the passion, was given over for the world's salvation, and it went out and returned to that nature which it had redeemed by its mission, and it was sent forth to restore the beauty of the nature which was destroyed in the first man, or the spirit may be taken to refer to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, who bowing his head, which is Christ, was given over in the passing death of the flesh. For the universal creature, of which he is the firstborn whose spirit he is he shall go forth and return again unto his own country, that is to say, into that nature which he had abandoned because of the sin of the first man, for that was his own until it transgressed and was abandoned by him, but he returns to it again for the sake of him whose spirit he is and who endured the passion on its behalf, and at the time of the resurrection he shall return again in yet fuller measure. And he shall be sent to restore by his power to its former glory the countenance of the universal nature. Therefore, seeing that on this earth that is common to us all, every animal was causally and primordially created as soul and body, for all things were created in an honourable state, why should we be surprised that the divine precept ordained that there should be brought forth the living soul, that is, the living animal, which is simply the evolution into the tangible state of genus and species of those properties which it already contained latently in their reasons and causes. And see how the sacred text declares to us the natural sequence of events, let the earth bring forth the living soul in its genus. Genus is mentioned first because all species are contained in it and achieve their unity in it, just as genus achieves its multiplicity by division into the general forms and differentiated species. A process which is also revealed in the words, cattle and reptiles and beasts of the field after their species. From this we may see that that art which concerns itself with the division of genera into species and the resolution of species into genera, which is called did not arise from human contrivances, but was first implanted in nature by the originator of all the arts that are properly so called, and was later discovered therein by the sages who make use of it in their subtle investigations of reality. From what you have said, and I find no fault in it, one could if one wished interpret in another way the text, let the waters bring forth of living souls both creeping things and things that fly above the earth. For not only can this mean simply that fishes and birds were created from the moist and cold element of water which we can touch and see, but it is also capable of a higher significance relative to the deeply hidden recesses of nature in which these were created in their primordial causes before they evolved into their genera and species. For if we can take earth to mean the mass and fertility of nature, what is to prevent us from taking water to mean her concealed depths? 
In which case, for all animals, whether we are taught that they come from land or sea, we should recognize one and the same ultimate source, in spite of the fact that we speculate on them as separated, for some were created on the fifth prophetic day, and others on the sixth. And I believe there is a reason for this. For it seems likely that the earth was commanded to bring forth the land animals on the sixth day, the day of the creation of man also, because their nature appears to exhibit a closer resemblance to that of man. For accepting reason and intellect, there is nothing in the nature of the human animal which the naturalist may not also observe in these others. Far from anything preventing us, reason herself, in my opinion, if we could but listen to her more carefully, insists that we should understand the relation which exists between the sacred texts and reality. For there are many ways, indeed an infinite number, of interpreting the scriptures, just as in one and the same feather of a peacock and even in a single small portion of the feather, we see a marvelously beautiful variety of innumerable colors. And this variety of interpretation is not contrary to nature, for this tangible earth and water are bodies composed of the qualities of the four elements, and they bring forth nothing of themselves and in spite of all appearance no natural species is born of them. No, it is by the operation of that life force which is called the nutritive, in accordance with the laws and principles which were implanted in those elements, that the potency of the seeds which they contain bursts forth from the secret recesses of creation. As far as it is permitted by the divine providence. Through the genera and the forms into the different species of grasses, twigs, and animals, so that the coming into being of all things which appear to be born of earth and water originates from the same source whence the elements themselves have issued forth into their natural species and qualities and quantities. For there is a most general nature in which all things participate, which is created by the one universal principle. And from this nature corporeal creatures are derived and can be likened to streams which, issuing from one all-providing source, pursue their different courses through subterranean channels until they break out above ground in the different forms of the individual objects of nature. For the potency which I have mentioned, coming forth from the hidden places of nature through the various seeds, first declares itself in those seeds, and then mixed with various fluids pullulates into the distinct species of the sensibles. Your account is logical and likely, for it accords with the observations of the naturalists. But since man, who was created on the sixth day, is thus set among the number of the animals, and comprehended under one genus with them, I should like to hear from you whether or not his creation is also included within the divine precept which commanded the earth to bring forth the living soul. This would be a hard question to answer if the scriptures merely said, let the earth bring forth the living soul. But the addition of the words, in its genus, makes it quite clear that this precept applies to all the animals for there is no species which is not wholly included in its genus. It is true that the species of animal which is established in man is superior by virtue of reason and intelligence to the nature of the animals, and is only placed in that genus by the foresight of the prophet's contemplation in order that he might describe his creation more spaciously, and in greater detail at the conclusion of all the things which God created. Thus he records this greatest and most precious species of animal twice in his vision of the events of the sixth day, first, under his genus, which is animal, he is commanded to be brought forth from the earth, and then somewhat later he is separated a little from the rest of the animals. And mention is made of his creation as image and likeness of God. A single form, then, is first brought forth out of the earth together with the other animals, and a little later is said to be made in the image of God. Not unreasonably, I am troubled about this. For if the whole of that genus which is called animal with all its species was made in the image and likeness of God I should perhaps find nothing surprising in your doctrine that man was first brought forth from the earth with the rest of the animals and then a little later was made in the image and likeness of God, but since in fact the sacred narrative relates that only man, and no other animal but man, was created in the image of God, I find it somewhat strange that man was brought forth from the earth with cattle, beasts of the field and reptiles, and yet he alone is formed in the image of God, and so removed far beyond all comparison with the rest of the animal kingdom, for it is written, Let us make man in our image and likeness. And I find it stranger still that he was brought forth together with those over whom he is preferred and ordained to be master. For the scriptures go on to say, And let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the universal creature and over every creeping thing that moves upon the earth. Yes. You have good and reasonable cause for finding this strange, for these matters demand a most cautious and searching investigation. First let us establish beyond the shadow of any doubt that man was in fact established within the universal genus of the animals. The best proof of it is that this genus falls into three groups, cattle, reptiles, and beasts of the field. For there is, I think, a reason for this division. 
On the other days, the third for instance and the fifth, in which mention is made of genera and species, there is no analysis of the genus into its species, either simply the genus alone with its species undiscriminated is given, as on the third day, on which the earth was commanded to put forth the genera and species of grass and twigs, or only the genus and one of its species, as on the fifth, when the genus of fish is called reptile, and the genus of birds volatile, without in either case discrimination into species. For where it is said, and God created the great sea monsters, it is rather a question of substituting species for genus than of analyzing the genus into its species. For how could a genus be analyzed into one species, seeing that no analysis discovers less than two components? But on the sixth day not only do we have a description of the genus but also of its division into three species. For it is written, God said, Let the earth bring forth the living soul in its genus, cattle and creeping things and the beasts of the earth after their species, or as the Septuagint has it, God said, Let the earth bring forth the living soul according to its genus, four-footed things, reptiles and beasts according to their genus, and so it was done. I believe, therefore, that this threefold division implies a threefold motion in the form of life which adheres to the bodies of the land animals and affects the union of soul to body, for the animal is the meeting place of soul and body in sensation. But this threefold motion becomes intelligible in man only, the only rational animal. For subject to his reason he has certain motions which may be symbolized by the word cattle, or four-footed things. For instance, by his skilled zeal to understand the sensibles he moves his fivefold sense in disciplined order towards cognition of them, and to this motion it is reasonable to give the name of cattle, for it is of no small assistance to the rational soul in acquiring true and accurate knowledge of all the sensibles, dispelling all fossid. For there is, as it were, a kind of four-footed motion of the senses subject to reason. For everything in sensible nature of which we obtain knowledge through the sense is composed of four elements, or rather is constituted out of such a composition. For consider the corporeal species and you will see that of whatever material each is composed it exhibits the qualities of the four elements. Whatever you hear or smell you may be sure is a product of the air of the four elements, and in like manner whatever you taste or touch arises from the combination of earth and water. So the term quadruped is not inappropriate to the bodily sense, seeing that every sensible has its origin in the four elements and nowhere else. But there are certain motions arising from the lower nature which might correctly be termed irrationals, which are resistant to reason. These, such as rage and covetousness and all the inordinate appetites of the corporeal senses, are wrongly attributed to sensible creatures. And since these motions which infect human nature belong properly to the brute creation, they are not improperly called beasts, especially as they are in continual revolt against the discipline of reason, and can rarely, if ever, be tamed thereby, but are ever seeking to attack savagely and devour the rational motions. Moreover in the rational animal there are certain other motions, though not manifesting themselves, by which the body joined to that nature is administered. These motions are situated in the octave and nutritive part of the soul. And since they perform their functions by their natural facility and as it were hiddenly, for they in no way agitate or disturb the disposition of the soul but, provided that the integrity of nature is preserved intact, pervade by a silent progress the harmony of the body, they are therefore not improperly given the name of reptiles. Now in all animals except man two only of these aforesaid three types of motion are found, that which resides in the sense and strictly speaking lacks the control of reason, and is therefore called bestial, and that which is attributed to the nutritive life force, and resembles the reptile. Man participates in these together with all other animals, and conversely all the other animals participate in them in common with him. Do you now see how it is that man is in all animals and all animals in him? And that yet he transcends them all? And if anyone look more closely into the admirable and well-nigh ineffable constitution of nature herself, he will clearly see that the same man is a species of the genus animal and also transcends every animal species, and thus admits an affirmation and a negation, for it may rightly be predicated of him, man is an animal, and, man is not an animal. For when consideration is given to his body and his nutritive life force, to his senses and to his memory of sensibles, and to all his irrational appetites, such as rage and covetousness, he is altogether an animal, for all these he shares in common with all the other animals. But in his higher nature, which consists in reason and mind and the interior sense, with all their rational motions, which are called virtues, and with the memory of the eternal and divine things, he is altogether other than animal. For all these attributes he shares with the celestial essences which by the excellence of their substance transcend in a manner beyond our comprehension everything which is contained in the animal nature. Therefore, as we have said, 
it may be claimed with equal justification of man that he is, and is not, an animal. And we may obtain corroboration of this from Holy Scripture. Man in his animal nature, says the Apostle, does not perceive the things of God. And again, man in his spiritual nature judgeth all things, but is himself judged by none. See how clearly, how unambiguously, he divides man into, as it were, two men, of whom one is animal, since his nature resembles that of the animals, which admits nothing spiritual within itself, and the other spiritual, since it has communion with the eternal, spiritual, and divine substances, and is free of all animality. And that part of him by which he is animal is appropriately termed the outer man, while that by which he transcends all other animals as well as the animal part of himself may be called the inner man. For in those who live according to the Spirit, in the words of the same Apostle, the outer man wastes. But the inner man is renewed from day to day. For he who lives perfectly not only altogether despises his body and the life force which administers it and all the corporeal senses together with the objects which they perceive, and all the irrational motions which he perceives in himself, together with the memory of all transient things, but also, in so far as he is able, does away with them and destroys them, lest they should in any way prevail within him and strives that he may become dead to them and they to him. But that part of him by which he partakes of the celestial essence he renews from day to day, that is, he ascends from virtue to virtue by the movement and cooperation and leadership and perfecting power of the grace of God. And that nature through which man is in communion with the animals is called the flesh, and that by which he participates in the celestial essence is called mind or spirit or intellect. Hear what the Apostle says, By my mind I serve the law of God, but by flesh the law of sin. And this has the support of innumerable other texts of Holy Scripture. So, what is there so remarkable in the fact that man is understood to have a twofold creation, seeing that he himself is in a manner of speaking a twofold creature? That in him which resembles the animals was created with the animals, and that which resembles the spiritual creatures was created in itself and absolutely with the spiritual creatures. Let not your mind therefore be troubled that I said that man was produced out of the earth in one and the same genus as the rest of the animals, and yet is made in the image and likeness of God beyond all animal nature. My mind would not perhaps be so troubled if it could realize more clearly how the creation of man can be such that he is of one and the same genus as the rest of the animals, and yet in his better part transcends all animal nature. I cannot understand why you wish me to repeat myself. For we have said already that man, in so far as he is an animal, is found among the animals in one genus, but that in so far as he is not an animal, he was created outside every genus of all the animals. Alas, a still greater and far harder problem, I think, arises. Be good enough to tell me what it is. Your opinion, I think, is that two souls coexist in the same man, of which one administers the body, giving it life and nourishment and increase, and perceives the sensibles by means of the corporeal senses and stores the fantasies of them in its memory, and performs all the other functions which it is well known are performed by the souls of the other animals, while the other, which subsists in the reason and the mind, is made in the image and likeness of God. But this seems altogether absurd. Neither reason nor divine authority would permit me to hold that in the one man there are two souls. Indeed, they would forbid it, and it is not right that any true philosopher should maintain such an opinion. Rather I declare that man consists of one and the same rational soul conjoined to the body in a mysterious manner, and that it is by a certain wonderful and intelligible division that man himself is divided into two parts, in one of which he is created in the image and the likeness of the Creator, and participates in no animality but is utterly removed therefrom while in the other he communicates with the animal nature and was produced out of the earth, that is to say, out of the common nature of all things, and is included in the universal genus of the animals. What, then, shall we say? Can the human soul be described as a certain single nature free from all composition or are we asked to believe that its unity is composed of a number of parts? To one thing I hold most firmly, that the soul is simple and lacks all composition of parts, and one thing I utterly reject, that it receives into its nature any kind of composition whatsoever of parts which differ from one another. For it is whole in itself and its wholeness pervades the whole of its nature. For it is holy life, holy mind, holy reason, holy sense, holy memory. And it is as a whole that it gives life, nourishment, consistency and increase to the body. 
As a whole it perceives the sensible species through the whole of its senses, as a whole it operates beyond the bounds of the bodily senses and treats, separates, combines and forms judgment upon the nature and order of the universe, as a whole it extends beyond and above every creature, including even itself in so far as it is itself reckoned among the numbers of the creatures, and, purged from all vices and all fantasies, revolves about its creator in an eternal and intelligible motion. And since it is thus by nature simple, its division into the intelligible and substantial differentiations as it were of a whole into its parts is in accord with the plurality of its motions. This is the reason for the many names under which it goes. For when it is occupied with the divine essence it is called mind and spirit and intellect, when it is occupied with the natures and causes of creation it is called discursive reason, when it receives the species of the Sensibles through the corporeal senses, it is called sense, when after the manner of the irrational animals it performs those hidden operations within the body which give it nourishment and increase, its proper name is vital motion. But in all these cases it is everywhere whole. Therefore the whole soul is on the one hand produced from the earth in the genus of the animals, and on the other hand is made in the image of God. For this and nothing else is what must follow from the foregoing arguments. Just so. And no true and orthodox philosopher should doubt it, lest he appear impiously to rend in twain this most simple and indivisible nature. I still do not see how one and the same man can, as this discussion seeks to demonstrate, be, and yet not be, an animal, possess, and yet not possess, animality, be, and yet not be, flesh, be, and yet not be, spirit. How can such contradictory and mutually opposed predicates be understood of one absolutely simple nature? From what has already been said it should be as clear as day to anyone who looks into the matter more carefully that everything which seems to you to be contrary to the simplicity of human nature is in fact not only not contrary to but is entirely suitable. For among the wise it is maintained that in man is contained the universal creature. For, like the angel, he enjoys the use of mind and discursive reason, and like the animal, the use of physical sense and the capacity to administer his body, and therefore his nature is understood to include that of every creature. For the whole of creation is divided into five parts, the creature may be either a body, or a living being, or a sensible being, or a rational being, or an intellectual being. And all these five parts are in every way found in man. For he possesses in his body the basis of his subsistence, then a seminal life to administer that body, sense to preside over that life, then reason to govern the natural parts that are inferior to itself, and finally spirit. Which holds the highest place of all. And so all human nature, in what it shares with the other animals, is truly animal nature. What it shares with them is body, the life which controls the body, and the sense together with the memory which draws from it the fantasies of sensible objects. But insofar as it participates in the divine and celestial essence, human nature is not animal nature, for it participates in the celestial essence by reason and intellect and memory of eternal things. Here it is entirely free from all taint of animality. For in this part of itself it is made in the image of God, and it is with this part only, in men who are apt for it, that God holds converse. For it is to that part of man that he speaks, writes Saint Augustine in the eleventh book of the City of God, because it is better than the other parts of which man is composed, and God himself alone is better than that part. For since man is made in the image of God, he straightway is nearer to God, who is superior to him, in that part of himself by which he transcends the natures which are below him those natures which he shares in common with the beasts. And be it noted that even in this life, even before the time when all that is animal in man becomes spiritual and all that is composite is made one in an ineffable simplicity, the whole man can be both an animal and a spiritual creature, but while it is only by the freedom of his will that he is animal, he is spiritual by the combined operation of free will and of grace, for without the latter the innate power of the will is quite insufficient to convert man into spirit. Therefore man becomes animal, and is so described, when he abandons those operations which accord with reason and intellect and are concerned with the knowledge of the creator and of creation, for those irrational activities which among the brute beasts are concerned with the appetites of the body, and falls through his willful appetite. So as to gorge his sensibilities with the deadly allure of the temporal and corruptible things which tend towards non-being. But he becomes spiritual when, turning wholly towards the better and kindled by the fire of divine love. He despises the world and the flesh in all their forms and, abandoning all the activities of animal nature, is wholly transformed into the likeness of the celestial essences, so that in the quality of a life adorned with all the virtues, there is anticipated in him the state to which he is destined by his immutable substance. 
Thus there are two ways of recognizing the animal man, in one, he lives entirely according to nature, in the other, he falls through the irrational motion of his free will tending to evil. The spiritual man also lives according to nature, but also in accordance with good will helped by divine grace, purified by act and knowledge and decked with the adornments of the virtues, he is recalled to the former dignity of the divine image. This I freely accept. But there is still something I am not quite clear about. In the genus all species are one. But how can mutually contradictory species be one in their genus? For the definition of man seems to be in contradiction to those of the other animals. For man is a rational animal, the others are irrational animals. Do you not see how completely opposed to one another are the terms rational and irrational? If you consider the natures of things more carefully you will find that this proposition, which concerns difference, is that we have in the one genus not two contraries but two differentiae. Let us take an example, every creature is either visible or invisible. This distinction is one of difference, not of contradiction. For visibility and invisibility are two properties which are separate from one another but not mutually repugnant. Likewise every creature is either corporeal or incorporeal. Again, in the divine nature there are distinguished the different states of the divine persons. For whereas the Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten and the Spirit is neither begotten nor unbegotten, and there are innumerable examples of the same kind. But to give you a clearer understanding I would ask you to observe that contradiction is always held to be within the same species or part, whereas difference distinguishes one part from another, thus, if speaking of man one were to say of that species of nature which according to its substance is called man. That man is a rational animal and that man is an irrational animal. This would be the statement of a pair of contradictories, of which one will be true and the other false. For contradictory statements of one and the same subject cannot both at the same time be true or both at the same time be false, whether they be of a universal or of a particular application. So when you say, man is a rational animal, horse is an irrational animal, no contradiction arises since the difference of substance between the rational and the irrational animal is made clear. For in allowing reason to man and denying it to horse you indicate the difference between man and horse. For it is precisely this that is man's difference from the other animals, that he possesses reason, just as it is their difference from him that they do not. But no distinction must be made herein between the possession and the lack, for the possession in man's case is the presence of reason, while in the case of the horse the possession is the absence of reason. For the horse is not deprived of that which it never could have possessed. Where there was no antecedent possession there will be no consequent deprivation. Death could never occur to any animal or to any being which participates in life if there had not been an antecedent possession of life. And in like manner it would be wrong to call any animal stupid save that in which we see that the possession of reason was a possibility, nor insensitive save that in which the possession of sense could naturally in. Why, then, did you say that in one and the same subject two mutually contradictory predicates could not be both at the same time false or true? but that if the one were true the other must be false, so in the case were of one and the same animal it is said that it is a horse and not a horse? For now you appear to assert the simultaneous truth of contradictory predicates in man, that man is an animal, and that man is not an animal, and you declare that he possesses this character naturally until his whole animal nature becomes spiritual. And why is this so in the case of man only and not in that of the other animals, in whom it is absolutely true that they are animal and absolutely untrue that they are not animal? Do you believe that any other animal than man was made in the image of God? Certainly not. Do you deny that two mutually adverse predicates can be made of God, and can be true and in no way false, although they are not of the same power, as for instance when it is said that God is truth and that God is not truth? I would not dare to do so, seeing that he himself has said of himself I am the way and the truth and the life. While St. Dionysius the Areopagite says in the symbolic theology that God is neither the truth nor the life for he writes that he is neither power nor light nor life. And a little later neither is he science nor truth. Perhaps Dionysius is contradicting Christ who predicated of himself that he was himself the truth. Impossible. Either statement is true, then, God is truth, and God is not truth. Not only true, but the profoundest truth. The one statement is made by affirmation and by metaphor from the fact that he is the creator and primordial cause of truth, and because it is by participation in him that whatsoever things are true are all true, while the other is made by negation, and relates to that transcendence which is more than truth. And so it is true that God is truth, since he is the cause of all truths, and it is also true that God is not truth, 
transcending as he does everything which can be spoken or can be thought or can exist, nor have I forgotten that you added the words, although both statements are not of the same power, for affirmation is less capable than negation of signifying the ineffable essence of God, seeing that by the former one among the created attributes is transferred to the Creator, whereas by the latter the Creator is conceived in himself beyond every creature. Did well to recall this comment which I added. Why should we then be surprised if man, who alone among the animals is made in the image of God, can truly and simultaneously have it said of him that man is an animal, and that man is not an animal? For by this we at once understand that it belongs to the species of this animal to be specially fashioned after the image of God, concerning whom predicates may be truly and simultaneously made which in the case of other animate creatures are mutually exclusive. And if affirmations and negations of the divine essence coincide for the reason that it transcends all things that were created by it and of which it is the cause, who would not infer that affirmations and negations harmoniously coincide also in the image and likeness of it which is man, seeing that this animal transcends the others among which it is fashioned in the same genus? And is the cause for which they were fashioned? For what true philosopher is unaware that this visible world with all its parts, from the highest to the lowest, was created for the sake of man in order that he might preside over it and be the lord of all visible nature? This is the teaching of Saint Gregory, who in his treatise on the image writes as follows, every creature except man was established somehow by the divine power at the same time as the mandate was given. But before the establishment of man there was a council, and he was prefigured by the Creator through the word of Scripture as to what he should be, and with what quality it were fit to endow him, and after what primal exemplar he should be modelled and of what material he should be made, and what function he should perform, and over what he should be Lord. All these things were first considered by the Word so that before he came forth into being a more venerable rank in the world of becoming was allowed him as one destined to hold sway over all the things that are. For, to quote the holy word, God said. Let us make man in our image and likeness, and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea and over the beasts of the earth and over the birds of the air, and over cattle and over the whole earth. And this was given him whether he sinned or not, although he would not have ruled in the same way if he had not sinned as he rules now that he has sinned. And to make matters clearer, do you suppose that man is an animal in that part which is made in the image of God? or that the image of God subsists in that part in which he was brought forth among the beasts of the field. Or that either the one or the other, that is, either the image or the animal, is not truly to be found in man? To the last question I would say at once that I make no such supposition, for that reasoning is sound which discovers both these aspects in man. But to the former questions, that is, as to whether the image is in the animal and the animal in the image I should reply with an unqualified negative were I not perplexed by something which you said before as to man being everywhere a whole in himself. For from this it appears to me to follow that the whole image must subsist in the whole animal and the whole animal in the whole image throughout the whole man. I am surprised that this should trouble you, seeing that it is precisely herein that the image and likeness of God in human nature can be recognized. For just as God is both beyond all things and in all things, for he who only truly is, is the essence of all things, and while he is whole in all things he does not cease to be whole beyond all things, whole in the world, whole around the world, whole in the sensible creature, whole in the intelligible creature, whole creating the universe, whole created in the universe, whole in the whole of the universe and whole in its parts, since he is both the whole and the part, just as he is. Neither the whole nor the part, in the same way human nature is in its own world, in its own universe and in its visible and invisible parts whole in itself, and whole in its whole, and whole in its parts, and its parts are whole in themselves and whole in the whole. For even the lowest and least valuable part, the body, is according to its own principles whole in the whole man. For the body, in so far as it is truly body, subsists in its own principles which were made at the beginning of creation, and since human nature is so in itself, it goes beyond its whole. For it could not otherwise cleave to its creator if it did not go beyond all the things that are beneath it and beyond itself. For, says Augustine, between our mind by which we know the Father and the truth through which we know him, no creature is interposed. And in a fine passage of the symbolic theology the Areopagite, Dionysius, I mean, Teaches the same thing, O friend Timothy, do you, strengthened by your sojourn among the mystical speculations, abandon not only the senses but also intellectual activities, abandon the sensibles and the invisibles, all non-being and all being, and emptying yourself of all knowledge restore yourself as far as possible to the unity of him who is beyond all essence and all knowledge, for thereby the immeasurable and absolute ecstasy of the mind you will ascend from yourself and all.
things, abandoning all things and liberated from all things, to the superessential ray of the divine darkness. And in the Gospel our Lord says, Where I am there is my servant also. But he is above all things, above all things therefore is the man who cleaves to him, and above himself in so far as he is in all things. And although human nature while sojourning in this mortal life cannot by itself truly cleave to God, yet by the grace of him to whom it cleaves it is both possible and in accordance with its nature to do so, therefore we not improperly say that human nature cleaves to its creator. For experiment is generally regarded as a test of possibility, and that which is bound to happen some day is regarded as though it were already achieved. But why did I say in its own world, in its own universe, when I could more plainly have said in the whole world, both visible and invisible? For humanity is holy in the wholeness of the whole created nature, seeing that in it every creature is fashioned, and in it all are linked together, and into it shall all return, and through it must all be saved. Hear what his Creator says, preach the gospel unto every creature that is, to man. There is mine to be found, their reason, their sense, there the seminal life, there the body, not this corruptible body which is the result of sin, but that which man had before the fall, not this composite and dissoluble body, but that simple and indivisible body, not this animal and earthly body. But that which is spiritual and heavenly, not this body begotten by both sexes from seeds through carnal intercourse but that which was brought forth before the fall out of the simplicity of nature and which is to be in the resurrection, not this body which is known to the corporeal senses, but that which is still hidden in the secret place of nature, not that which was laid upon us in recompense for sin, but that which was already inherent in us in our uncorrupted nature and into which this corruptible and mortal body will be restored. It is sown, says the apostle, meaning that it is born from the seed, in corruption, it will rise in virtue. In what sort of virtue? Surely. In the virtue of that very body which was established according to nature in the beginning. It is sown in derision, it will rise in glory, it is sown an animal body, it will rise a spiritual body. For everything that is created in man according to nature must of necessity remain eternally intact and uncorrupted. For it is not in accordance with the divine justice that anything should perish of that which he has made, especially as it is not nature herself who has sinned, but the perverse will which moves irrationally against rational nature. Now of this there is an excellent proof, if the hatred of death is an innate quality in man, must he not also hold naturally in abhorrence the cause of death, which is sin. And this is something common to all animals, to avoid and fear death and the causes of death. Therefore just as no philosopher wishes to enter into error, so human nature did not wish to sin, and therefore her creator, being just, did not wish to punish her. But rather was it his will to impose upon her that in which might be purged that fault caused by the perversity of the will and the persuasiveness of the serpent, that it might not cleave to her forever. For the reasonable and intellectual nature, although not wishing to be deceived, was not incapable of suffering deceit, especially as she had not yet attained the perfection of her form which she was to receive as the reward of her obedience and by which she was to be transformed in theosis or deification. We ought not therefore to judge human nature as she is manifested to the bodily senses and as in punishment for her fall she undergoes the penalty of being born a temporal and corruptible object into this world by sexual intercourse after the likeness of the irrational animals and whose end is death, but as she was established before the fall in the image of God. A condition in which she eludes in a mysterious way through the ineffable dignity of her nature every bodily sense and all mortal thought. Deceived and fallen, blinded by the murkiness of her depraved will, she has given up to oblivion herself and her Creator. And this is the most wretched feature of her death, and the deepest profundity of her submersion in the fog of ignorance, that she has drifted so far from herself and her Creator and approached in likeness so near and so shamefully the irrational and mortal animals. And from this state none could again redeem her or call her or bring her back or restore her to the former condition from which she fell save the wisdom of God which created her and received her into the unity of substance with him, that thus he might save her and free her from all her woe. Let it then not trouble you that it is said of human nature that it is everywhere a whole in itself, that the image is whole in the animal, and that the animal is whole in the image. For everything which her creator primordially created in her remains whole and intact, though remaining hidden until now, awaiting the revelation of the sons of God. Perhaps I should not be in difficulty if you could clearly convince me of something which I cannot see for myself, for I wonder whether man would have been an animal if he had not sinned, or, to put the question in another way, was man an animal before he sinned? If he was not, why have we toiled so long to seek, and, I think, to find? Man's state in the universal genus of the animals? 
For if he was not created in that genus either before the fall he was not an animal at all, or, if he was, he was fashioned in a different genus of animals. But neither does Holy Scripture make mention of such a thing nor does the most careful inquiry into nature reveal any trace of it. For all animals subsist in a single genus, from which they proceed by divisions. On the other hand, if from the text, let the earth bring forth living soul, we are to assume that man's state before the fall was among the other animals, why does the psalmist bring it against man after the fall as a great disgrace, man when he was held in honor, fell short of intelligence, and became comparable to the irrational cattle, and was made like unto them? Here the prophet seems to make it quite plain that before the fall man held the honor of a spiritual substance transcending the nature of all animals. But that slipping back therefrom and failing to realize the dignity of his nature he fell into the disgrace of a likeness to the beasts of the field. But if he was an animal before the fall, why after the fall is it held against him that he has acquired the likeness of the animals with whom he was in his nature created together in a single genus? You would have reason to raise this question if the prophet had simply said, he became comparable to the cattle, and was made like unto them, but he adds the epithet, irrational and thereby makes it sufficiently clear that this is the chief charge against man, that while he was a spiritual and rational animal in his original state of the image, and likeness of God he foolishly and irrationally acted against the command of his creator and brought upon himself the likeness of the foolish beasts, dishonoring the natural dignity of his nature by a brutish activity which was improper to himself. It is not for being an animal that he is praised, but for being the image of God, neither is it for being an animal that he is blamed, but that he willed to distort the image which he could not destroy. For in the other animals irrational action is not shameful, for it is according to their nature, and they could not be animals without it. But in the rational animal it is a reprehensible distortion of nature to fall by the forbidden concupiscence of a perverse will into the activity of irrational animals. Although to them it is natural, and to desire to remain therein, abandoning the more exalted beauty of the divine image. Rightly indeed is the rational animal blamed for acting in the way of the irrational animals, and rightly to be reprehended is the man of honorable form who of his own free will clothes himself in the form of a beast and hurls himself from that which is the better down to that which is much inferior. But there still remains the question why God created man, whom he wished to make in his image and likeness, in the genus of the animals. For since man had been chosen to be the principal participant in the supernal figure and to be the peer of the celestial essences in whom there is permitted to be no consubstantiality with the terrestrial animals, it would seem a greater honor for him to be constituted free from all animality. For the celestial essences are not weighed down by earthly bodies, nor do they use corporeal senses for knowledge of sensible things. For they do not receive fantasies from without. But know inwardly within themselves the reasons of the things which they perceive. For that matter neither does the soul see outside itself the things which it perceives, but it does have to rely upon inward fantasies of them, which the angels do not require. I grant you that Plato defines the angel as a rational and immortal animal, but if our speculations about the nature of things are to be firmly grounded we ought not rashly to include among them anything which cannot be supported by the authority of Holy Scripture and the Holy Fathers. Again, St. Augustine not only does not deny the possibility that the highest angels have spiritual bodies in which they frequently manifest themselves, but actually asserts that this is so, but we are by no means bound by this to believe that the celestial substances are animals, especially as it is not the harmony and inseparable linking of celestial and incorruptible bodies with angelic spirits which produce an animal, but the joining of earthly and corruptible bodies to rational or irrational souls through the medium of sense. Of course, if the exterior sense were present to the body and the intellect of the angel, nothing would prevent us from saying, as Plato was pleased to do, that the angel, being in that case a composite of body and soul with sense mediating between the two and intellect bringing life to the whole, was an animal, but in that case, why are angels not counted in the genus of the animals? For as to man, he would have been an animal even if he had not sinned, for it was not sin but nature which made an animal of him. Moreover there is no tradition which gives us the authority to say that the angels who sinned were animals, which would logically follow from such an argument. For that future bliss which is promised to the saints is taught to be nothing else but equality with the angelic nature, perfect and lacking in nothing. But who that was truly wise would believe that man's destined transformation was as it were from an inferior to a superior animal, from an earthly to a heavenly animal, from a temporal to an eternal animal, from a mortal to an immortal animal from an unhappy to a blessed animal? Would he not rather believe that all the things which in this life are understood or perceived to be attributes common to devout men and to the other animals are by a certain 
Ineffable mutation changed into that celestial and incommunicable essence which has nothing of animality about it, and that this too would have been the condition of man, had he not sinned? Why then is man created in the genus of the animals which are produced out of the earth, a genus in which he is not destined always to remain? For when this world, of which man is an animal part, shall have perished, all that is animal in man shall perish with it and in it. For it is not reasonable that when the whole shall perish the parts shall escape destruction. Moreover, if the whole world with all its parts is to be destroyed I fail to see how man, in so far as he is a part of the world, could survive the world. Or in what place or in what way? Hence my insistence in begging you to resolve this knotty problem. What you demand is a very advanced physical explanation of man's creation, which will require us to prolong our discussion considerably. When you ask why God should have created man, whom he proposed to make in his own image, in the genus of animals, it should be enough for me to reply briefly that he wished so to fashion him that there might be one among the animals in which his image was expressly manifested. But if one goes on to ask why he wished to do so, he is inquiring into the causes of the divine will, an inquiry which is overpresumptuous and arrogant. For who hath known the sense of the Lord? But if I should say that, you would relapse into an ungrateful silence and consider me incapable of producing a clear and full exposition. While, therefore, I will not tell you why he willed, for that is beyond all understanding, I shall relate, to the extent that he himself has told us, what he willed to do. He has created in man all creatures visible and invisible, for the whole spread of creation is understood to inhere in man. For although after his transgression and the failure of supernal light it is not clear yet how great was the first creation of man, nevertheless there is nothing naturally present in the celestial essences which does not subsist essentially in man. For there is innate in him intellect and reason, as well as the principle of possession of the celestial and angelic body, which after the resurrection shall appear more clearly than light both in the just and the unjust, for it will be common to all human nature to rise again in eternal and incorruptible spiritual bodies. It is sown. He says, an animal body, it is raised a spiritual body. All this sensible world is fashioned in man. No part of it is found, either corporeal or incorporeal, which does not subsist created in man, which does not perceive through him, which does not live through him, which is not incorporated in him. Do not think here of man's physical stature, but rather of his natural potency, particularly bearing in mind that in the human body itself the pupil of the eye, albeit the least of all the members in physical size, yet exerts the greatest power. If then God did not create man in the genus of the animals, or at any rate, if he did not place the whole nature of all animals in man, how would the whole of creation, both visible and invisible, subsist in him? Reason, then, permits us to say that God willed to place man in the genus of the animals for this purpose, that he wished to create every creature in him. And if you ask me why he wished to create every creature in him, I reply, because he wished to make him in his image and likeness, so that, just as the primal archetype transcends all by the excellence of his essence, so his image should transcend all created things in dignity and grace. But as to why it should be man whom he wished to create in his image before all creatures visible and invisible, I confess that I am entirely ignorant. I consider that you have given a sufficient and reasonable reply to my question why God wished to create man in the genus of the animals. But I have a further question to ask, in what way are all things created in man, and how do they subsist in him? Are they in him simply as essence, or simply as accidents, or do they play in him all the roles which we observe in universal creation, that is, essence, species, difference, property, and everything which is understood to relate to them? I am in some difficulty as to how to give a rational answer to that question. For if I reply, simply as essence, you will rightly object that in that case only those things exist which subsist as essences, and other things which are understood to relate to essence or substance are not to be reckoned in the number of the universe of things, in fact are altogether without being, and if this is so, you will ask me, whence are those things which are understood to relate to the essence of existence? If I say that these things were made by God, you will ask, why then are they not included in the sum of the things which were created in man? And if I say that they were not made by God, you will reply that in that case they are not, for if they were, they would not be from any other than the universal cause which is God. And if I grant that those things which are understood to relate to essences are not among the number of existence because they are not from God, you will at once ask, how then do we have understanding of them? For nothing which is not from God can by any means be understood, because it does not exist in any way. 
If I say that not only the essences, but all things which are understood naturally to relate to them are from God and to be numbered among the parts of the whole, I shall undoubtedly be compelled to choose one of the two following alternatives, either that the whole universe of things was not created in man in its entirety, since only the essences were made in him, or that the entire universe of things, that is, the essences and everything which is perceived to relate to them and to in here in them is established in man, but if I say that it is not a part of the universe of things, that is substances, that is constituted in man, but the whole of it, you will follow with the hardest question of all, was irrationality then made in him, and bestiality, quadrupedality, volatility and all the differences of the divers animals and of the other things. Together with all species and properties and accidents and all the other innumerable attributes which seem to be so far removed from human nature that if they were indeed found in man, he would rightly be considered not a man but the foulest of monsters? You have piled up the difficulty of the question, and deliberately raised up against yourself what would have been raised by another, and thus you are in a position either to clear it up or to pass it over as being over abstruse and go on to another, but that would seem a most unsuitable proceeding. Let us then make some attempt to examine it so as not to leave it for the time being wholly untouched. You will not be able to satisfy me otherwise. Is it your opinion that everything which is known by the intellect or the reason, or imagined by the sense can somehow be created and produced in the knower and perceiver? It seems to me that it can. For it is indeed my opinion that the species of sensible things and the quantities and qualities which I reach by my corporeal sense are in a certain way created in me, for when I imprint the fantasies of them in my memory, and when I deal with them within myself by division and comparison and, as it were, collect them into a kind of unity. I notice a certain knowledge of the things which are external to me being built up within me, and in the same way when I seek earnestly after certain concepts resembling the intelligible species, concepts of intelligibles which I contemplate with the mind alone, as for example the concept of the liberal arts, I feel them born and becoming within me, but the relation between this knowledge and the things themselves which are its object I do not fully grasp. How does it seem to you? Are the knowledges of things, made in the soul, of the same nature as the things themselves, or are they something different? They are different. For how will the corporeal species of, for example, a certain animal or grass or tree be of one nature with the knowledge of it which is produced in an incorporeal nature? And in the same way how can the intelligible species of any discipline and the knowledge of it be of the one nature? If then they are of a different genus or nature and not the same, tell me, I pray, which of the two is the more excellent? Are the things of a more exalted nature than the concepts of them, or are the concepts more exalted than the things? I should have said that the visible species are of a better nature than the concepts of them, were it not for St. Augustine who in the ninth book on the Trinity, chapter 11, gives the following opinion, when we learn of bodies through the sense of the body, a certain replica of the bodies is created in our mind, this is a fantasy in our memory. For it is certainly not the bodies themselves that are in our mind when we reflect on them, but replicas of them. Nevertheless, the fantasy of a body in the mind is better than the species of that body, inasmuch as it is in a better nature, namely, in a vital substance, for such the mind is. Furthermore I would not dare to say that even intelligible things are better than the concept of them which is in the soul. For it is a doctrine according to reason that that which understands is better than that which is understood. Thus, if the knowledge of all things subsists in the divine wisdom, I should not be rash in asserting that this wisdom is incomparably superior to the things of which it is the knowledge. And if so, I believe that the same relationship proceeds from the divine providence throughout all creation, so that not only every nature which has the knowledge of that which follows it is better and superior, but also the knowledge itself, through the dignity of the nature in which it resides, greatly excels the object of which it is the knowledge. And therefore I should find it rather easy to say that the knowledge of the intelligible is antecedent to the intelligibles themselves. You would perhaps be right in saying so if that which is formed is more excellent than that which forms. Why do you make this qualification? Because the knowledge of the arts which is in the soul seems to be formed by the arts themselves. But if you could establish beyond doubt that the knowledge was not formed from the arts, but the arts from the knowledge, your argument would perhaps be running on the right lines. Did we not prove a moment ago that everything which understands is more excellent than that which is understood? We did. Tell me then whether it is the skill of the mind which understands an art or an art which understands the skill. I have no doubt that the art is understood by the mind. 
but if I were to say that the same art was known by the skill itself in the same manner as it is known by the mind which is endowed with that skill, I should be afraid of seeming to assert that the mind and its skill are two things furnished with the knowledge of the art, instead of being one and the same essence, in which the knowledge of the art is naturally present. If however the mind and its skill are not too different but, as true reason teaches, one and the same, I am compelled to admit that everything which is understood by the mind is also understood by its skill, and it must follow that the mind and its skill, or rather, the skilled mind, is of a more excellent nature than the art which it understands, if the things which understand are prior to the things which are understood. If, however, I were to say that the art itself was the skill of the skilled mind, the consequence would be either that the skilled mind and the skilled art were two entities with mutual understanding of each other, and mutually understood, and thus enjoying an equal dignity of nature, or else the mind and its skill, and the art which it understands and by which it is understood, must be considered to be of one and the same essence. But it is not yet clear which of these alternatives should be. Perhaps it will be if, under guidance of God, we enter upon the right path of reasoning. Let us then look into the matter more carefully. But first I should like you to tell me whether the nature of the mind which possesses the skill of the art is simple or not. I think that it is simple. For being an incorporeal and intellectual substance it must therefore be without all compositeness. You think rightly. Do you suppose then that something which does not naturally reside in its essence may adhere to it as an accident? I think indeed it may. For I see that many things are contingent to it. For example, it is not time, yet it moves in time. Skill in the arts is an accident to it, for at one time it is recognized as skilled, at another as unskilled, at one time disciplined, at another undisciplined, now wise, now foolish, sometimes, indulging in irrational cogitations, it is seen to be an error, while at other times it goes upon the path of right reason, and so on. So skill in the arts, or the art itself, do not naturally reside in it, but come to it from outside as the result of accidents. I should not go so far as to say that, for it is not likely that God should have created in his own image and likeness a mind in which skill and the art were not naturally inborn, for this would not be so much mind as a kind of brutish and irrational life. Nor do I think that it would be right to say that man's creation in the image of God was rather by accident than by substance, especially when we see that intelligence and reason are present in the mind substantially. Then, skill and the art, are not accidents to the mind, but are naturally present to it. I think it would not be rash to say so. For although through the accident of its transgression of the divine command whereby it became forgetful both of itself and its creator the mind is born unskilled and unwise, yet when it is reformed by the rules of doctrine it may discover again in itself its God and itself and its skill and the art and all those things which subsist in it according to its nature, if it be irradiated by the grace of its Redeemer. It remains then to consider in what way skill and the art reside in the mind, whether as those natural qualities which are known as potencies like the species of wisdom and science which it perceives in the reflection of the divine ray, or as substantial and constituent parts of itself, so that mind, skill and the art would form a kind of trinity in one essence. Your last suggestion is the one which I would accept. For the three seem to me to form a kind of substantial and connatural trinity. Then mind intellectually comprehends both its skill and the art. And is intellectually comprehended both by the one and by the other, though not as to what it is but as to the fact that it is. For otherwise the trinity will not be co-essential and co-equal. I could not deny this. For reason compels me to admit it. Consider then whether they are formed by one another or by some nature superior to them. If the Catholic faith did not teach that this trinity is established and formed and intellectually comprehended by a higher nature, and if truth did not assent to this teaching, I should have some justification for replying that they are perhaps formed by one another, or at least that they are their own primal form. But under the circumstances, of course, I do not doubt that the trinity of the mind is formed by a superior nature, seeing that all things that are formed take from it the origin of their forms. And it is by being turned towards it that are formed all things which are turned towards it or can be turned towards it. Any hesitation on this point would be extremely stupid. So only the mind of God possesses in itself the true knowledge of the human mind, of its skill and of the art. For by it and for it was this trinity formed. Nothing could be truer than that. Do you think that the human mind is one thing, and the concept of it in the mind of him who forms and knows it another? That cannot be. For I understand the substance of the whole man to be nothing else but the concept of him in the mind of his artificer, who knew all things in himself before they were made 
and that very knowledge is the true and only substance of the things known, since it is in that knowledge that they are most perfectly created and eternally and immutably subsist. We may then define man as follows. Man is a certain intellectual concept formed eternally in the mind of God. That is an extremely true and very well-tested definition of man, and not only of man, but of everything else which is formed in the divine wisdom. And I am not afraid of those who define him not as he is intellectually comprehended to be, but according to those things which are seen by the intellect to relate to him, saying that man is a rational mortal animal capable of sense and learning, and what is more amazing, they call this definition a substantial one, although it is not substantial at all, but describes what relates to the substance from the attributes acquired by the substance from outside itself through generation. But the concept of man in the mind of God is none of these, for there it is simple, and cannot be called by this or that name, for it stands above all definition and all groupings of parts, for it can only be predicated of it that it is, not what it is. For that is what a truly substantial definition does, it asserts only that it is, but does not say what it is. Does it seem to you that there is a kind of concept in man of all the sensible and intelligible things the human mind can understand? That clearly seems to be true, and indeed the essence of man is understood principally to consist in this, that it has been given him to possess the concept of all things which were either created his equals or which he was instructed to govern. For how could man be given the dominion of things of which he had not the concept? For his dominion over them would go astray if he did not know the things which he was to rule. Holy Scripture gives us a clear indication of this when it says, Therefore, having formed out of the earth every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, the Lord God brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called every living soul that is its name. It says to see, that is, to understand what he would call them. For if he did not understand, how would he be able to call them rightly? But what he called anything that is its name, that is, it is the very notion of the living soul. What is so remarkable then? In the notion of nature. Created in the human mind and possessed by it. Being the substance of the very things of which it is the notion. Just as in the divine mind the notion of the whole created universe is the incommunicable substance of that whole. And just as we may call the notion of all intelligibles and sensibles in the whole of things the substance of those intelligibles and sensibles. So we may also say that the notion of the differences and properties and natural accidents are the differences, and the properties and accidents themselves. There is no objection to that. Therefore, not only is irrationality created in the mind, but also every species, difference and property of irrationality, and all things which are naturally learned concerning it, since the knowledge of all these and similar things is established in it. By similar things I mean those which nature contains besides the animals, such as the elements of the world, the genera and species of grasses and trees, quantities and qualities, and all the innumerable multitude of differentiations. True knowledge of all these is implanted in human nature although it is concealed from her that she has it until she is restored to her pristine and integral condition, in which with all clarity she will understand the magnitude and the beauty of the image that is fashioned within her and will no longer be in ignorance of anything which is established within for she will be encompassed by the divine light and turn towards God in whom she will enjoy the perspicuous vision of all things. What else does the great Boethius mean when he says? Wisdom is the comprehension of the truth of the things which are and whose lot it is to be endowed with immutable substance. And by the things which are we mean those which are neither enlarged by extension nor diminished by retraction nor changed by any variations, but ever preserve themselves in their proper strength by the exercise of their own resources. Such are qualities, quantities, forms, magnitudes, smallnesses, equalities, conditions, acts, dispositions, places, times, and whatever is found in any manner united to corporeal objects. They themselves are by nature incorporeal and flourish by reason of their immutable substance, but through participation in body their circumstance is altered and through contact with the variable object they pass interchangeable in constancy and where else do you suppose these things subsist but in the notions of them contained in the soul of the wise? For where they are comprehended, there they are, and they are nothing other than the understanding of themselves. The solution of this present problem demands a complex exposition and an unceasing flow as though from an inexhaustible source, of countless and various cognate problems pours forth from all sides of it in the process, so that it would not be unfairly compared to that fictional hydra of Hercules, whose heads grew again as often as they were cut off in such proportion that, for one that was severed a hundred sprang up. Moreover this figment is a symbol of human nature, 
for that too was a hydra, that is to say, a kind of multiple source of inexhaustible depth into which none save Hercules, that is, virtue, may penetrate. For no one knoweth what things are in man, save the spirit of man which is in him. If then that inner notion which is contained in the human mind constitutes the substance of those things of which it is the notion, it follows that the notion by which man knows himself may be considered his very substance. It certainly follows. For we have already said that the human mind and its knowledge by which it knows itself and the discipline by which through learning itself it obtains that knowledge of itself subsist as one and the same essence. What then are we to say about our definition of man? Did we not just now arrive at the conclusion that man is a certain intellectual concept formed eternally in the divine mind? But if that is so, and if we were not over hasty in arriving at this definition, how can man's substance be the notion by which he knows himself? Surely we were not over hasty. For that definition which declares that a certain concept formed eternally in the divine mind is the substance of man is true. But neither is our present teaching unreasonable, namely that the knowledge by which the human mind knows itself is in man his substance. For every creature is considered under one aspect as it exists in the word of God in which all things are made, and under another as it exists in itself. This is what St. Augustine means when he says in his Hexameron, in one way the things which are made through it are subordinate to it, in another the things which it is are in it. For the understanding of all things in the wisdom of God is the substance of all things, nay, it is all things. But the knowledge by which the intelligible and sensible creature has intelligence of itself as it is in itself stands, as it were, for a kind of secondary substance in it, by which it has only the notion that it knows and is and wills. But has no notion what it is. The primary substance, constituted in the wisdom of God, is eternal and immutable, while the secondary is temporal and variable, the one proceeds, the other follows, the primary is primordial and causal, the secondary derivative and caused, the primary contains all things as a whole, the secondary comprehends through knowledge as particulars as many things as are allotted it by its superior, and are subjected to it, the secondary emanates from the primary and will return to it again. I am not now referring to that supraessential substance which by being itself is God and the sole cause of all things. But of that which is created as a primordial cause in the wisdom of God, and of which the effect is this substance which we have made secondary, and is so disposed by the natural order of things. We should understand. Then, that man has two substances. One that is a genus among the primordial causes. And another which is a species among the effects of those causes. No, I should not say that there were two substances, but one which may be conceived under two aspects. Under one aspect the human substance is perceived as created among the intelligible causes, under the other as generated among their effects, under the former free from all mutability, under the latter subject to change, under the former simple, involved in no accidents, it eludes all reason and intelligence, under the latter it receives a kind of composition of quantities and qualities and whatever else can be understood in relation to it whereby it becomes apprehensible to the mind. So it is that what is one and the same thing can be thought of as twofold because there are two ways of looking at it, yet everywhere it preserves its incomprehensibility, in the effects as in the causes, and whether it is endowed with accidents or abides in its naked simplicity. Under neither set of circumstances is it subject to created sense or intellect nor even the knowledge of itself as to what it is. How can it be, then, that the human mind as you have been asserting now for some time, possesses a notion by which it knows itself and a discipline by which it learns of itself, and yet, as you now maintain, is not discernible either to itself or to any other creature. Both assertions have the full support of reason. For the human mind does know itself, and again does not know itself. For it knows that it is, but does not know what it is. And as we have taught in the earlier books it is this which reveals most clearly the image of God to be in man. For just as God is comprehensible in the sense that it can be deduced from his creation that he is, and incomprehensible because it cannot be comprehended by any intellect whether human or angelic nor even by himself what he is, seeing that he is not a thing but is superessential, so to the human mind it is given to know one thing only, that it is, but as to what it is no sort of notion is permitted it, and, a fact which is stranger still and, to those who study God and man, more fair. To contemplate. The human mind is more honored in its ignorance than in its knowledge, for the ignorance in it of what it is is more praiseworthy than the knowledge that it is. 
Just as the negation of God accords better with the praise of his nature than the affirmation and it shows greater wisdom not to know than to know that nature of which ignorance is the true wisdom and which is known all the better for not being known. Therefore the divine likeness in the human mind is most clearly discerned when it is only known that it is, and not known what it is, and. If I may so put it, what it is is denied in it, and only that it is is affirmed. Nor is this unreasonable. For if it were known to be something, then at once it would be limited by some definition, and thereby would cease to be a complete expression of the image of its creator, who is absolutely unlimited and contained within no definition, because he is infinite, beyond all that may be said or comprehended, superessential. How then is every creature made in the knowledge of man, which does not even know of itself what it is? And this is thought to be its great glory. The mark of a superior nature and indication that it is circumscribed by no finite substance? I assure you that there is a very strong argument which points to the fact that every creature is created as substance in man. For we are taught by Gregory the theologian, who touches on this matter in his controversy with those who deny that the word of God is superessential and maintain that it is contained within some substance and therefore does not transcend all things but is to be counted among their number, seeking thereby to show a distinction between the substance of the Father and the substance of the Son, that of the substance of all things we cannot have a definition of what it is. So the human replica of the divine essence is not bound by any fixed limit any more than the divine essence in whose image it is made. And it is the same with the attributes by which it is surrounded, its time and place, its differences and properties, its quantities and qualities, its relations, conditions, positions, its acts and its passions. Of these two it can only be understood that they exist, but by no means what they are. From this it follows that there is no creature that can be held to possess any other substance, but that reason by which it subsists in the primordial causes within the word of God, and thus there can be no definition of what it is, seeing that it transcends every substantial definition. There can only be circumstantial definition, which relates to its accidents whereby it proceeds through generation into its proper species, either intelligible or sensible. Both Holy Scripture and our own reason declare that the human and the angelic nature are either the same or very similar, for both man and angel are held to be, and in fact are, intelligible and rational creatures. And if there is this close correspondence between them it is reasonable to inquire why we are taught that every creature is made in man but not in angel. There is a good reason for this, I think. For we observe in man not a few things which neither reason understands nor authority transmits to subsist in angel. For instance there is this animal body which, according to holy scripture, was attached to the human soul even before the transgression, there is the fivefold bodily exterior sense, there are the fantasies of sensible objects, which through that sense enter into the soul, there are the perplexity and difficulty which delay the reason's inquiries into the nature of the universe, the painful industry which it requires to discriminate between vice and virtue, and very many other things of that sort. For that all these things are lacking to the angelic nature while present in nature no truly wise man would deny. Nevertheless, Augustine in the eighth book of the City of God, chapter 7, sick, would appear to have taught that the angels have sense, for in that chapter he praises the contemplative power of the great philosophers because they saw that all forms of mutable things, whereby they are what they are, of what nature soever they be, have their origin from none but him that truly is and is unchangeable. Consequently neither the body of this universe, the figures, qualities, ordered motion, and elements disposed from heaven down to earth, and whatever bodies are in them, nor any life, whether that which nourishes and conserves, as in the case of trees, or that which has this but also perceives, as in the case of the animals, or that which has all this but also understands, as in the case of man, or that which has no need of the support of nourishment, but conserves, perceives and understands, as in the case of the angels, can have being but from him who has only simple being but I should say that he was here referring to the interior sense. For who does not know that the celestial being is untouched by very many of the parts and motions of nature which are naturally innate in the human being? And of those things which are not innate in it either as substance or happen to it as accident, it is not reasonable to hold that the celestial substance possesses the knowledge. For although the angels are held to administer this world and every corporeal creature, yet we must by no means suppose they do so through the instrument of the corporeal senses or by movements through space or time or by visible manifestations. Nor would it be right to say that it was through some defect in their power that they do not have those accidents which are ours through the shortcomings of a nature which is still subject to variations of space and time. 
for when they transform their spiritual and invisible bodies into visible apparitions in order to reveal themselves in space and time to the mortal senses, they accept this accident not for their own sakes, but for the sake of those men of whom they are in charge and to whom they declare the mysteries of God. For with them vision is not exercised through sense nor conditioned by space, nor their knowledge of how they shall act in administering nature conditioned by time. For they eternally transcend all time, and all space in the contemplation of truth, in which the causes of their administration are present all at once to their sight. And do not suppose that I am speaking of all celestial essences, I speak only of the higher orders who stand ever before the face of God and in whom there is no ignorance save that of the divine dark which excels every intellect. In fact, the lowest order, the angelic properly so called, through which the higher orders carry out the mandates of divine providence either in the human mind by means of apparitions or in the other parts of this world, is not yet free from all ignorance, for, as Saint Dionysius the Areopagite in his book on the celestial hierarchy most ingeniously shows, it is instructed by the higher orders and initiated into knowledge of divine mysteries beyond its ken. And so not unreasonably are we told to believe and understand that every visible and invisible creature is created in man alone. For no substance has been created which is not understood to subsist in him, no species or difference or property or natural accident is found in nature which either is not naturally in him or of which he cannot have knowledge, and the knowledge of the things which are contained within him excels the things of which it is the knowledge by so much as the nature in which it is constituted excels. For every rational nature is rightly preferred to the irrational and sensible nature because it is closer to God. Wherefore it is also rightly understood that the things of which the knowledge is innate in human nature have their substance in the knowledge of themselves. For where they have the better knowledge of themselves, there they must be considered to enjoy the true existence. Furthermore, if the things themselves subsist more truly in the notions of them than in themselves, and the notions of them are naturally present to man, therefore in man are they universally created, as will no doubt be proved in due course by the return of all things into man. For why should they all return to him if they did not in some sense partake of his nature, and did not in some manner proceed from him? But about the return we have promised to speak in its proper place. Although these matters seem extremely difficult since they pass beyond the limit of simple doctrine, yet if we consider them with the speculative reason, they are sufficiently consistent with the capacity of the understanding of the human condition, and are most useful in establishing what now may be properly admitted, that man was not brought forth in the genus of the animals, rather every genus of animals was brought forth from the earth, that is to say, from the solid part of nature. In him, and not only every genus of animals was made in man, but the whole created universe, so that truly of man may we understand these words of the truth, preach the gospel unto every creature. Also the apostle says, The whole creation groaneth and traveleth together until now. But if there be any to whom these things seem too abstruse or altogether incredible, let him, if unversed in all the natural arts which are called liberal, either keep silent or learn not to argue rashly about what he cannot understand. Or if he is learned he will plainly see that, to offer him an example from one of these arts, geometrical figures do not naturally subsist in themselves, but in the reasons of the art to which they belong. For the triangle which is seen by the corporeal sense in a material object is a kind of sensible image of something which is present in the mind, and of this triangle whose substance is in the instructed mind he will have understanding, and with sound judgment estimate which is the better, the triangular figure or the triangle which it is the figure. And if I am not mistaken, he will find that the figure is a true figure, certainly, but a false triangle, whereas the triangle which subsists in the art is the cause of the figure and is the true triangle. And I am not speaking of the imaginary triangle which proceeds from the mind through the memory into the sense, and through the sense into sensible figures. Nor of that which returns again from the sensible figure through the corporeal sense and is implanted in the memory. But of that very triangle which endures immutably in the art itself, where line and angle exist together, and where there is not one place for the angle, another for the middle, another for the extremity, another for the point, another for the spaces of the sides from the point, another for the spaces of the angles from the point, another for the point from which the lines originate and in which the angles are enclosed by the meetings of the lines, but all these things are one in one. And the same notion of the geometer's mind, and the whole is understood in the particulars and the particulars in the whole, unified in the intellect itself for the intellect is the substantial cause of all things which it understands, and that from which the figures of the geometrical bodies proceed into their species. And what we have said of the triangle must also be understood of all other figures, whether angular or curved or oblique, and whether plain or solid. 
For all these subsist in their notions which are comprehended under one and the same reason in the skilled mind instructed in the art. If, then, the geometrical bodies, whether they are formed in the fantasies of the memory or in some sensible matter subsist in the rational notions of themselves which lack all fantasy or matter, beyond anything which is perceived by the bodily sense or imagined by the memory, why should it be so strange that the natural bodies also, composed of the qualities of the universal elements, have their substance in that nature in which there is knowledge of them, especially as all the perceptions of bodies are incorporeal? For the species in which they are contained are incorporeal. Nor would any wise man doubt that quantities and qualities are likewise of an intelligible nature and proceed from the intelligible reasons of vital substance. Whoever looks intently into the nature of things will soon find that this is the way in which they are constituted. After this discussion it will not be inappropriate to inquire in what way every creature is created in man, seeing that we are taught that man himself was created last of all. For if the whole of created nature, both visible and invisible, was created before him, as is handed down to us by the divine history, and we read of nothing being created after him, how can it be explained that we can perceive that every creature is created in man? For if anyone should say that created nature was created twice, first after its species in itself and then as a genus in man, I should find difficulty in bringing such a view into accord with reason, for if that were the case, man would possess no substance of his own, but would be a kind of amalgam of many things, in fact of the whole creation which had already been established before, one manifold conglomeration of diverse forms. And worse still, if every creature whether visible or invisible is in itself most perfectly created, and since the Creator is perfect and more than perfect, it cannot be believed that He has created anything that is imperfect, how should it receive as it were a second perfection of its nature in man, whose creation was the last of the divine operations? And if it did, then it would not be out of nothing that God created man in His own image, but out of those things which were created before Him. But if anyone shall say that the human body was not made out of nothing, but out of a kind of earth, namely clay, what would he say about the better creation of man which undoubtedly was established in soul and spiritual body in his first creation? For the former, that is, the soul, was made by the divine breath, nay rather, it is the divine breath, formed, as we believe, not out of something, but out of nothing. I see that this question is involved in a great deal of obscurity and requires versatile skill for its solution. But rather than burke it altogether we shall make some attempt at examining it insofar as we are inwardly enlightened by the divine ray. But first tell me, I pray, if the intelligibles or sensibles are prior to the mind which understands them or the sense that perceives them. I think I should be right in saying that where there is one thing that understands and another that is understood, and where that which understands is of a better nature than that which is understood, the understanding mind or the perceiving sense is prior to the thing which is understood or perceived. But where the things themselves understand themselves, as far as that may be, I should not say that they are prior to themselves, for where the things itself and its knowledge of itself are one, I do not see what kind of precedence there can be. Although I know that I am, my knowledge of myself is not prior to myself because I and the knowledge by which I know myself are not two different things, if I did not know that I was I would not be ignorant that I did not know that I was, therefore whether I know or do not know that I am I shall not be without knowledge, for there will remain the knowledge of my ignorance. And if everything which is able to know that it does not know itself cannot be ignorant of the fact that it is, for if it did not have any existence at all it would not know that it did not know itself, it follows that absolutely. Everything has existence which knows that it is or knows that it does not know that it is. But if anyone is so far sunk in ignorance that he neither knows that he is nor perceives that he does not know that he is, I should say that either such a one is not a man at all, or that he is altogether dead. In the foregoing arguments we have sufficiently established the fact that these two things inhere at once and inseparably and eternally in the human soul, knowledge and ignorance. For it possesses the knowledge that it is a rational and intelligible creature, and the ignorance of what intelligence and reason are. Then you did not exist before you knew or did not know that you existed? No. For at one and the same time I received my being. And the knowledge that I was. And the understanding that I did not know what I was. Tell me. When does man receive the knowledge of himself? in that creation in which all men generally were made in their primordial causes before the beginning of time, or in that generative process by which in the course of time known only to God and predetermined by him, man issued forth into this life? In both, I think. In the one it receives the knowledge in a general manner and secretly in the causes, in the other it receives it in a special manner and openly in the effects.
For in that primordial and general state of all human nature no one knows himself as a species nor begins to have a particular knowledge of himself, for there is one general and common knowledge of all, known only to God. For there all men are one, and that one is made in the image of God, in whom all are created. For as all the forms or species which are contained in the one genus do not as yet become subject through differences or properties to the intellect or the sense, but subsist as a kind of unity which is still undivided until each shall receive in its individual species its property and difference in an intelligible and sensible form, so in the case of the individual in the common unity of human nature. He does not behold either himself or others of like substance with himself until he has proceeded into this world in the time appointed for him in accordance with the reasons which are eternally established. Why then does not everyone know himself as soon as he has arrived through generation into this world? I could safely say that here we have an indication of the penalty which our nature must pay for its transgression. For if man had not sinned he certainly would not have fallen into such a depth of ignorance of himself, any more than he would have suffered the shame of sharing with the irrational animals the propagation of his species by means of the twofold sex, as the wisest of the Greeks maintain with the most convincing arguments. For he who alone was born without sin into the world, to wit, the Redeemer of the world, never anywhere suffered from such ignorance, but as soon as he was conceived and born had understanding of, and could speak and teach concerning himself and all things. This was so not only because he was the wisdom of the Father from whom nothing is hid, but because in order that he might purify the corruption of humanity he put on in humanity which was incorrupt, not that the humanity which he put on is other than the humanity which he restored. But he who alone is incorrupt remained in it as a means of healing the wound of our perverted nature. Hidden in its inmost reasons. For human nature perished entirely in all men except in him in whom alone it remained incorruptible. And indeed he himself is the greatest example of grace, not because he was freed of any part of the guilt of human nature, but because he alone of all men through no previous merit was joined by unity of substance with the word of God, in whom all the elect and all who receive the fullness of his grace become the sons of God and participants in the divine substance. There was then in human nature the potency of possessing the fullest knowledge of itself had it not sinned. Nothing is more likely. For most mighty and most wretched was that fall in which our nature lost the knowledge and the wisdom which had been planted in her, and lapsed into a profound ignorance of herself and her Creator, even though we understand that the desire for the bliss which she had lost remained with her even after the fall, which would certainly not have been the case if she had lost all knowledge of herself and her God. So the fullest knowledge both of herself and her Creator was implanted in her as part of her nature before the fall. In so far as the knowledge of a creature can comprehend itself and its cause. Such is my opinion. For how would she be an image if in some respect she differed from that of which she is the image? Except of course in the relation to the subject, about which we spoke in the earlier books when we were discussing the prototype or principal exemplar and its image. We said there that God himself was the principal exemplar, subsisting through, by and in himself, neither created nor formed nor changed by anything, whereas his image, which is man, is created by him, and does not subsist through, by or in itself but, at the hands of him whose image it is, it has received being in accordance with its nature, and being God in accordance with his grace. But all other things which are predicated of God may be predicated of his image also, but of God essentially, of the image by participation. For it is by participation in the supreme good and the supreme goodness whose image it is, that the image is both goodness and good, by participation in that eternal and eternity by which it is formed, that it is both eternal and eternity by participation again in that omnipotence by which it is created and turning to which it is specified that it is itself an omnipotence. For if human nature had not sinned but had adhered unchangeably to him who had created her, she would certainly have been omnipotent. For whatever in nature she wished to happen would necessarily happen, since she would wish for nothing else to happen save that which she understood that her Creator wished to happen, moreover, if she had fully adhered to her Creator and not abandoned him so as not to lose her likeness to him, she would fully comprehend his omnipotent and unchanging will and all the other things which may reasonably be predicated or contemplated or understood in God and in his image. If then the perfect knowledge both of herself and her Creator was present in human nature before the fall. It would not be remarkable if in reason we found that she then possessed the fullest knowledge of nature similar to her own. Like the celestial essences. And those inferior to herself such as this world with its causes. Which are subject to the intellect. And that this science still abides in her. Generally in potency only. But in the highest men in act. To those who understand these matters clearly there would be nothing remarkable in that. 
for it is true and probable. And it is to the great and true glory of the human race that it is so, and especially to him who will to make it so. Wherefore in like manner we should accept the following account of his intellect and his knowledge. Just as the creative wisdom, which is the word of God, beholds all things which are made in it before they are made, and that very beholding of all things which are beheld before they are made is their true and eternal and immutable essence, so the created wisdom, which is human nature, knows all things which are made in it before they are made, and that very knowledge of the things which are known before they are made is their true and indestructible essence. Accordingly, the knowledge in the creative wisdom is itself rightly held to be the primary and causal essence of the whole of creation, while the knowledge in the created nature is the secondary essence and subsists as the effect of the higher knowledge. And what we have said about the primary and causal essence which is constituted in the knowledge of the creative wisdom and about the secondary which is its effect and which is reasonably stated to subsist in the human soul may without hesitation be applied to all the attributes which are observed to be attached to the essence of all creation. For the accurate examination of nature shows us that whatever circumstance attaches to the substances in the human intelligence proceeds through the created wisdom from the knowledge of the creative wisdom. Now, attached to the essences there are the sensible species, quantities, qualities, places, times and like attributes without which the essence cannot be understood. We can then sum up everything that we have been trying to teach briefly as follows, just as the understanding of all things which the Father made in his only begotten word is their essence and is the substance of all those attributes which are understood to be attached by nature to the essence, so the knowledge of all things which the word of the Father has created in the human soul is their essence and the subject of all those attributes which are discerned to be attached by nature to that essence. And just as the divine understanding is prior to all things and is all things, so the intellectual knowledge of the soul is prior to all the things which she knows and is all the things which she foreknows. Therefore all things subsist as causes in the divine understanding. But as effects in human knowledge. As we have often said before, this does not mean that the essence of all things in the word is something other than the essence of all things in man, but one and the same essence is contemplated by the mind under two different aspects, as subsisting in the eternal causes, and as understood in its effects, for there it surpasses all understanding, while here it is understood only through the consideration of the attributes which are attached to it. In neither case, however, is it permitted to the created intellect to know what it is. For if it could be known it would not entirely reproduce the image of its creator in itself, for from those things of which he is the principle, the cause, and the maker it can only be known that he is, but what he is escapes all sense and all intellect. There was, then, no creature, either visible or invisible before the creation of man, neither in place nor in time nor in rank nor in birth nor in eternity nor, in a word, in any order of precedence. For in knowledge and rank, though not in place or time, man's creation is prior to those things which were created with it, or in it, or below it, but simultaneous with the creation of those who are his equals in the hierarchy of nature, that is to say, the celestial essences. For human nature also participates in the celestial and intelligible essence, and it is to human as well as angelic essence and nature that the scriptural text refers, he created the heavens in his intellect, which may be interpreted, he created the intelligible heavens. For this reason it is not easy to understand how all things visible and invisible are established in man if man was created as substance together with the angelic essences. For it does not seem in accordance with reason that on the one hand the beginning of his creation should be simultaneous with that of the celestial powers and on the other that they should be created in him. In him. If you look more closely into the mutual relation and unity which exist between intelligible and rational natures, you will at once find that not only is the angelic nature established in the human but also the human is established in the angelic. For it is created in everything of which the pure intellect has the most perfect knowledge and becomes one with it. So closely indeed were the human and angelic natures associated, and so it would be now if the first man had not sinned, that the two would have become one. Even as it is this is beginning to happen in the case of the highest men, from whom are the firstborn among the celestial natures. Moreover the angel is made in man, through the understanding of angel which is in man, and man is in the angel through the understanding of man which is established in the angel. For, as I have said, he who has a pure understanding is created in that which he understands. So the intelligible and rational nature of the angel is created in the intelligible and rational nature of man just as the nature of man is created in the nature of angel. Through the mutual knowledge by which angel understands man and man-angel. There is nothing strange in this. 
For when we enter upon a discussion together the same thing happens, each of us is created in the other. For when I understand what you understand I am made your understanding, and in a certain way that cannot be described I am created in you. In the same way when you clearly understand what I clearly understand you are made my understanding, and of two understandings is made one, formed from that which we both clearly and without doubt understand. For example, to take an illustration from numerology, you understand that the number 6 is equal to its parts, and I understand the same thing, and understand that you understand it just as you understand that I understand. Each of our understandings, formed by the number 6, has become one, and thus I am created in you and you are created in me. For we ourselves are not other than our understandings, for our true and ultimate essence is understanding specified by the contemplation of truth. Moreover we are taught by the Apostle, when he forbids our understanding to cherish visible forms, saying, Be not fashioned after this world, that the understanding can conform not only to natures which are co-essential with itself, but also to natures which are inferior to it when it understands and senses them in love. Consequently, by reason of this mutual understanding, it is not untrue to say that the angel is created in man and man in the angel, and by no law of creation or method of precedence can it be rightly believed or understood that angel is prior to man, although, according to many, the prophetic narrative speaks first of the creation of the angelic nature and subsequently of the human. For, as Saint Augustine points out in the eleventh book of the City of God, it is not to be believed that divine scripture, in the relation of the operations of the six primordial and intelligible days, was entirely silent about the creation of the celestial powers. But either on the very first page of Genesis, where it is written in the beginning God made heaven and earth, he indicated their creation by the name heaven, or a little later, where it is said, and God said, eat there be light, and there was light. The aforesaid father asserts that the creation of the angelic nature is implied in both places, but especially in the second. For in the former text the name heaven refers rather to the establishment of the whole invisible creation in unformed matter than to the specific formation of the angelic nature. But the words, Fet there be light, and there was light, he has no hesitation in ascribing to the formation of the celestial essences, although he mentions the interpretation of others who refer this divine precept to the creation in the upper parts of the world of a primal light subject to the sense and occupying space. However, this interpretation he refutes by very acute arguments in his Hexaemron. The words, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night, he interprets in a double sense, either light means the formation in its proper species of the angelic creature, and darkness the formlessness of that creature while yet imperfect, a formlessness which is prior to the form in origin though not in time, or the division of the light from the darkness signifies the segregation and differentiation of that part of the angelic nature which had immutably adhered to its creator, deserving through its obedience. The foretaste of bliss, from that part which did not abide in truth but in punishment for its pride fell into the darkness of ignorance of its future fall and lasting misery. But whoever wishes to learn more of this twofold interpretation of the Most Holy Master, let him zealously read his own words in the Hexaemron and in the aforesaid volume of the City of God, which I think it would be redundant to quote in this little discussion of ours as it is lengthy and available to all. Right. For there is no cause to introduce the opinions of the Holy Fathers, especially those that are widely known, except where the gravest necessity requires that reason be supported for the sake of those who, being untrained in it, are more amenable to authority than reason. But I should like to learn from you why the establishment of the angelic nature is related on what is called the first intelligible day, that is in the first movement of the prophetic meditation, and then a description of the four days of the sensible universe is interposed before the formation of man is introduced in the sixth movement of the meditation, or, to put it more clearly, why is man not introduced at the very beginning of the contemplative act of the whole creation, instead of at the conclusion of all, when that operation has already been six times repeated? For not only the angelic essence, but also the essence of sensible things, seems to precede in dignity, not to say time. The creation of man. It is in this very fact that the exaltation of human nature over all existent things is most clearly shown, for by this it is made abundantly clear that in all those events which are related before the creation of man, he himself was already created, in fact that all things were created in him. For perhaps the chief reason why the creation of the angels is not more explicitly stated than by the word, light, why it is not said, let there be angel, or, let us make angel, in the same way as it is written, let us make man, is that we may understand that the creation of the substance of man, no less than that of angel, is to be inferred in the creation of light. 
but if man participates in the creation of the celestial essence which is signified by the creation of light, what true natural philosopher would not conclude that all things that are related after the creation of light are created in man? Not only in his knowledge of them, but in their very being, especially when he is in no doubt whatever that this sensible world was created for the sake of man. That he might rule it as a king rules his kingdom and as a husband his household, and that he might use it to the glory of his creator, subordinated to no part of it, in no way dependent on it, but raised above it ruling it alone. For if man had not sinned he would not be ruled among the parts of the universe, but would himself rule the whole of it as his subject, and he would not employ for that purpose these corporeal senses of the mortal body, but would govern eternally and faultlessly the whole and the parts of it in accordance with the laws of God, without any physical act in space or time, but solely by the rational apprehension of its natural and innate causes by the easy use of right will. But if he were to abandon his creator and fall down into the world from the lofty station of his nature, he would then lose his rank and be ignobly counted among its parts, and be himself corrected by the divine justice and pay the penalty for his sin. So the reason why man is introduced at the conclusion of the narrative of the equipping of this visible world, is that we might understand that all the things of which the creation is narrated before that of man are universally comprehended, within him. For every greater number includes within itself the lesser. For if the creation of man was clearly stated at the beginning of the narration of the creation of the visible and invisible universe, all the rest of nature, of which the creation would be narrated in order subsequently, would reasonably appear as subsisting outside his nature. But as it is, since the creation of man is introduced at the conclusion of all the divine operations, it is shown that the divine creations all subsist and are comprehended in him. And indeed, in the case of the celestial essences, that is, the angels, we said that they subsisted in him in two ways. In one way because, were he not hindered by the earthly habitation of this mortal body which is the result of sin, he would be co-essential with them, that is to say, co-intellectual and co-rational, in another because their mutual recognition is so closely knit that united by reciprocal intellection and formed by the simple contemplation of truth, the angel is born in man as man, and man is born in the angel as angel. What shall I say of the operations of the second movement of the prophetic meditation? Do we not recognize that that firmament, which is the solidity of the simple elements set between the upper waters of the primordial causes and the lower waters of the unstable motions of corporeal and corruptible nature, which flow in space and time through the processes of birth and decay, do we not recognize that it is established in the essence of man? For what shrewd student of human nature does not observe therein the universal elements of the world? What should be said of the operations of the third day? Do we not recognize in man the stability of substance which is signified by the phrase dry land, and the instability of the transient accidents which is signified by the inundations of the waters, and the distinction of the one from the other by their natural differences? And do woe not reckon among the parts of human nature that vital principle which gives nourishment and increase and life to the grasses and twigs? And as on the first day the principal part of man, that most sublime light, that is to say, intellect and reason, was established together with angelic nature in the creation of light, so on the fourth day of the prophetic meditation, there was introduced according to a rational order the creation of that secondary light which is called exterior sense, created for the apprehension of the shapes and species and qualities and quantities of visible things. For although the exterior sense, which is the intermediary between the soul and exterior objects, belongs properly and naturally to the soul, yet it is reckoned with the body because it exerts its power through bodily instruments. So the prophetic meditation did well to establish, in the fourth place of creation of things, the creation of that sense which is attached to a body formed out of the four elements of the world. Now the modes of this sense are three, of which the first without danger of error announces to the mind the species of the sensibles, and this it does so admirably that with the greatest ease and without labor the mind is able to form unclouded judgments upon these species in all clarity. This mode is therefore not improperly called the larger luminary for it does not deceive the mind, but with all the brightness of the sun uncovers every sensible species and lays them bare before the reason. The second mode, which is likened to the lesser luminary, is one through which the mind is often deceived, as though wandering uncertainly through some nocturnal tasks, consequently it cannot easily form true judgments upon objects which it receives through sense. Examples of what I mean are the ore which appears to be broken when it is dipped in the water, the reversed face in the mirror, towers which appear to those sailing to move, the counterfeit of voices which the Greeks call. And a thousand other illusions of this sort which are found naturally in all the senses of the body. 
and the rational soul must employ the most anxious care and utmost industry to distinguish these from true appearances when forming its judgments. For these have no existence in nature, but are formed in the senses and frequently deceive the mind and put it into the error of taking false things for true. The third mode is that which admits to the mind, in multiplicity and accumulation, numbers of sensible forms. It takes from the sphere of sensible nature, decorated with the various orders of innumerable species, the choirs, as it were, of the countless stars, and is so bewildered by the confusions of so many mingled fantasies that scarcely if ever can it form a judgment about them which will be free from error, but attempts by means of certain logical processes to make statements which will to some extent resemble the truth, and to be certain about things which are themselves uncertain and it disputes about the minutest principles of visible nature without ever employing the same method twice. Sometimes offering opinions which, like bright stars, show a degree of clarity and proximity to the truth, sometimes opinions that are more obscure and further from the truth, like dimmer stars, sometimes very obscure and very far from the truth, like those stars which are scarcely to be seen. Therefore the third power of the senses is described under the metaphor of the stars of different brilliancies. Thus the three modes of sensation are established in the three orders of celestial luminaries. For as the sun is in the world, so is the most sure and infallible mode of sense in man, as is the moon, so is the ambiguous fantasy which is, as it were, a doubtful light to the sentient mind, as are the stars so are the imperceptibly small numbers of the fantasies which are produced by the innumerable and imperceptible species of bodily objects. And do not let it surprise you that human perceptions, I refer to the bodily senses, are signified by the greater things of the world. Namely the celestial bodies, for the soundest reason teaches us in no uncertain way that man is one, and in his unity a greater one than the whole visible world, not by the bulk of his parts but by the dignity of the harmony of his rational nature. For as the Holy Father Augustine teaches us that the soul of a worm is better than the body of the sun that illuminates the whole world, for the lowest form of life, however humble is to be preferred by reason of the dignity of its essence to the first and most valuable of bodies, what then is surprising in the fact that all the bodies of the whole world are of lower degree than the sensation of man. First because the natural cause is of a higher order than those things of whose creation it is by nature the cause, and indeed no wise man doubts that the sensibles were created for the sense, and not the sense for the sensibles. Next, because it is reasonable that the nature which makes a judgment is of a higher order than that upon which the judgment is made, and it is perfectly plain to every careful observer of nature that the senses form judgment upon the sensibles and not the sensibles upon the senses. A further consideration is that sense is only found in living substance, in which the vital activity is most manifest, while the sensibles, in so far as they are bodies, need not always manifest the vital activity. For they exist in the lowest place of creation. For there are some sensibles in which the vital activity scarcely ever or never appears. Finally no sensible is a vital principle even though it may appear to be moved by a vital principle, whereas sense, as nature herself teaches us, is not only alive but is itself, in its essence, life. And if the quantity and magnitude of the bodily mass of the sensibles is a matter for praise, still more so is that quantity and magnitude of power which subsists in the senses. See what power there is in the sense of the eyes which can gaze into the infinity of the light-filled space and can mould within itself the divers and innumerable species of bodies, colours, shapes, and all other things of which the fantasies enter the memory by means of this sense, and what will you say of the power of hearing? Which can absorb and discriminate between so many voices which are heard at the same time and conflict with one another? And anyone who in this way considers the other senses will contemplate for himself there. Marvellous and indescribable virtues. From the foregoing we may see how the intelligible principles of created nature, in so far as our mind can grasp them, are created in the human intellect, and that similarly the sensible species of the same universe, with the quantities and the qualities, in so far as our sense may apprehend them, discover the causes of their creation in the human sense, and therein subsist. But since sensation is not confined to man, but is present by nature in the other animals, it undergoes a further distribution. In the fifth movement of the prophetic meditation it is attributed to the creeping things of the sea and the birds of the air. Rightly so, since the sense which was conferred upon nature on the fifth day is itself fivefold. And on the sixth day it is applied to the land animals. The reason for this is, I think, that they have a closer kinship with man, who was created on the sixth day, than the animals which were produced from the nature of the waters. 
thus man himself, whose creation is detail by detail mystically foreshadowed in the contemplations of the divine act referred to before, seeing that all the foregoing were created in him and with him, not in chronological order but the order in which causes flow forth into their effects, is at last manifestly formed as the climax of the whole universe. By the sixth repetition of the prophetic meditation, so that in that number not only the perfection of human nature but the creation in it of all which was revealed prior to it might be symbolized. For the scripture says, And God said, Let us make man in our image and likeness, and let him rule over the fishes of the sea and the birds of the air and the beasts and all creation, and over every creeping thing which moves on the earth. And God created man in his image, in the image of God created he him. Here it should be first noted that in the creation of all things which from the beginning of creation are described in the foregoing five intellectual days, the unity and ineffable trinity of the divine superessential nature, or, as Saint Dionysius the Areopagite calls it, the fecundity of the highest good, is not openly expressed, although in the text, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, it is not unreasonable to see a reference to the persons of the Father and the Son. The Father in the Word, God, the Word in the Word, beginning and a little later the Holy Spirit is introduced in the text, and the Spirit of God brooded over the waters. So in the creation of the primordial causes the Holy Trinity is given its proper place. Moreover, in the procession of the causes into their forms and species Holy Scripture makes a similar reference to the Trinity. For instance, God said, Let there be light. By the name of God is intended the Father, and by the sensible word implied by the phrase, he said, his only begotten and superintelligible word, in which and through which he made all things that are. But in the text, God saw the light, because it is good, the Holy Spirit is intended, as also on the other days wherever it is added, and God saw it, because it was good. But on the sixth day, when man is created, both the unity and the trinity of the divine nature are stated most explicitly, the unity in the words, and he said, where God is understood or as in the Septuagint, openly expressed, and God said, while in the plural verb let us make are expressed the three substances of the one essence, or as the Latins more usually have it, the three persons of the one substance. Rightly so, for where the image is created, there the primal exemplar of which it is the image is most explicitly revealed. Now although man is a unity, he is in a manner of speaking composed out of a number of parts, for it is agreed that he is made up of body, that is, matter possessing a sensible form, and soul, which in turn is composed of sense, reason, intellect, and vital motion. It may therefore be asked whether it is throughout all his parts that man is created in the image of God, or only in respect of those which occupy the loftier or most lofty place in his nature. And I shall be grateful to hear what is your opinion in this matter. This is a question on which almost all the scriptural commentators have something to say. And in the first place they unanimously allow that it is not in respect of his body that man is created in the image of God, for God is incorporeal, there is no corporality in his substance nor does it befall him as an accident. But as to whether it is in the soul as a whole, that is, throughout all the parts which are discerned in it, or only in the higher parts that man is created in the image of God, has been a matter of most vigorous debate among spiritual authors, and the conclusion has been reached that nowhere but in the most exalted part, that is to say, the intelligible, is the divine image expressed. For this part is seen to be threefold, consisting clearly of intellect, reason and the interior sense, which have been the subject of many exchanges between us in the earlier books. For many philosophers deny that the image of God is to be found in that vital principle by which the body is administered and by which the human soul seems to have a common nature with the nutritive and octave life principle which is the special attribute of grasses and trees, or in that fivefold and exterior sense in which man shares a common nature with the irrational animals, although these are regarded as parts of the soul. But a more careful examination of the human soul reveals that its nature is of the simplest, and that it is wholly a whole in itself and by no means is it unlike itself in any part, or inferior or superior to itself in any of those qualities which are found in its essence. For, as has already been said, it is as a whole that it administers the body and gives it nourishment and increase, as a whole that it perceives through the senses, as a whole that it receives the fantasies of the sensibles, as a whole it is in the numbers of the accursors which first take up the fantasies of the sensibles, as a whole in the progressors which conduct them into the mind, as a whole in the recorders which commend them to the memory, as a whole in the whole memory, as a whole above the whole memory, whether of the sensibles or the intelligibles. It is not therefore a diversity of parts if we have to assert that it has parts which is distinguished in the soul, but a variety of functions and movements. 
for its movements are its parts, which produce divers cognitive faculties in the soul. For she herself is everywhere in herself whole and individual, but her movements, which are also called soul numbers, because they are found in the soul, are designated by different names. For when she is occupied in a contemplative activity about her creator, transcending herself and transcending the understanding of all creation, she is called intellect or mind or spirit, when by what may be called the secondary activity of her nature she investigates the causes of nature, she is called reason, when having found them she distinguishes them and defines them, she is called interior sense, when she receives through the organs of her body the fantasies of the sensibles. She is called exterior sense, not because the exterior sense is itself the essence of soul, but because it is through it that she perceives the forms and species of the sensibles, for there is a vast difference between the nature of the simple mind and the multitudinous variety of the bodily instruments when she administers the body by giving it nourishment and increase. She gets the name of vital motion, and yet she is of the most simple, the most indivisible and the most impartable essence and is not diminished in her minor offices nor magnified in her greater offices nor is she most in her greatest offices, but in all she is the equal of herself, as the great Gregory of Nyssa affirms in his treatise on the image. From this we may understand that the whole human soul is made in the image of God, since it is holy an intellect which intellects, holy a reason which reasons, holy a sense in the interior sense and in perception, holy life and life-giving. Now there are two principal aspects under which we recognize the creation of the human soul in the image of God, first, in that, as God is present throughout all the things that are and can be comprehended by none of them, so the soul penetrates the whole frame of her body but cannot be included within it. Secondly, in that as of God only being can be predicated. But in no way can it be said of him what he is. So the human soul is only understood to be, but what she is neither herself nor any other creature understands. Thus the aforesaid Gregory, in the eleventh chapter of the above-mentioned treatise on the image, drawing a distinction between the bodily senses and the nature of the mind, in treating of the mind says that it is incomprehensible. What then in its very nature is the mind, he asks, which divides itself up with the powers of the senses, and through each of them receives befittingly the knowledge of the things that are? For no wise man, I fancy, doubts, but that it is something other than sense. For if it were itself what sense is, it would certainly have an affinity in sense operation with one of the senses, for it is simple, and no variety may be admitted into the simple. But now if the senses are compared with one another, it is seen that touch is one thing and smell another and that the others are similarly related to one another without mingling. Seeing that each has its apt and proper function. The mind itself, then, must be something of a nature altogether different from sense, if we are to keep its intelligible simplicity free from all variety. Who, asks the apostle, has known the mind of God? But I would rather say, who has understood his own mind? Would those who place the nature of God among the things which they hold within their comprehension say if they understood themselves, if they knew the nature of their own mind? Is it perhaps a thoroughly partable nature, and thoroughly composite? How should an intelligible be in composition? Or what would be the mode of putting together the different genera? But if it is simple and incomposite, how is it divided into the manifold divisions of sense? How is variety found in the simple, or unity in variety? But to know the solution of these things of which there is question I have recourse to the very words of God himself. For he says, let us make man in our image and likeness. So long as the image does not lack any of those things which are discerned in the primal exemplar, it is a proper image, but if in anything it departs from conformity to the primal exemplar, there it is no longer an image. Is it not therefore necessary because incomprehensibility of essence is among the things which are predicated of the divine nature that he to whom the image has been apportioned shall imitate wholly the primal exemplar? For if the nature of the image were to comprehend the primal exemplar, it will itself be beyond comprehension. If contrariety is found in those things that are predicated of the divine nature, which must happen in this case, the fault is attributed to the image. But since the very nature of our mind, which is made in the image of its creator, escapes knowledge, it possesses an exact likeness to that which is placed above it by the fact that in itself it is unknowable, showing the characteristic of an incomprehensible nature. Again, in the thirteenth chapter he writes, Since God is himself the most beautiful and best of all things, that towards which all things which have a desire towards the good aspire, we therefore say that the mind also is so created in the image of the fairest in so far as it participates in the likeness of the primal exemplar as much as it is permitted to reside in the good. But if in some manner it transgresses beyond this limit, 
it is denuded of the beauty of that in which it had been residing. Indeed we say that the mind is adorned with the beauty of the primal exemplar in the same way as a mirror is adorned by the reflection of that which appears in it. By the same analogy again we hold that the mind possesses a nature administered by itself, and that this is adorned by a beauty which is derived from it, as though it were a reflection of a reflection, and that the substantial material, that is the material substance, associated with this nature is held and embraced by it. Now the reason why he says this is that nature is properly observed only in association with matter, because matter floats about until it discovers the form by which it is established. Therefore, he continues, if one thing is held by another, the presence of the true good is brought down through all things corrationally and forms by means of that which is placed beneath it that which is consequent to it, that is, it forms matter by means of mind. But when the dispersion of this most excellent connaturality is brought about, and in a contrary manner that which is above becomes that which is below, then occurs the deformation of that matter which has been described by nature, that is, by the natural order. For matter by itself is a deformed thing, when the order of nature has been changed and the natural beauty of the deformed is destroyed, that beauty in which it was formed through the mind, and so the distribution of the baseness of matter is extended through nature into the mind, so that you will no more see the image of God in the character of what has been formed. For the mind, placing the form of good things, like a mirror, behind itself, throws away the manifestations of the greatest good, but at the same time absorbs into itself the deformity of matter, and in this way evil is generated, produced by the elimination of good. For every consequent event is good which properly possesses the first good, but everything which is extraneous to relation and likeness to the first good is altogether lacking in good. If therefore in accordance with the reasoning given the one which truly is is reasonably held to be good and the mind is created in the image of the good and is the possessor of well-being, but the nature of the body, which is contained in the mind, is as it were the image of an image, from this it is demonstrated that our material principle is constituted indeed and stabilized when it is administered by the nature of the mind, but it is dissolved again and decays when it is separated from the mind which contains and stabilizes it and is banished from connaturality with the good. And this occurs through no other means than the conversion of its nature to its opposite, when desire is felt. Not for the good, but for that which has need of a forming principle. For it is necessary that all matter be conformed through its lack of proper form to something dishonorable and a likeness of deformity. A little later St. Gregory writes, and from this the conclusion is drawn that in the composite man the mind is indeed administered by God, but our material life is administered by mind, provided that it remains in its own nature, that is to say, in the image of mind, but if it abandons its nature, it is also alienated from that operation which occurs through the mind. Now anyone who closely follows the words of this theologian will find references everywhere in the text of the treatise on the image to a threefold division in the constitution of man, out of which the order of his nature is woven, as though it were produced by the composition of the three, that is, the mind, the vital motion, which he sometimes calls the fluid, and sometimes the material, life principle, and the informed matter. So that the whole man is said to consist of mind, the material life principle, and matter itself. And indeed the mind, in which all the virtue of the soul subsists, is made in the image of God, and is the mirror of the supreme good, since in it the incomprehensible form of the divine essence is in an ineffable and incomprehensible way displayed. But the material life principle, whose specific activity centers about matter, and which for that reason is called material, seeing that it is involved in the mutable matter of the body, is a kind of image of the mind, and, as St. Gregory says, a reflection of a reflection, so that the mind is a representation of the divine nature, but the vital motion, which is also called the material life principle, is with matter itself the form of mind, as it were a second image, through which the mind displays the form even of matter. And thus, in a way the whole man can be suitably described as fashioned after the image of God, although really and primarily it is only in the mind that the image can be seen to subsist it is like this, the mind receives the cause of its formation, without any intervening creature, from God, while the vital motion receives it from the mind, and finally matter receives the cause of its formation from the mind through the vital motion. Thus matter follows vital motion, and vital motion follows mind, and finally mind follows God, when therefore it turns towards him it preserves the beauty and integrity of its nature, but when it turns away from him it wastes and disfigures not only itself but also that which is subject to it, that is, the material life principle and matter itself as well. But in connection with this vital motion, a question of some importance arises. For it is necessary to inquire whether or not it pertains to the nature of man. If it does not, why is it called the image of an image? 
that is, the image of the mind? And how could mind through it produce a form for matter? But if such a vital principle is entirely part of the substance of man, how can we say that man is a product of soul and body only, and how is it that the vital principle is found in nothing wherein the matter has been dissolved? For it does not have its home in matter, which has already been abandoned by all vital motion when it is deprived of the presence of substantial life which is the soul. Nor is it seen to subsist in the soul which is unaffected by matter after it has ceased to control the body. For this reason I think that no better explanation can be given of the vital motion than that it is a kind of link or junction between body and soul, through which they are attached to one another, and by means of which the body is formed by the soul and is given life by it and is administered by it in waking and sleeping, that is, whether the soul gives attention to the activities of the body, or withdraws from the senses and rests within itself as though forgetful of its body. But even then it does not cease in a secret and ineffable silence to administer the body, bestowing upon all its parts food for the nourishment and preservation thereof. But when body and soul are separated from one another, there is an end of that vital motion. For it cannot live when it has nothing to move, that is to say, unless that is preserved through which it has movement, since it is nothing else than the movement of mind governing body. But on death there is an end of movement and of being moved, so that movement therein perishes entirely. For the coming to rest of the moved or the mover is the end of all movement. Therefore when the soul rests from moving her body, all vital motion, that is, the whole material life principle, ceases to be. Therefore the same blessed Gregory writes in his fourteenth chapter, this material and fluid life of bodies, which goes forward by a continuous motion, possesses the virtue of being in this, that its motion has no rest for just as a river is seen to fill a valley through which it flows by the impetus of its flood, without the same water being conveyed twice over the same place, but some flows downstream and some flows from above, so what is material in this life, moved as it is over a certain place, is changed by a continual succession of flux and alteration so that it can never cease to move. And so its inability to stop results in unceasing motion, which is different but involves the same appearances. But if ever the motion shall cease, it will procure an absolute cessation of being, that is to say, it will utterly cease to be. But if you wish to see how the mind is enclosed in no part of the body while by its presence it administers the whole body, and is everywhere a whole throughout all the parts it administers. Hear what St. Gregory has to say in the fifteenth chapter of the same treatise. It was the purpose of our treatise to show that the mind is not retained in any given part of the body, but that it is in contact with all parts equally, and consequently operates the motion in accordance with the part of the nature which is subject to it. But there are times when the mind follows the inclinations of nature, as if it were the servant. For often the bodily nature commands it, and imposes upon the mind the emotion of one who grieves and the desire of one who rejoices, so that it takes the initiative, exciting in the mind the hunger for food or the desire for some delightful thing. And the mind receiving these stimulants enters into a conference with the body for the purpose of gaining opportunities of satisfying them. This, however, is not the case with all, but only with those who find themselves more in the condition of captives, who force the reason to serve the desires of the bodily nature and employ the mind servilely to flatter the lust which operates through the bodily senses. But in the more perfect it is not so. For the mind rules by reason, and is not passive, but chooses that which is useful, the mind marches before and nature follows after. Now reason discovers three varieties in the vital force, the first is that which gives nourishment without sense, the second is that which gives nourishment and sense, but is without the operation of reason, and the third is perfect and reasonable which penetrates every power so that it may take up its abode in them, although it has more sway over the intellectual. But let no one suppose from this that there are three souls mixed together in a corporate man, or that each of these can be marked off from the others by its proper limits, so that we come to believe that the human soul is an amalgamation of many souls. The true and perfect soul is by nature a unity, intellectual and immaterial, and is bound to the material nature through the senses. Now all matter is in a state of flux and mutability. If then it partake of the life-giving power, it is moved to increase, but if it fall away from the life-giving act, its motion will be towards corruption and it will perish. Therefore neither can there be operation of the sense without the material essence, nor of the intellect without the sense. And in the sixteenth chapter he speaks again about sense, the mind is not contained in any particular part of the things that are in us, but is extended equally in and through all parts. It neither contains the body as something outside it nor is contained as something within it. This can properly be said of utensils or jars or other such objects where one is placed within the other. 
but the intellect is associated with the body by a contact which is ineffable and unintelligible, being neither within the body, for the incorporeal cannot be contained within the corporeal, nor held from without, for that which is incorporeal cannot be encompassed, but mind draws near to nature after a super-rational and unintelligible mode and is fitted to it and is considered in relation to it, neither placed within it nor enfolded by it. But how this can be is not to be explained or comprehended save that it is through the proper disposition of that permeable nature that the mind also becomes effective. But if that nature suffers some flaw, the movement of the intelligence is proportionally disordered. By this he means to say, if the instrument of the body is damaged or is in any way deficient, and the integrity of its natural constitution has by some accident been spoiled, the movement of the intelligence, that is, the movement of the mind, wavers in that part where the damage has occurred to the instrument, that is to say, where it is unable to actualize its administrative potency not because the mind is at fault, but because that part, being damaged, cannot receive the power of the mind. But since it is necessary to make a diligent examination of human nature, and to distinguish beyond question what in it is created in the image and likeness, that is, in the like image of God, and what in it is far removed from the likeness of the divine image, I thought fit to bring in the words of the most holy and most wise Master Gregory. In the seventeenth chapter of his treatise on the image. Then, he writes, Let us consider again the word of God, let us make man in our image and likeness. What notions, unworthy of man's excellence, derived from external things, have been conceived by those who seek to magnify man by comparing him with this world, as if it existed in him. For they call him muiota caparo cap omicron sigma mu omicron, that is, a little world, consisting of the same elements as those from which the universe is created. But those who praise man with this title have forgotten that the properties for which they honor him are common to the mouse and the flea. For in these two, the composition is of the same four elements. As in every single living creature there is a portion, whether greater or less, of these, without which no sensible can have any consistency of nature at all. What are we to think of man made after the stamp and likeness of the world when the heaven has passed away and the earth has been changed and all things contained in it have passed away with the disappearance of the world which contained them? But according to the church's reasoning, the greatness of man lies not in his likeness to the created world but in the fact that he is created according to the image of the creator of nature. What then, you will rightly ask, is the reason of this image? How can the corporeal be assimilated to the incorporeal? How the temporal to the eternal, that which is mutable and fluid to the immutable, that which is passive and corruptible to the impassive and incorruptible? That which dwells with evil and ever turns towards it to that which is pure from all evil. For between that mind, the divine, which is the primal exemplar, and that which is created after its image, a vast space intervenes. For if the image possessed a likeness to the primal exemplar then it could rightly be given the same name, but if the imitation is far removed from the archetype it is no longer its image but something different. So how can man, this mortal and passive and quickly withering object, be the image of the nature which is immortal, pure, and ever-existent? Only that truth which truly is fully knows the true reason of this image, but after a search for the truth of this by calm speculations and opinions, in so far as it can be grasped, we say in reply to these questions the following, neither does the word of God lie when it says that man is made after the image of God, nor is the misery even to unhappiness of human nature assimilated to the bliss of the life that knows no passion. For we must choose between two alternatives. If someone compares to God that which is ours, either the divine is passive or the human impassive, if the principle of likeness is to be equal in each. But if the divine is not passive, nor our own nature free from passion then what other principle remains on which we may affirm the truth of the word of God which declares that man was made in the image of God? Must we reject the holy scripture? Let us then open up a way which shall lead from what is written to what we wish to solve. After he said, let us make man in our own image and let us make him after this sort, the text goes on to say that God made man, after the image of God made he him, male and female made he them. It is then stated in the text before us that these words are uttered for the refutation of heretical impiety, so that by learning that the only begotten God created man in his own image, we may not separate the divinity of the Father from that of the Son, seeing that the Holy Scripture also calls both God, him who created man and him in whose image he was created. But we must not go on about this. Now we must turn to the question how an unhappy thing can be called by Holy Scripture a similitude of what is divine and blessed. For this purpose the text must be examined carefully. 
For we find that that which was made in the image of God is one thing and that which is shown to be now an unhappiness another. God made man, it is written. In the image of God made he him. The creation of that which was made in the image is completed, and then follows according to the structure of the text an epinalypsis or repetition, male and female, created he them. For I think that all will agree that this is something outside the principal image. For, according to the Apostle, in Christ Jesus there is neither male nor female. And yet the text says that man is divided into these two categories. Does it not then appear that there is a twofold fashioning of our nature, one by which we are assimilated to God, the other by which we are divided by this differentiation? For something of this sort is implied in the construction of the words, for first it is said that God created man, in the image of God created he him, and then are added the words, male and female created he them, something which is alien from the properties of God. Now it is my opinion that a right and excellent doctrine may be drawn from this scriptural text. This doctrine is as follows, humanity is the middle term between two extremes widely separated from each other, namely, the incorporeal nature of God, and the irrational nature of the beasts. Let us consider each of these extremes in relation to man, the divine portion, which is a rational and intelligible nature, and which does not admit the distinction between male and female, and the corporeal constitution of the irrational nature and its falling by division into two kinds, the male and the female. Each of these is wholly present in all who participate in human life. But from the order in which the generation of man is related we learn that the intelligible nature comes first, and that the association and kinship with the irrational nature is something which was superadded to man. For it is first written that God made man in the image of God, showing by these words that, as the Apostle says, in one who was so created there is neither male nor female. Then the material properties of human nature are added. Male and female, created he them. What are we to learn from this? And let no man accuse me of dragging out the matter in question. God in his nature is every good thing that can be known. But the highest existing intelligible and comprehensible good creates human life for no other reason than that well-being should be its property. And therefore, moved to create our nature, he would only be employing an imperfect power of goodness if while granting some of what he contains to man he withheld full participation through envy. But the perfection of his goodness is apparent in this, that not only does he bring man from non-existence into generation, but ordains that he shall not lack goodness. But seeing that the catalogue of individual goods is long, and not easy to enumerate, Scripture indicates them all comprehensively by saying that man was made in the image of God. For by this is meant that he made human nature a participant in every good. For if God is the plenitude of good things, and man is an image of God, the image must resemble the primal exemplar in this respect also, that it is the plenitude of all good. Is there then not in us every form of good, every virtue, every wisdom and everything whatever that is best? In this respect also it is the image, in that it is free from all necessity, and is subjected to no natural or material authority but possesses in itself a will which is capable of obtaining its desires. For virtue is a voluntary thing, free from all domination. For that which is constrained under duress cannot be a virtue. Therefore if in all things the image exhibits the stamp of the beauty of the primal exemplar, except for a difference in a particular, it will not yet be an entire likeness, although in all parts it shows that it is not far removed from being so. What kind of difference do we see between God and the man who is like unto God? This, that the one nature is uncreated. While the other obtains its being through creation, and this difference of character leads to others that follow as a result. For it is agreed that a nature which is uncreated cannot undergo change, but always remains the same, while the creature does not subsist without change. For the very transition from not being into being is a kind of change, the God will transmutation into existence of that which does not exist and just as the gospel calls the impression on the coin the image of Caesar, from which we learn that the shape of that which is molded is in the likeness of Caesar. But the subject itself is something different from Caesar, so also in the present instance of the imagings which are taken from the divine nature, considering their existence in human. Nature in those in whom there is a likeness to God, we discern a difference of subject between that which is observed in the uncreated and that which is observed in the created nature. Seeing therefore that the one remains ever the same while the other, being a created product, takes its origin from a mutation and itself naturally possesses a changeableness akin to that mutation. For this reason he who in the words of the prophet knows all things before their generation, following were rather foreknowing by his prognostic power, 
into what the motion of the human will would by its own virtue and power resolve itself, for he saw that which was to be, built upon the image the superstructure of the distinction between male and female. And in this there is no longer a likeness to the divine primal exemplar, but, as has been said, a property of the less rational nature. But the reason for this superstructure will only be known to those who regard the truth in its purity and are ministers of the word. But we, in so far as we are able, in giving our opinion from certain conjectures and from what follows from them, shall not dogmatically set forth what comes into our mind, but propose certain theories which may be suitable to the ears of the faithful as though for practice in disputation. What, then, is our opinion in this matter? The text God created man is not limited to a single individual but applies to all humanity. For the name of Adam is not here given to the creature as later on in the story, but the name given to the man who was created is of universal application. Are we not to gather from the universal application of the term nature that in God's prescience and power the whole of humanity was understood to be in question in that first creation? For we should regard none of the creatures made by God as infinite with him, but the wisdom of the Creator is the defining limit and measure of each one of them. Therefore as an individual man is limited by a certain quantity of body, and his substance is measured by the extent of the surface by which his body is perfected, so, I think, the whole plenitude of humanity was included by the God of all men through his prognostic virtue, as it were in a single body, and this is the teaching of that text which says that God created man, in the image of God created he him. For the image is not in a part of man's nature, nor grace in any one of those considered to have grace, but such power attaches to the whole genus equally. It is an indication of this that mind is allotted to all men alike, so that all possess the power of understanding and taking counsel, and it is the same with regard to all the other things by which is revealed the divine nature in that which is created after it. And the man who was revealed in the first constitution of the world, and the man who is to come after the consummation of all things, both equally bear within them the divine image. And the reason why the totality is described as one man is that in the power of God there is no past and no present, but what he beholds is contained in the ever-present comprehensive operation of his universality. Therefore all human nature, which has endured from the beginning until now, is an image of him who truly exists, but that differentiation of the genus into male and female was a later addition to the constitution of the human form. And let it not surprise you that we so often have recourse to the opinions of the same author, for our purpose is not to improve upon his treatise but to clarify our problem. In the eighteenth chapter of the same discourse he writes, the glory of the resurrection promises us precisely this, the restitution of the fallen to their pristine state. For the grace to which we are to look forward is the return to our first way of life, leading back to paradise once again him who was expelled therefrom. Therefore the life of those who have been restored to that which is properly held to be the life of the angels was itself before the fall an angelic life, and therefore the return itself to our former way of life is likened to the angels. But just as it is written that there is no giving in marriage among them and yet that their armies consist of infinite myriads, for so Daniel has related it in his visions, perhaps if no perversion and falling away from the angelic nature had been wrought in us through the same man by sin, we should not now be compelled to multiply ourselves by matrimony. For in the angelic nature there is a different mode of propagation, and one which cannot be described or understood by human reason, but yet it is so, and the same mode would operate in those who were created a little lower than the angels, to give increase to man according to the measure appointed by the plan of the Creator. But should one have difficulty and make inquiry into the mode of propagation of souls if man did not enter into the intercourse of marriage? We shall indicate the mode of the angelic substance which in that one essence exists in infinite myriads and are numbered as many. For to one inquiring how man could survive without matrimony, we will suitably reply, in the same way as the angels manage without matrimony, for that man was like unto them before the fall is shown by his return once more to that nature. Well then, now that these questions have been well decided by us, a return must be made to our former question, namely how after the establishment of the image itself God imposed upon its formation the superstructure of the differentiation into male and female? I offer as useful in this connection a theory which I put forward previously. For he who brought all things into being and formed man entirely in his will after the divine image, did not establish intervals in which future things would gradually be added, through his knowledge of the number of souls which was required to bring humanity to its fullness, but intellect through his prognostic act the whole of human nature at once in its fullness, and gave it a place of high honor and a tranquility coequal with that of the angels. 
but since he foresaw by his contemplative power that man would not rightly walk in the way of a good will and would therefore fall from the angelic way of life, he formed in our nature a plan of propagation suitable to those who have been snared into sin, so that the number of human souls should not be diminished when human nature had fallen from the power of propagating itself in the angelic mode. And implanted in man the irrational method of propagation of the beasts of the field in place of the glorious fecundity of the angels. Moreover, the great David, bewailing the misery of man, seems to me to lament human nature in these words, man when he was held in honor did not understand his honor, referring to his equality of status with the angels. And so, he said he was now compared with the beasts of the field who are without reason. For in very truth man has become like cattle, now that on account of his inclination towards the material nature he has accepted the animal mode of generation. The whole drift of the words which you have taken from this great theologian is towards an understanding that man is created in the image of God in his mind only and in its innate powers, now the innate powers of the mind are wisdom, knowledge, the faculty of reason, and those others which by adorning the mind show it to be in the likeness of the Creator, and that all men were at once and together created in that one man about whom it is written, Let us make man in our image and likeness, and in whom all men sinned for at the time he was all of mankind that existed, and that in him all men have been driven forth from the bliss of paradise. And if man were not in a state of sin, he would not be suffering the division of his simplicity into the sexes. And this distinction has absolutely no connection with the divine image and likeness, and would never have existed had man not sinned. Nor will it exist after the restoration of our nature to its pristine condition, which will be manifested after the general resurrection of all men. If then man had not sinned, no one would be born through the intercourse of the sexes nor from seed, but just as the angelic essence while remaining one is at once and together without temporal interval multiplied into infinite myriads, so too human nature, had it been willing to obey the mandate, and had it obeyed it, would have at once and together broken forth into the number foreknown to its creator alone. But God, who neither deceives nor is deceived, foresaw that man would abandon the rank and dignity of his creation and therefore superimposed upon human nature an alternative mode of propagation, by which this world might be extended in space and time to allow for man to pay for his general offence a general penalty, by being born like the rest of the animals from a corruptible seed, but while we are collecting these and many similar passages from the teachings of this master. Many questions emerge on all sides. Of which the first and most important strikes one most forcibly, if all men, not only those who have been and those who are but also those who shall be, were at once and together created in that divine word which says. Let us make man, and if those corruptible bodies which are born from a corruptible and mortal and material seed are external to the human nature which is made in the image of God, and are superimposed upon it because of our sin and would therefore have no existence if man had not dishonoured the beauty of the divine image in which he is created, it is not irrelevant to inquire how the first creation of man is in the image of God, for the second is not in the image but is something superimposed upon that image for the reason already stated. Did the first creation take place only in the soul apart from the body, or in soul and body together? If in the soul alone, how can it be called man, seeing that it is agreed that man is composed of two natures, the invisible nature in the soul and the visible nature in the body? I should not think that it was only a part of man that was then created, or that we should synecdochically understand the words, let us make man. Chiefly because the prophetic books give us the fullest and most perfect account of the creation of all natures. If on the other hand the first creation is rightly referred to soul and body, that is, to the whole integral man, then it must at once be asked what kind of body that was which man possessed at his first creation. For true reason cannot accept that this body was something superimposed upon us because of sin, for it was established in the first natural confirmation of man. This question is not a superfluous one. And the posing of it and its solution will not be without value. As you are the poser. You have made yourself responsible for the answer. For I do not think you would have asked it unless you had some answer in readiness. That body which was created at the establishment of man in the beginning I should say was spiritual and immortal, and either like or identical with that which we shall possess after the resurrection. For I would not easily admit that it could have been a corruptible and material body at a time when the cause of corruption and materiality, that is, sin, had not yet appeared. And a still greater objection is that it is quite apparent to the reason that if that very body which was made at the first creation of man before the fall is after the fall suddenly changed and made corruptible, then that corruptible body was not a superstructure but is simply the spiritual and incorruptible body transformed into an earthly body, and therefore the authority of the great master, Gregory the Theologian, would seem to waver.
a thing not to be believed. For the unhesitatingly asserts that the whole which in the first creation of man is created in the image of God remains in its psychosomatic structure eternally incorruptible. Passing over the lucid arguments by which he affirms beyond doubt that neither were souls created before bodies nor bodies before souls, but that the whole man was made at once and together in the divine council in which it is said, let us make man, and that at the same time by a kind of second begetting imposed upon the first, he is born into this world, as happens now, at a given moment of time, as a result of the sin of the perverse will of human nature, and that that spiritual, a natural body which is in eternal association with mind and forms one composite entity with it is distinguished from that which was added as a penalty for our transgression, we come to his most brilliant explanation of this matter in the twenty-seventh chapter of the treatise to which we have already had recourse so often, for the fluidity and mutability of our nature is not all pervasive. If it were so it would be altogether unknowable for we should have by nature no stability. But a more careful analysis shows that there is something of us which endures while another part is subject to change. For the body undergoes change by increase and diminution, like garments, which are changed with the changing of one's age. But throughout all these changes there is a form which abides and is itself unchangeable, never giving up those marks which were inscribed at one time on it from its very nature, and this with its marks is apparent in all bodily changes. But change, which results from some passion and which is an accident superimposed upon our form, is removed through the word of God. For that deformity through formlessness, like some strange face, takes its own form, but when that formlessness is removed by the word, as in the case of Naman the Syrian and the ten lepers as told in the gospel, the face obscured by the disease shines forth in health again along with its marks. Therefore in the conformity of the soul to God. It is not that which displays the flux of mutability and the capacity of transformation which is the innate quality of the soul but that which is permanent, and likewise unchanging in our composition, that is placed in our soul. And the mutable qualities of our composition are an additional form to the differentiations of our species. But this composition is nothing else than a mixture of the elements, and the elements, from which the human body also is composed, are constitutive principles of the universe. It necessarily follows therefore that, since the species is permanent in our soul, like the device of a signet ring, those impressions of the signet which are to be repeated according to the form are not unknown to the soul, but in the time when the impression is to be made anew she will again receive to herself whatever will fit the character of her form. And the form which will be impressed upon her will be in accord with the characters impressed upon her in the beginning. You see how nicely he distinguishes the property of the first creation from those which were added to it? For whatsoever in human bodies is seen to be immutable is proper to the first creation. But whatever in them is perceived to be mutable and variable, this has been added later, and subsists outside the body's true nature. Now in all human bodies generally there is one and the same common form, and that abides ever unchangeable in all. For the innumerable differences which are accidental to the one form do not arise from the reason of the first creation but from the qualities of the corruptible seeds. Therefore the spiritual form is itself the spiritual body which was made in the first creation of man. But that which is derived from matter, that is, from the qualities and quantities of the four elements of the sensible world together with that qualitative form about which we had something to say in the earlier books, since they undergo increase and diminution, undoubtedly pertain to the composition of the superadded and, one might say, superfluous body. And the material and external body is like a garment and is not improperly regarded as the outward expression of the internal and natural body. For it is moved through times and ages, suffering increase and loss of itself, while the interior body remains ever immutably in its proper state. But seeing that the exterior body also is created by God, and is added by him to the other. The greatness of the divine goodness and his infinite providence towards all things which are was not willing that it should entirely perish and be reduced to nothing, because it comes from that providence and holds the lowest rank among creatures, now everything which is born into this world by generation in space and time must have an end whether the interval between its birth into this life and the end of the same life be a very short while, a day, an hour or a moment, or a very long period of centuries, or a moderate period of seasons or years, this being demanded by the nature of created things. For everything which comes into being in the world and is composed of the stuff of the world must of necessity be dissolved and perish with the world. It was then necessary for the exterior and material body to be resolved into those elements from which it was put together, but it was not necessary that it should perish, because it came from God. The interior body. Of course endures forever and abides without change in those principles according to which it was constituted with and in and through and for the sake of the soul. 
but since the species of that other body, the material and dissoluble, abides in the soul, not only during life but even after dissolution and return into the elements of the world, for the dispute between Abraham and the rich man shows that the idea of the body abides with the soul after death therefore the soul cannot forget or cease to know her parts wherever among the elements they may be scattered. For although they are something which has been added to human nature as the result of sin, they cannot be devoid of all connection with it, seeing that they were added and created by the same Creator as created the nature, and therefore in the restoration of man to the unity of his nature they are to be recalled, so that at the time of the resurrection the soul will receive the whole of that which had been subject to her. This is the meaning of the Master's saying. It necessarily follows that since the species is permanent in our soul, like the device of a signet ring, those impressions of the signet which are to be repeated according to the form are not unknown to the soul. By this he means that while the species, that is, the idea inscribed on the signet, or exterior body, which he calls the signet of the inner, abides in the soul even after the dissolution of the signet, she is not without knowledge, because of that idea which always abides, of the parts of the signet which are scattered among the elements, and which on the day of the resurrection are to be reformed in the signet, that is, in the body conformed to the soul, which is the interior body. For the exterior and material body is the signet of the interior, on which the form of the soul is expressed, and therefore is rightly called its form. But do not think that I am teaching that there are two natural bodies in the one man. For there is only one body by whose fitting together with the soul so as to form with her one nature and one substance man is made. For that material body, which is added to it is not so much to be regarded as a true body as a kind of mutable and corruptible garment of the true and natural body. For that is not true which does not eternally abide and, in the words of St. Augustine, that which begins to be what it formerly was not, and ceases to be what it is, is already not. Hence it comes about that this mortal, corruptible, earthly and animal body is never simple but has a certain accretion added to it, and thereby is distinguished from the simple body itself, which was created in man in the beginning, and which will be. What then shall we reply to the most holy and godly theologian St. Augustine? whose teaching seems to go against these arguments. For in almost all his books he shows no hesitation in declaring that the body of the first man before the fall was of the animal form, was earthly and was mortal, although it could not have come to a mortal end if man had not sinned, for it died through sin, as the apostle says, the body indeed is dead through sin. Thus in the first book on the baptism of young children, when arguing against those who say that Adam was so created that even had he not deserved to die because of his sin, he would nevertheless have died, not as a punishment for a fault but through the necessity of nature, he writes, What response have they to the scriptural authority that God said in reproach and condemnation to the first man even after his sin, Dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return? For he was not dust in respect of his soul, but, as is clear, in respect of his body, and it was through the death of that same body that he was about to return unto dust for although he was dust in respect of the body, and the body in which he was created was an animal body, yet, if he had not sinned, he would have been changed into a spiritual body and without danger of death into that incorruption which is promised to the faithful and to the saints. And the yearning for this within ourselves is not only apparent to ourselves but also is indicated by the words of the apostle when he says, for in this we complain, desiring to put on our habitation which is from heaven, which if we put on we shall not be naked. For as we are in this habitation we are weighed down and mourn, in which we do not wish to be despoiled, but to be garmented afresh, in order that mortality may be swallowed up in life. If, then, Adam had not sinned, he would not have to be despoiled of his body, but would be clothed anew with immortality and incorruption. In order that his mortality might be swallowed up in life. That is, that he might exchange his animal nature for a spiritual. For there was no fear for him that he should remain too long in his animal body and be burdened with age and after a period of old age gradually arrive at the point of death. For if God provided the Israelites with garments and sandals, which after so many years were never worn out, what would be strange if his power could grant obedient man that possessing this animal and mortal body, he should possess it in such a manner that he might become aged without enfeeblement? and be destined at a time willed by God to pass without the mediation of death from mortality to immortality? For just as this flesh which we now possess is not invulnerable by the fact that it is not necessary for it to be wounded, so that flesh was not immortal by the fact that it was not necessary for it to die. I believe that this grace was conferred upon those who were translated hence without undergoing death, even while they were still in the animal and mortal body. For neither were Enoch nor Elijah for all their years tarnished by old age, and yet, as I think, 
they were not while upon earth Enoch and already changed into that spiritual kind of body which is promised Elijah in resurrection and which was first manifested in our Lord, say perhaps that they do not lack that food which refreshes by its own consumption. But from the time when they were translated they so live as to enjoy a society similar to that of those forty days when Elijah lived without food save for a cup of water and a cake of bread. Or if there is a need even of such resources as these, perhaps they feed in paradise as Adam did before he was compelled to depart thence as a penalty for his sin. For he had, I think, refreshment from hunger from the fruits of trees and a bulwark against old age in the tree of life. But what purpose would be served by piling up the mighty proofs of this mighty and admirable man when it is perfectly clear to all who read his books, but especially Genesis understood literally and the city of God, that concerning the body of the first man before the fall his teaching is none other than that it was animal and mortal. For if it had not been animal, how would it have been bidden to ward off hunger by eating of the fruits of paradise, and old age by eating of the tree of life? For, as St. Augustine himself often declares, the first human creatures are held to have eaten of the fruits of paradise before the fall, and to have done so in a corporeal sense. Let him reply who will and can, but for you and me perhaps it is enough to read the opinions of the Holy Fathers concerning the condition of man before the fall, and to inquire cautiously and diligently into the findings of each one of them. But it is times not our business to bring one into conflict with another, or to justify one against another knowing as we do that after the holy apostles none of the Greeks has higher authority in expounding the holy scripture than Gregory the theologian, and none of the Romans than Aurelius Augustinus. And what if in what appears to be a controversy between great men we wish to find an agreement by saying that that body which Gregory says, was added as a superstructure to human nature by the divine prescience on account of the future sin, is the same as that which Augustine calls animal, and if Gregory does not refrain from saying that there were two creations of man, the one a substantial creation in the image of God, the other widely different from that image, and divided because of sin into male and female and Augustine said that there was one division into male and female and was silent about the other which is in the image of God and lacks all sex? What relevance has this, when we consider that it is not a true estimate of Saint Augustine to say that he was silent concerning the creation of man in the image of God but expounded that which according to Gregory was established on account of sin in the image of the beasts of the field? especially as anyone who glances through his books will have no difficulty in discovering that in the first man male and female were created in the image of God, and the animal bodies themselves with. Which they were endowed before the fall were not the result of punishment for sin, but of the necessity of nature, that is to say, for the fulfillment by procreation of the predestined number of holy men, which from human nature are to be made one in the angelic society of bliss. Until the celestial city might be filled with holy angels and with holy men, but I do not cease to be amazed why he calls that body animal which he exalts with loud praises as spiritual and blessed. For that it was blessed before the fall he himself testifies in the tenth chapter of the fourteenth book of the city of God, but it is a fair question whether the first man or the first human creatures, for there were two in marriage, had in the animal body before the fall those affections before they sinned from which we in the spiritual body shall be free when our sin is purged and done away, namely, concupiscence and joy, fear and grief. If they had them, how could they have been blessed in paradise, that memorable abode of bliss? Who can finally and absolutely be called blessed that either fears or sorrows? But how could those human creatures either fear or grieve in that copious affluence of such great goods, where they were out of the danger of death or any evil sickness of the body, having all things that a good will desired and lacking all things that might be offensive to the physical or mental contentment of man? their love for God was immutable, there existed between them the faithful and sincere association of loving consorts, and from that love they derived great joy, having power to enjoy in full what they loved. They were in a peaceable avoidance of sin, and so long as that continued it kept out all external annoyance which might distress them. Did they desire, do you think, to taste of the forbidden tree, and yet fear to die? And thereby experience distress even then and even in that place through the passions of lust and fear? God forbid we should think this to have been where there was no sin at all. For sin could not be absent where there was a lust for that which was forbidden by God, an abstinence through fear of the punishment instead of the love of righteousness. God forbid, I say, that before any sin was there should yet have been such a sin that that should be proved true in relation to the tree which God said in relation to the woman, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. How happy then were the first human creatures, being troubled with no perturbations of the mind nor hurt by any discomforts of the body. 
even so happy should all mankind have been if those had not committed sin which they transferred to their posterity, and if none of their seed had committed an act worthy of condemnation. And this bliss remaining until by the utterance of the benediction increase and multiply, the number of the predestined saints were fulfilled, then should another and better bliss have been given us, namely, that which has been given to the most blessed angels, wherein there would be an eternal security from sin and death, and so should the saints have lived then without tasting of labor, sorrow or death, as they shall do now in the resurrection of the dead when the bodily incorruption is restored to them, after they have endured them all. Again in the 25th, sick, chapter of the same book he writes, Therefore man lived in paradise as he desired so long as he only desired what God commanded. He lived enjoying God, the good source of his own well-being. He lived without need, and he had life eternal in his power. He had meat for hunger, drink for thirst, the tree of life to ward off old age. His senses were free from all bodily corruption and from all discomforts arising from the body. He feared neither disease within nor violence without. The acme of health was in his flesh, and fullness of peace in his mind, and as paradise was neither fiery nor frosty. So was the goodwill of its inhabitant offended neither with desire nor fear. There was no sorrow at all, no empty delight. But their joy was perpetuated by God's mercy, when they loved him with a pure heart and a good conscience and an unfeigned faith. Their wedlock love was faithful and honest, in harmony they watched over mind and body, and kept the precept without trouble. They were neither weary of leisure nor unwillingly sleepy. And can we not suppose that in all this material ease and human happiness they might beget their children without the disease of lust, and move those members by the same agreement of the will as they performed their other functions and without the deceitful goad of passion, the man being laid in his wife's lap in peace of mind and body without corruption of integrity? You see how he celebrates and praises the happiness of each sex in paradise before the fall, how holy and immaculate was their married state, what a blameless love and inseparable association existed between the pair, how lovely was the way in which those holy beings propagated their kind, and increased them to the number four ordained, finally you see that after the happiness of paradise they were to be translated to the bliss of the angels. It is not surprising if one should express astonishment that it can be believed that animal bodies have dwelt in such a height of bliss. Was it not settled between us when we were discussing the creation of human nature that man had been placed in the genus of the animals? In fact, that all the animals were according to their substance created in him. Not only because the knowledge of all things existed in him, but also because the visible and invisible universe was established in him? That was certainly our conclusion. Why then should it be considered strange or incredible if human bodies are said to have been animal bodies before they sinned in paradise, seeing that they were established in the genus of animals? For we are compelled by reason to choose between two alternatives. Either, if we wish to say that his body was not animal, we must deny that man was created holy in the genus of the animals, or, if we cannot dispute or deny the fact that he was a kind of animal created in the genus of the animals we cannot deny that the body which he had before the fall and that which would have been in bliss if it had not sinned was an animal body. You reason acutely. Now, do you hold that God made all things at once? That is certainly my belief and conviction. For all things whose birth into the world is marked by intervals of time were created at one and the same time both before the world and with the world. Although the administration of the divine providence does not fill the universe with them all at once, but in temporal succession. For the Lord says, My Father works until now. And I work. You understand rightly. Do you think that God made man in the genus of the animals because he foresaw that he would come to live as an animal? and that he would fall from the beauty and dignity of the divine image into a life of irrational animal passion? It seems likely. For he who made all things at the same time made the future. E. Since then this foreknowledge is most sure and cannot be deceived, at the same time as he created man he created the consequences of his sin even before he had sinned, and we may without impropriety judge that of the things which were created together in man, some, like those in which we see the image of God that is to say, Mind and reason and interior sense, or, in other words, essence, potency and act, were creations of the goodness of God, others are there on account of the transgression which was foreknown and was most certain to befall. 
For there are many things of which God has foreknowledge but of which he is not the cause, because they do not substantially exist, wisely he creates and ordains all things in such a way that they may not disturb the fairness of the universe, and he alone has the power to make good out of the evil of the irrational will. Now all these things, the animal, earthly and corruptible body, the sex that is divided into male and female, propagation by a mode similar to that of the beasts, the need of food and drink and clothing, the increase and decrease of the body, the alteration of sleeping and waking, and the inevitable necessity of both, and all similar limitations from which human nature would have been entirely free if it had not sinned, as it is destined one day to be free again, are the consequences of sin and were added to man's nature at the time of his creation as something external to his nature on account of sin before sin was committed, by him whose foreknowledge is not deceived. In saying this I am following Gregory of Nyssa and his commentator Maximus, without contradicting other holy fathers of the spiritual doctrine who seem to have thought differently, being of the opinion that these things refer to the first and substantial creation of man. And if you ask why God should create in man before he sinned the characteristics which were made because of sin, remember that in God nothing is before and nothing after, because for him there is nothing past, nor future, nor the passage from past to future, for to him all things are at once present. Why should he not then simultaneously create those things which he saw were to be created and willed to be created? For when we say, before and after sin, we are demonstrating the multiplicity of our thought. Processes which is due to the fact that we are still subject to temporal conditions. But to God the foreknowledge of sin and the consequence of sin itself are contemporaneous. For it is in man, not to God, that the sin was a future event, and that the consequence of sin anticipates the sin itself, seeing that even the sin itself anticipates itself in the same man. Because the evil will, which is latent sin, was antecedent to the tasting of the forbidden fruit, which is open sin. This is relevant to the interpretation of the text Jacob I loved but Esau I held in hatred. For at the time neither the good nor the evil deeds of either had been committed, and their consequences, that is, the love and the hatred in the temporal order, were already affected in the eyes of him to whom the universe is contemporaneous and one. This also is the teaching of that same Master Augustine in the thirteenth chapter of the book from which I was quoting before, for concerning the first human beings he says, but evil begins within them secretly at first to draw them into open disobedience afterwards. For there would have been no evil work had there not been an evil will before it, and what could begin this evil will but pride. That is the beginning of all evil? The meaning of this is that man was never without sin, for he was never without the mutability of the will. For that too, the irrational mutability of the free will, which is the cause of evil, must be accounted a kind of evil, for who would dare to say that the cause of evil is not itself evil, when the free will to which it was given to choose the good made itself the slave and follower of evil. It is this which Saint Augustine seems to have wished to imply. For he does not say, man lived in paradise, or he had lived in paradise, not he lived in the enjoyment of God, or he had lived in the enjoyment of God not he lived without need, or he had lived without need. For if he had used these verbs in the preterite, he might well be thought to mean that for a space of time man was in actual possession of perfect and sinless bliss in paradise. But he says, man began to live in paradise. Began to live in the enjoyment of God. Began to live without need, and this class of past tense is called by accurate observers of the different significances of the tenses the inceptive, because it signifies the inception and indication of some action which by no means necessarily reaches perfection. Now as to the fact that the first human creatures were in paradise for no temporal space. Augustine teaches in the ninth book of the Hexameron as follows, why was there no sexual intercourse between them until they had left paradise? We may reply at once, because as soon as the woman was created, and before they came together, that transgression was committed on account of which they were destined for death and departed from the place of that blessedness. For scripture makes no mention of a time elapsing between their creation and the birth of Cain. But that Adam was in paradise for a period of time before the woman was molded from his side let him declare who can. Therefore that praise of the life of man in paradise must refer rather to the life that would have been his if he had remained obedient than to that which he only began to spend and in which he did not continue. For if he had continued in it even for a brief interval he must necessarily have achieved some degree of perfection, and in that case perhaps this master would not have said, he began to live, but he lived, or he had lived although if he had used the preterite and pluperfect in this way, or if he used them elsewhere, I should rather think that he was using the preterite for the future than that he meant that man had continued for a space of time in the blessedness of paradise before the 
4. For the following reason, that he was expressing the predestined and foredetermined blessedness which was to be man's if he had not sinned, as though it had already occurred, when in fact, that is, in the effects of the completed predestination, it was still among those things which were destined to be created at some future time. Now I say this because often when he is writing about paradise he does use the preterite and pluperfect. As any careful reader of his books can discover for himself. For instance in the eleventh book of the Hexemeron, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat thy bread until thou art changed into the earth from which thou art made, for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. Who does not know, he asks, that these are the labours of man upon earth? Nor is it to be doubted that if that bliss which had existed in paradise were retained they would not have been. Had existed, he says. Not began to exist, nor is this surprising since very often the divine authority speaks of the future as though it had already happened. For who would have expected to find the devil in the bliss of paradise, who fell as soon as he was created, as the Lord says in the Gospel, he was a murderer from the beginning, and did not abide in truth. Augustine, about whom we have just been speaking, has something to say about this sentence of our Lord also in the eleventh book of his Hexemeron, that the devil was never in a state of truth, that he never lived a blessed life with the angels, but that he fell at the very beginning of his creation, this must not be accepted in the sense that he was created an evil creature by the good God, but rather that he was depraved by his own will, for otherwise it would not have been said that he fell in the beginning. For, on this supposition, he did not fall but was so created. But from the moment of his creation he turned his face away from the light of truth, being swollen with pride and infatuated with the love of his own power. Therefore he did not taste the sweetness of the angelic life, not because after trying it he rejected it, but because through his unwillingness to accept it he abandoned and lost it. Therefore he could not have had foreknowledge of his own fall for foreknowledge is the fruit of piety. But he was straightway impious, and was therefore mentally blind, and he did not fall away from a state which he had actually accepted, but from one which he would have accepted if he had been willing to subordinate himself to God. But since this was precisely what he would not do, he fell from that state which it was intended he should accept, and did not escape from the power of him under whom he would not serve, and was so weighed down by the punishment that he cannot joy in the light of righteousness, nor escape from his sentence. Likewise he is thus addressed in the character of the Prince of Tyre in the book of Ezekiel the prophet. Thou art the signet of similitude and the crown of glory, thou wast in the delights of the paradise of God, thou wast adorned with every precious stone, etc. Events which so to speak refer to a time prior to the devil's fall. And in fact there had been created by the divine dispensation that which was to have been in the devil had he not fallen. But if when such things are said of the devil the passage of time has a mystical meaning and scripture is rightly understood only in this way, what is there to prevent us from giving the same interpretation to man's having been in paradise before the fall, that is to say, that that would have happened to him if he had not sinned, especially as no authority divine or human has recorded how much time he spent in the bliss of paradise before the fall? Why should nothing be said of this, if we are to understand that he was there? On the other hand there are not lacking proofs that the time of his existence before the fall was either very short or none at all. For there is no record of his having carried out before the fall any of the commands which were given him, for instance. Increase and multiply and replenish the earth. That is, paradise. Would he not have been continuously begetting a happy progeny if he had dwelt for any length of time in paradise before his transgression, feeding upon the tree of life, lest his body should suffer corruption? Why did not the virtue of that divine and spiritual medicine prevail to keep him from sinning and falling into corruption? For if the food of the tree of life furnished his body with health and incorruptibility for one or two or a number of days, and not indefinitely, it did not then have such virtue as it is recorded and believed to have had. Or why should that be called the tree of life which only had the power of reducing the process of corruption, and not of altogether eliminating it and of endowing those who eat of it with the gift of eternal life? For if the nature of that tree is the antidote of every disease, so that it gives life to all those who feed on its fruit, why can it not conquer death in those who take of it, still more in those who eat of it? Sin, you will say, was too strong for its virtue, rendering it inoperative. Then the evil of sin was stronger than the goodness of life. Let us therefore consider the truth of the tree of life in the words of our Lord. Speaking of the devil he says, he was a manslayer from the beginning. Do you think that the fall happened to any other man than him alone whom God created in his image? No. From what beginning was the devil a manslayer? 
was it from the beginning of his own creation or from the beginning of the creation of man, or perhaps both, if both were created together and neither had his creation before the other? If the creation of the devil was prior to that of man how was the devil a manslayer from the beginning? But if the creation of man was prior to that of the devil, how can the devil be called a manslayer from the beginning of the creation of man? If, to take the remaining possibility, it was from the beginning of the creation of both that the devil was a manslayer and the man slain, what time is allowed for man's life in paradise before he was slain by the devil? This argument is clearly supported by the parable in the Gospel, a certain man was descending from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves. For it is not said that a certain man was in Jerusalem and fell among thieves. For if human nature had remained in Jerusalem, that is, paradise, it certainly would not have met with thieves, that is with the devil and his satellites. Therefore he was already beginning to descend from paradise under the impulse of his irrational will and was beginning to hasten to Jericho, that is, into the weakness and instability of temporal nature, and was already wounded by his fall, and despoiled of all those natural goods in which he had been created. From which we are given to understand that man fell himself before he was tempted by the devil, and not only this but also that it was not in paradise, but in his descent therefrom and in his freely willed abandonment of the joy of paradise, called here Jerusalem, that is to say, the vision of peace and in his fall into Jericho, that is, the present world that he was wounded by the devil and despoiled of his bliss. For it is not to be believed that the same man could both have been abiding in the contemplation of eternal peace and also have fallen at the persuasion of a woman corrupted by the poison of a serpent, or that that serpent, I mean the devil, who had already fallen from paradise, that is, from the ranks of the angelic nature, could have prevailed over a man who was not yet in a state of sin and was not already himself falling from the sublimity of the divine image. And the same doctrine, that man was created equal to the angels but did not abide in that rank, but soon began to deviate from the path of goodness, seems to be taught in the 18th chapter of St. Gregory's treatise on the image, which we have already quoted before, and which we must now quote again, he who brought all things into being and formed man entirely in his will after the divine image, did not establish intervals in which future things would gradually be added, through his knowledge of the number of perfect souls which was required to bring humanity to its perfect fullness, but intellect through his prognostic act the whole of human nature at once in its fullness, and gave it a place of high honour and a tranquillity co-equal with that of the angels. Here you are to understand that the said master puts the past for the future tense. For he says that it was by God's prognostic act that he established human nature in a place of high honour and a tranquillity co-equal with that of the angels, and how can that be understood save in the sense that although man had now been established in the causes he was not yet proceeding into the effects of his blessedness. And Saint Gregory gives the reason for his not having proceeded, but since he foresaw by his contemplative power that man would not rightly walk in the way of a good will and would therefore fall away from the angelic way of life, he formed in our nature a place of propagation suitable to those who have been snared into sin, so that the number of human souls should not be diminished when human nature had fallen from the power of propagating itself in the angelic mode. And implanted in man the irrational mode of propagation of the beasts of the field in the place of the glorious fecundity of the angels. If then these words of the holy theologian are true, and it is safe to assume that they are, we can understand nothing else but that human nature abode in the paradise in which it was naturally created for no temporal interval and without sensible effects, but that it quickly deviated from the way of truth and received as a punishment for the activity of its perverse will the division into the two sexes whereby it might propagate its kind after the manner of the beasts of the field. And therefore if human nature had remained in that blessed state in which it was created it would not have needed sexual intercourse for its propagation, but would have multiplied as the angels multiply, without the use of sex. The venerable Master Maximus, the commentator of our theologian, in his treatise on baptism agrees with this, those who put a mystical interpretation on holy writ and glorify it with more exalted speculations in so far as they are relevant. Declare that man was made in the image of God in his principles being born altogether of the Spirit through his will, and by accepting the likeness which was due to his observance of the divine mandate which was to be given him, so that the same man might be on the one hand an image of God according to nature, and on the other a son of God, and God, through the Spirit according to grace. For it was not otherwise possible for man to be shown as the Son of God and God by the deification of grace, unless he had already been born of the Spirit through his will, through the self-moving and free power that he naturally possesses. But the first man, abandoning this God-making and godly and immaterial birth, and by giving greater glory to that which is revealed and is pleasurable to the senses than to intelligible and mystical goods, 
was deservedly condemned to the disordered and material and corruptible birth of bodies, for God worthily judged that by willingly preferring the worse things to the better man exchanged his free, passionless, spontaneous and chaste birth for a birth that was painful and servile and confined to the image of the irrational brutes and the beasts of the field, and that in exchange for the divine and ineffable honour of his association with God, he was taking the dishonourable intercourse of the irrational beasts. But wishing to liberate man from this condition, and to lead him back to his divine blessedness, the word who is the creator of human nature truly becomes a man and the issue of men, and is born from man according to the body, but without sin. But that you may know that it is not an invention of our own, but something which we have learnt from the aforesaid author Maximus, that man did not taste of the tree of life, but from the start took his first and deadly nourishment from the forbidden tree, and did not raise his intelligible eye to the divine light, hear what he says in the twenty-eighth chapter of his commentary on the words of Gregory. Not willing to lift the eye of his soul to this divine light. Our first father Adam like a blind man in the darkness of ignorance which was his punishment willingly clutching with both hands at his material degradation, gave himself up entirely to the senses, through which he imbibed the corrupt poison of that bitterest of beasts. Now by the corrupt sense by which Adam was deceived he means the woman, for among the Greeks, sense, is of the feminine gender, and by the bitterest of beasts he means the devil, who instilled the poison of his wickedness into the human mind through the medium of the corporeal sense. Then he goes on to say a little later, and when sense, knowing full well that death was in the forbidden tree, yet offered him the fruit of it, he made it his first repast, and thus accommodated his life to its food, rendering it mortal and fluid throughout the corruptible body. Then he adds, so if he had trusted in God rather than in his fellow slave, the sense, and had fed on the tree of life. Perhaps he would not have laid aside the gift of immortality. Which would have been preserved by his participation in life, since all life is preserved by its own appropriate and suitable food. But the food of that blessed life is the bread that came down from heaven, and gives life to the world, as the word itself truly says of itself in the Gospels. But the first man was unwilling to feed on this fare, and was therefore deservedly rejected from the divine life, and received from its parent death another life, through which he endows himself with an irrational form and obscures the transcendent beauty of the divine, and by feeding upon the fruit betrays the whole of nature to death. But it is not our present purpose to argue against those who, admitting that man lived in bliss for a temporal period before the fall, yet dare not say how long a period that was, for we are prepared to say only those things which seem to us to be probable, to refute the opinion of others who think otherwise, or to treat it with contempt, or to pronounce it false, is none of our present business. And now I think we ought to turn to the consideration of that paradise itself. Let us, by all means do so. For this is the right method of discourse. Not to give the impression of deviating to the right or the left. That is to say, neither to depart from the doctrine which the Catholic Church has accepted as being of the highest and the holiest authority, nor spurn those who, we know, have a simple understanding, since they are contained within the sincerity of the Catholic faith. For let each one of us, as the Apostle says, be rich in his own perception. For to approve our own perception or that of those whom we consider to be the best while rejecting the perception of others is either extremely dangerous or most insolent or at least productive of controversy. Let us therefore in this business proceed with caution, humility and moderation in the footsteps of the Holy Fathers. St. Augustine writes in the eighth book of his Hexameron, I am not unaware that concerning paradise much has been written by many, but their opinions fall more or less into three categories, of which one is of those who hold that paradise is only to be understood in a corporeal sense, the second of those who say it is only spiritual, the third of those who believe that it is both, that is to say, both corporeal and spiritual. And to be brief I confess that it is the third opinion that I hold myself. And in the eleventh chapter of the fourteenth book of the City of God he writes, Wherefore in a paradise both corporeal and spiritual man made God his rule to live by. For the paradise was not corporeal for the body without being spiritual for the mind, nor was it spiritual to be enjoyed by man's inner senses without being corporeal to be enjoyed with his outer senses. No, it was both for both. But after that proud and therefore envious angel fell from the spiritual paradise turning through that pride from God to himself, desiring to creep into man's sense by his malevolent subtlety because, falling himself, he envied man's constancy, he chose to become a serpent, one of the creatures that then lived harmlessly and in subjection with these two human beings, the male and the female, in the corporeal paradise, a creature slippery and pliable, wreathed in knots, well fitted for 
his work, through whom he would speak. You see how he asserts that there were two paradises, the one spiritual in which man lived a happy psychic life, the other corporeal in which he lived a happy corporeal life. But in the book which he wrote on the true religion he seems to say that there was only one paradise, the spiritual, this is the first sin of the rational soul, the desire to do that which the highest and innermost truth forbids. Thus man is driven out of paradise into this world. That is, out of eternity into time, out of plenty into want, out of stability into instability, not however from a substantial good into a substantial evil, for no substance is an evil, but from an eternal good into a temporal good, from a spiritual good to a fleshly good, from an intelligible good to a sensible good, from the highest good to the lowest good. Notice the expression, from an intelligible good to a sensible good. Does this not clearly imply that paradise is intelligible and not sensible? For if he had intended to say that it was sensible he would have said, from a sensible good, namely the corporeal paradise, to an inferior sensible good, unless we are to believe that this passage refers only to the spiritual paradise from which the sinning soul was expelled, and that he has refrained from mentioning the expulsion of its body from the corporeal paradise. For he does not say, this is the first sin of man. But, this is the first sin of the rational soul. But I would rather suppose that by the name of the better part of man he is referring to the whole. For it is not to be believed that if there ever were, or still are, two paradises man would have suffered for his transgression by being expelled from the spiritual, but not from the corporeal, unless we are to believe that in this place he has only expounded the expulsion of man from the spiritual paradise, and that he has refrained from mentioning his expulsion from the sensible. Saint Ambrose also in the introduction to his book on paradise seems to postulate in the same way two paradises particularly in the following passage, in this paradise, therefore, God placed the man whom he created. Moreover, you are to understand that it was not that man who is according to the image of God that he placed in paradise, but man who is according to the body. For that which is incorporeal cannot be in a place. But a little later when he comes to give his explanation of paradise he most clearly shows that not only is paradise to be understood in a spiritual sense, but that it is nothing else than the man himself. Here I think he is wholly indebted to Origen, although he does not specifically refer to him, for he says, there was one before our time who has remarked that man's transgression was committed through pleasure and through sense, for he took the form of a serpent to represent pleasure, and the form of the woman to represent sense, and saw a representation of man in the mind and the intellect. Now the Greeks call sense and the mind, which he asserted to have been brought into transgression by the deception of the sense, they call. It is appropriate then that in Greek has a masculine form and a feminine. Hence some call Adam the earthly. And somewhat later he writes, paradise is therefore a fertile ground, that is, a fecund soul, planted in Eden. That is, in pleasure, or it is the ploughed land in which the delight of the mind doth grow. Moreover Adam is, as it were, an eve or sense. And see what supports the soul possesses to use against the weakness of nature or the exposure of creation to dangers. There was a fount to irrigate paradise. What is this fount? Our Lord Jesus Christ, the fount of eternal life, and his Father too. For it is written, seeing that you have in you the fount of life, and again, from her belly shall flow the living waters. It is called the fount, and it is called the river, and it irrigates the fruitful tree of paradise that it may bear the fruit of life eternal. This fount, then, as you have read, is in paradise. For it is written that the fount proceeds out of Eden. That is to say, the fount is in your soul. Hence Solomon also says, drink the water from your vessels and from the founts of your wells. This is the fount which proceeds from that well-tilled and pleasureful soul, and this fount, which irrigates paradise, is the power of the soul which bursts forth from the highest fount. And this fount, it is written, is divided into four springs. The name of the first is Phison, and so on. The same Saint Ambrose goes on to discuss most lucidly the four rivers of paradise, comparing them severally to the several virtues of the soul, Phison, which the Greeks call Ganges, to Prudence, Geon, which is the Nile, to Temperance, Tigris, which is so called because of the swiftness of its current, to Fortitude, Euphrates to Justice. See in what a spiritual way he interprets paradise. Yes, I see it. But perhaps someone might say that he is here rather employing allegory than intending to deny the existence of a material paradise. For if he did not believe in the existence of a corporeal and local paradise, he would not perhaps in the course of the above-mentioned work after the exposition of the spiritual paradise, which is either the soul herself or some spiritual environment of the soul, have gone on to expound the text and God took the man whom he had made, 
and placed him in paradise to till it and watch over it. Note, he says that the man is already existing when he is seized. For he existed in the land of his creation. Then the power of God seized him, breathing into him the processes and increases of virtue. Finally, he placed him in paradise, as though caught up by the breath of the divine service. Notice here that man was created outside paradise and woman inside paradise, and from this learn that it is not by the nobility of place or class, but by virtue that a man acquires grace for himself. For although man was created outside paradise, that is, in a lower place, he is found to be the better of the two, while she who was created in a better place, that is, in paradise, is found to be inferior. For the woman was first deceived, and then herself deceived the man. Is it not clear from these words that he wished to postulate a local paradise? And therefore a corporeal and sensible one? It is not our intention to dispute with those who hold such opinions. For whether there be two paradises, the one corporeal and the other spiritual, we neither deny or affirm. We are merely comparing the opinions of the Holy Fathers, it is not ours to say which should be followed rather than another. Let each abound in his sense, and let him choose which he will follow, avoiding all controversy. But in what sense the master of highest authority and of the acutest and most exalted genius has put forward these suggestions in his commentaries on Holy Scripture it is not clear to us, unless perhaps, as we have very often found in his expositions, he has followed the Greek theologians, and particularly Gregory. For the Greeks maintain that there are two creations of man, one in the image of God, in which there is neither male nor female but only universal and indivisible humanity most like the angelic nature. Of which we are unmistakably taught by authority and right reason that it lacks all sexual distinction, the other and second. Which was added as a result of the foreknowledge of the fall of the rational nature, and in which sex is established. Rightly then is it described as having occurred outside paradise, and in a lower place out of the earth of its creation, seeing that it was added on account of sin. Therefore the male sex which was added to the nature created in the image of God was made outside paradise. But because even that sex is added as though taken from elsewhere to a previously existing nature, namely, the divine image, it is established in paradise together with the first creation, where also. As in a higher place, the second sex, called by the name of woman, and drawn from the side of the first, is added to it as an assistant in the procreation of offspring in the shameful manner of the irrational animals. And since the creation of the male sex is prior to that of the female not in terms of time but in terms of honour, for woman was made from man in the first creation, but not man from woman, he therefore says that the creation of man was outside paradise, and that of woman inside, so that you may understand by this that man was made a better creature than woman even outside paradise, that is, outside the rank of the primordial causes, and that woman was created, as it were, within paradise, that is to say, within the union of the sex which was added to the simplicity of the divine image. Or you may put it this way, since in every man it may be said that there are two men, for the apostle says, the outer man is corrupted but the inner man is renewed. The inner man is properly formed in paradise after the image of God. While the outer and corruptible man is formed from the clay of the earth outside and below paradise, and by the fact that man is seized and placed within paradise is meant that if God had operated his saving power in him, and if man had observed the divine precept, he also could have attained to the rank of the first man who was created in the image of God. But since he refused to obey the divine precept, he abandoned not only his creator, but also the dignity of the image. And therefore he was cloven into two sexes, the male and the female, a cleavage which derived its origin not from nature but from sin. And therefore although the woman was made from the man in paradise, she was not for that reason better than man, for she took the occasion of her creation not from the divine image which was created within paradise, but from the penalty of her future transgression. For she also was causally created in the outer man. Who deservedly because of his sin was created outside paradise from the clay of the earth, and she was subsequently in honour though not in time taken from the side of man in paradise. But whether it was this or something else which our master wished to convey, it is not our intention to quarrel with those who believe that there were two paradises, as I said before, the one spiritual, the other corporeal, answering to the double nature of man, especially as we find that constantly in the scriptural accounts many references to the truth of nature are to be taken both as historical facts and as spiritual signs. Thus Abraham had two sons, one from his handmaid, and one from the free woman, these were historical events. But they also have the allegorical significance of the two laws, that of the Old Testament and that of the New. The rock from which the waters flowed followed the chosen people in the wilderness. 
but the Apostle says, now the rock was Christ. And what of the constitution of these two very beings, the male and the female in paradise, which is under discussion at the moment? Do they not signify, as the Apostle bears witness, Christ and his church? What then would be so strange in the fact that the corporeal paradise was created as a symbol of the spiritual? And we know that Origen, that supreme commentator of scripture, declares that paradise is nowhere and nothing else than that which is established as he says, in the third heaven, into which Saint Paul was wrapped. But if it is in the third heaven, then it is certainly spiritual. For the spiritual nature of the third heaven into which Saint Paul was wrapped is not doubted by the best authors in either tongue, for they all agree in calling it intellectual. But Epiphanius the bishop of Constantia in Cyprus reproves Origen in this, and uncompromisingly maintains that paradise is on earth. It is a certain sensible place in the eastern parts of the earth with sensible trees and rivers. And the other objects which are believed concerning paradise in a simple corporeal sense by those who cleave to the corporeal senses. For the same Epiphanius has, he says, no doubt that those tunics of skin which God stitched together for man after his transgression were, as an historical fact, made from the fleece of the sheep which, as he says, were in paradise, and he reproves Origen who by a very fine and truthful allegory interprets those skins as signifying the mortal bodies which were added to the first human beings as a punishment for their sin. Almost all authors, Greek and Latin, follow Origen in his theory of the tunics of skin. It would not be irrelevant, I think, to insert here the opinion of the great Gregory of Nyssa concerning the food of paradise, and the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the twentieth chapter of his treatise on the image he writes. Rightly is it said that man will not return into the same species of life. For if the species of the former life consisted in eating, in the afterlife we shall be released from this activity. But I, giving ear to holy scripture, recognize not only a corporeal food, and not only a fleshly joy, but also another kind of food, which bears a certain analogy to the nourishment of the body, a food of which the goodness is conveyed only into the soul. Feed of my loaves, says wisdom to the hungry, and those who hunger and thirst after this food are blessed of the Lord, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and if any thirst, he saith, let him come to me and drink. And the great Isaiah says to those who are able to appraise his greatness, drink of happiness. And there is also a kind of prophetic curse against those who are worthy of vengeance, that they shall be tormented with hunger. But this hunger is not a need for food and drink, but a deprivation of the word. For it is not, he says, a hunger for bread or a thirst for water, but a hunger for hearing the word of the Lord. Are not these delights, then, to be found in the Eden of God's planting? For the meaning of Eden is a delights. For that the trees there bore a certain kind of fruit, and that man was by it undoubtedly enabled to eat, and that the fruit of which he partook when he lived in paradise was by no means transitory or mutable may be rightly understood from these words, of the fruit of every tree which is in paradise thou shalt eat. Who shall give to him who hungers healthily for it the fruit of that tree which is in paradise and which comprises every good thing? And whose name is therefore that is, all, and of which the law of nature makes man a participant? For by a universal and overruling reason every from of the good contains naturally in itself the whole, and is one. Who shall keep me away from this food mixed from the other tree? For to the discerning it is by no means difficult to see what is that all, of which the fruit is life, and what is that mixture of which the end is death. For he who offers that enjoyment of that all freely by everyone is the same as he who by his providence and by a certain principle prohibits man from its indiscriminate participation. And I think that this law is explained by the great David and the wise master Solomon, for each of them understands that the permitted food has a single grace, the good itself, which truly is, and which is wholly good. For David says, Rejoice in the Lord, and Solomon calls that food, which is the Lord, the tree of life. Therefore is not that tree whose food is given by the law to him who is formed in the image of God the tree of life and LL tree? Separated from it as a contrary is the other tree whose fruit is the knowledge of good and evil, it is not the case that this tree specifically produces in part each of the contrary things indicated, it produces a confused and mixed kind of fruit, a composite of contrary qualities. And its fruit is forbidden by the Lord of life, but the serpent commends it so as to prepare an entry for death. He persuades us giving us counsel, painting that fruit with the beauty of good and the delight of evil, that it might seem desirable, and that desire might lead us to tasting. Again in the twentieth chapter of the same treatise he writes, Now what is that tree whose fruit is the mingled knowledge of good and evil, a knowledge which is impregnated with the delights of the senses? 
I think it would not be far wrong to say that the Greeks call the tree of knowledge of good and evil, while the tree of life they call. I employ the term tree for the purpose of theoria. I think I should not be wandering far from the truth if by the understanding of the mind, in so far as these things can be understood, I employ the following argument, I think that by knowledge the scripture does not mean skill, and I find that in the scriptures a certain distinction is drawn between knowledge and judgment or discrimination. For as the apostle tells us, skillfully to discriminate the good from the evil is the mark of a perfect disposition, and of properly trained senses. And therefore he lays it down as a precept that all things should be judged and that judgment is the property of the spiritual man. But knowledge does not everywhere mean the skill and expertise of that which is signified, but an affection towards that to which grace is given, as when it is written, God knows those who are his, that is to say, he gives his grace to his own. And to Moses he says, For I knew thee above all. But to those whose wickedness is proved he who knoweth all things saith, T never knew you, that is to say, I never bestowed my grace upon you. Therefore is it not the tree whose fruit is this mixed knowledge that is prohibited? But that fruit which has the serpent for its spokesman, that is, advocate, is a mixture of contraries, to wit, of good and of evil. And it is perhaps for this reason that pure evil, manifested by itself and in itself according to its proper nature, is never offered, that is, is never revealed naked. For no evil would be effective which was not coloured with good, by which it may attract him whom it has seduced, that is to say man, to lust after it. But now it is somehow mixed with good. It harbours destruction in its depths as in a secret ambush, but outwardly displays, for the purpose of seduction, a certain appearance of good. Thus the beauty of material wealth seems to the greedy a good, but avarice is the root of all evil. And who would fall into the filthy swamp of intemperance unless he estimated pleasure as good and something desirable? And by this snare is enticed into passion? And it is the same with the other hidden sins, each distinguished by its own particular pleasure. They seem desirable as a good, through this allurement, to those who do not examine the matter carefully. Since then many take for good that in which the senses delight, and since that which seems to be the good. While it is not, has the same name as the good which is, that is to say, the true good which is goodness itself, for this reason the concupiscence felt towards evil as though towards the good is called by scripture the knowledge of good and of evil, where the term knowledge has the significance of a kind of interaction and concretion of good and evil. It is neither absolutely evil, for it is surrounded by good, nor is it purely good, for evil is concealed within it, but scripture tells us that the fruit of the forbidden tree which, it says, brings those who taste of it to death is a mixture of both. It all but proclaims this teaching, that the good, which by nature truly island is simple and uniform by nature, is free from all duality and mingling with its opposite. But evil is varied and is so formed as to have some good mixed with it but is found on trial to be different. For it is not found to be as it is estimated. But becomes the source of death and the cause and principle of corruption. Therefore the serpent shows the sin of the fruit in such a way as to represent on the face of it that it has no evil. For by an obvious evil man, probably, would not have been seduced, and so he adorned the obvious evil with a specious appearance, and made it enticing by a form which was pleasurable to the sense, and thus revealed it to the woman, persuading her to taste it. For the scripture says, And the woman saw that the tree was good to eat, and that it was fair to look upon, and beautiful to know, and so she accepted the fruit and ate it. And so that food became for man the mother of death. Therefore it is fruitful of mixture, if we rightly interpret the obvious sense in which that tree is named the knowledge of good and of evil, because in the evil of the death-bearing properties which are in its sweetness, in so far as it sweetens the sense it appears good, but in so far as it corrupts what it touches it is the source of the worst evil. Therefore, when it worked in the life of man as a death-bearing evil, at that moment man, so great a thing and so great a name, the image of the divine nature, is made like unto vanity, as the prophet says. Therefore the image is associated with what is understood to be our better nature, but the sad and unhappy things which relate to this life do not belong to the likeness of God. See then of what nature paradise, its trees, and its fruits were thought to be by this theologian. I see very well. They were clearly spiritual and unlocalized. But I should like from you a clear and brief explanation of those things which he expounds rather obscurely. Whoever looks closely into the words of this theologian will find that his teaching is none other than that the word paradise is a mere figure of speech by which Holy Scripture signifies the human nature that was made in the image of God. 
For what God in truth planted is that very nature which he created in Eden, that is to say, in the delights of eternal bliss, in his image and likeness, that is, in an image which in every way resembles himself save only, as I have said before, in his status of subject, a nature which by reason of the blessedness of its likeness to God is greater and more excellent than the whole sensible universe, not in respect of size, but in respect of the dignity of its nature. And the fertile soil of this paradise was the essential body, which possesses a possible immortality in potency. For the natural body is said to die because it appears to share the death of that which is added to it, but in fact it is always immortal in itself. For statements such as, it may die, it may not die, refer to that which it suffers as an adjunct to itself. For the body of the first man, as Saint Augustine says, might not have died, and would not have died if it had not been corrupted by the poison of transgression but would have blossomed with the flowers of spiritual beauty, and would never have grown old with the accumulation of time. And the water of this paradise is the sense of the incorruptible body able to receive forms, and formed by the fantasies of sensible things without being deceived. And the air of this paradise, illuminated by the rays of the divine wisdom, was the reason, by which it might have knowledge of all things. And the ether was the mind which was centered on the divine nature in an eternal and ineffable immutable motion and mutable stability, and on the other things which are to be predicated about the divine nature, but which, since they cannot be understood, must be honored in silence. Therefore scripture testifies that in this paradise flows the fountain of life. From which we are told under an allegory of the four principal rivers of the sensible world that the four streams of the virtues divide, namely, prudence, temperance, fortitude, justice. And these spiritual rivers bursting forth from the divine wisdom, which is the fount of all life and all virtue, water the surface of the human nature, first, arising in the secret recesses of humanity, in the most hidden channels, as it were, of the intelligible earth they issue in invisible virtues. Then they spread out into the manifest effects of good actions and produce innumerable kinds of potencies and acts. For from them every potency and every act proceeds and into them returns, but they themselves proceed from the divine wisdom, and into it return. In the same paradise there are two trees, of which, according to the exposition of our theologian Gregory, the one is called, that is, all, the other, that is, knowable, but if we analyze the interpretation of this word, it does not satisfactorily express the meaning of the tree. Therefore, for the sake of a better understanding of what is signified by that tree we have decided to substitute for the name mixed. But what is this, of whose fruit man was commanded to feed? Is that tree of which the scripture says, and the Lord God produced from the earth the all tree that is fair to look upon and pleasant to taste and also the tree of life in the midst of paradise. Notice how the prophetic meditation describes and names one and the same tree in two ways. First as the all tree which is fair to look upon and pleasant to taste, and then as the tree of life in the midst of paradise. And a little later it is written, from the all tree of paradise thou shalt eat, whereby the all tree is meant a single tree. Now, let no follower of our theologian's doctrine imagine that there was in paradise a large number of trees of different forms and different fruits, as though it were a forest thick with trees, there were but two, the one, and the other. And the that is, the all tree, of paradise is the word and wisdom of the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the fruit-bearing all tree and is planted in the midst of the paradise of human nature in two ways, first through his own divinity, by which he creates our nature and contains it and endows it with nourishment and life and light and Godhead and movement and being. For in him we move and live and have our being, and secondly through taking our nature upon him in the unity of his substance in order that he might save it, and recall it to its former state, so that he came to subsist in two natures, a divine and a human. And this is what the scripture says, and the Lord God produced from the earth, that is, from our material nature, the all tree, that is, the incarnate word, in which and through which all things are made, and which is all things. For it alone is the substantial good. For the other things which are called good are good not through themselves, but through participation in him who in himself truly is the good which is, and all good and goodness, and the fountain origin, the cause and principle, the end and perfection, the movement and rest the middle and the end, the environment and the place, of all goodness and all good, and his fruit is life eternal, and his food is joy and bliss and ineffable delight, and his countenance is fair to look upon. For he is the beautiful and the beauty that lies in all things beautiful, and he is the cause and perfection of beauty, and those who taste and feed on him know no satiety, for the more they feed on him the greater grows their desire for that repast. From this, all tree, then, that is to say, this plentitude of all goods, the first human beings were ordered to take their food and the whole human genus until now is bidden to live by it. But since our first parents refused to take their food therefrom, 
preferring to it the deadly fruit of the forbidden tree, not only they but the whole genus which sprang from them were by the most righteous decree of God expelled from the dignity of their nature and condemned to death. Do you now see what the Holy Prophet, or rather, the Holy Spirit through the Prophet, wished to signify by the phrase all tree? I see clearly. Nothing else? I think. But God the Word made man is the all good of the whole of paradise. That is to say, of the whole of our nature. And nothing else subsists than him to partake of whom, that is, to regard him with a devout mind. Or believe in him faithfully, is eternal life and incorruptible health, but not to know him or to deny him is eternal death and infinite corruption. You understand correctly. It now remains to speak of the, that is, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It has already been suggested that to make things easier the word be translated not literally, but in such a way as to give a true interpretation of its meaning, mixed. And in fact according to the above-mentioned master whose teaching about paradise we follow, and reproduce in order to dissipate the obscurity of the problem, there is that evil disguised under the color of good which is instilled into the senses of the body and is the direct opposite of the former tree, the. For just as in this all good is reflected and all good exists, so in that is the totality of all evil. The one, therefore, is all good which truly subsists, the other every evil which seduces all evil men by its appearance of good. Now it is not irrelevant to inquire why the account relates that both trees were in the midst of paradise, the all tree, which is also called the tree of life, and the other tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. And the answer, I think, is something like this, if it be first supposed that the whole of human nature was implied, that is to say, the visible and the invisible, the exterior and the interior, that which was created in the image of God and that which was added to it on account of sin, then anyone who has read the text of the blessed Gregory's treatise on the image will find that there is in the whole of human nature, both generally in all and specifically in individuals, a sixfold. Division. First, there is the division into the two principal parts of the body and the soul, then body, that is, the exterior man, is logically divided into three subdivisions, of which the first is the body itself constituted out of formed matter, of which only being may be predicated, than which the understanding finds nothing lower in nature. The second part, which lies above it, may be called, and is customarily called, by many names. Thus it is named the nutritive and octave part because it provides the body with nourishment and causes it to grow and holds it together that it may not fall apart and dissolve. It is also called vital motion, a name which is appropriate because not only does it give life to the body, but also motion, either locally through space or through numbers of place and time, by numbers of place I here mean those in which the fullness of the body's parts is achieved, and by numbers of time those in which increases of ages are brought to perfection. The third subdivision, which is manifested in the fivefold bodily sense, receives the fantasies of all sensible objects which surround man externally and conveys them to the memory. In these three parts, the whole of the exterior man is constituted. But the inner man, who subsists in the soul alone and is made in the image of God, has also a threefold division. For it possesses the interior sense, through which the soul distinguishes and forms judgments upon the fantasies of the sensible objects which she receives through the corporeal sense. Next she possesses reason, through which she investigates the reasons of all things which are apprehended by the intelligence or the sense. But the highest part of man is the mind, above which there is found nothing higher in human nature, and whose proper function is the government of the parts which are inferior to it and the contemplation of what lies above it, namely, God, and of what lies in it and subsists about it, according as it is allowed to ascend. Is the sixfold division of human nature clear to you? Human nature is, and lives and perceives through the body, it perceives outside of the body, and reasons, and intellects. But the three properties which are discerned in the lower part of man are corruptible and susceptible to dissolution, while the triad of the upper part, which is wholly and absolutely constituted in the soul alone, is incorruptible and indissoluble and eternal as befits that which has impressed upon it the image of the divine nature. And therefore, as we have shown in the previous books, the Greeks give to this triad in human nature, which Saint Dionysius tells us can neither be dissolved nor corrupted nor in any way destroyed, the names, and Therefore the limits of human nature are to be considered as the upper and the lower boundaries of paradise. Beyond which no created nature may be supposed to exist for above mind there is only God and below matter, that is, only body, there is nothing, not that nothing which is called so and thought to be so because of the transcendence of its nature, but that which is conceived and called so because of its lack of all nature. 
You will also find, if I am not mistaken, that mind holds the highest place in human nature, and the material body the lowest. And if you now turn to the intermediate parts of the same nature you will find below mind, on the upper side, reason, and above body, on the lower side, vital motion, by which I mean the nutritive life principle, and again in the midst of this nature, as in the midst of paradise, two senses, the exterior which adheres to the vital motion and the body, and the inner sense which is inseparably joined to reason and mind, and is consubstantial with them. Therefore, these two senses, occupying as it were the two middle positions of the paradise of human nature, represent those two intelligible trees, and, the interior and the exterior. For in the interior of man abide truth and every good, which is the word of God, the only begotten Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ outside of whom there is no good. Since he is all good and substantial good and goodness. And to him is opposed on the other side the evil thing and evil. And since there is no evil which is found to exist substantially in nature, nor proceeds from a fixed and natural cause, for considered in itself it is absolutely nothing but the irrational and perverse and imperfect motion of the rational nature, it can find no other abode in the universal creature save where Fossard resides, and the proper residence of Fossard is in the corporeal sense. For no part of human nature is the recipient of error except the exterior sense, and that is the means through which the interior sense, the reason, and even mind are very often led astray. Therefore it is in this place of fossid and vain fantasies, namely in the corporeal sense which the Greeks call and symbolize by the woman, that, that is, the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, is established. Which is evil painted to resemble good? or evil in the form of good, or, to speak plainly, a false good, or evil hiding under the guise of good, whose fruit is a confused or mixed knowledge. For there is in it a confusion of hidden evil and apparent good which at first seduces the sense in which it lies as a woman is seduced, unable to discern the hidden evil under the appearance of good by which it is disguised. For in itself evil is a deformity and an abhorrent ugliness which, if the erring sense beheld undisguised, it would not only refuse to follow or take delight in, but would flee from and abhor. But the unwitting sense errs, and in erring is deceived, because it takes the evil for something which is good and fair to look upon and pleasant to taste. To take an example, when the fantasy of good, for instance, or of any other sensible material, is impressed upon the corporeal sense, the fantasy itself seems fair and lovely, because it is taken from a creature which is outwardly good. But the woman, that is the carnal sense, is deceived and delights in it without perceiving the evil which lies hidden in the false and fantastic beauty, that is to say, voluptuousness which is the root of all evil. Whoso looketh upon a woman to lust after her, saith the Lord, hath already committed adultery with her in his heart, meaning by that, whoso implants in his carnal desire the fantasy which is taken from the female form has already committed adultery in his thought, for he is seeking the ugliness of lust which is enticing him secretly under that false appearance of the female form. So then, as we have said above, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is pernicious and deadly wickedness masquerading under the form of good, and this tree is planted, as it were, in a woman, that is, in the carnal sense, which it deceives. And if the mind consents to the sense, then the integrity of the whole of human nature is destroyed. For if the highest part of that nature transgresses, what lower part will remain unharmed? And the fruit of this tree is the mingled knowledge of good and of evil, that is, the undiscriminating appetite of evil imagined as good, and love and lust and pleasure, through which in the form of a serpent the ancient enemy of the human genus first urged transgression and then brought death upon the whole of nature, upon the soul which abandoned God, and upon the body which was deserted by the soul. Knowledge, therefore, in this place signifies not some science of the recognizing and distinguishing of natures, but an illicit motion and confused hankering after a coveted evil. That is, sin, which for the purpose of deception is disguised in the false appearance of a likeness to the good. But perhaps you wish to inquire whether it was God who implanted in the paradise of human nature such a tree, whose fruit is the mixed and confused appetite for good and evil, whose nature is evil disguised under the fantasy of good, whose food was the cause of death. Certainly I wish to ask that. And I think it is proper that I should. For if God did create it, he might well be considered the creator of evil and the cause of death, which would be a most impious thing to say of him who was the author of all good things, and all the more impious to believe or think it. But if it was not planted by God, whence was the seed of it sown in human nature? We must first consult Holy Scripture which unhesitatingly ascribes a divine planting to that tree which is called. For it says, And the Lord God produced out of the earth the all tree that is fair to look upon and pleasant to feed upon. 
and then, as though in explanation of the quality of that tree which is, all tree, also the tree of life in the midst of paradise. By this is meant that that tree is not only every good and every beautiful thing and every pleasant and spiritual food, but also the tree of life, by which that paradise, that is, human nature, is alive, for it is planted in the midst of it. But it is not sufficiently clear whether that which follows. And the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil is governed by the preceding words, so that we should read, and he brought forth the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil in the middle of paradise as he did the tree of life, or whether the phrase is to be taken independently, and there was the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, so that we should not take it to have been brought forth by God, but only opposed by its contrary quality to the first tree, so that as that was all good and life and the cause of life in those who live, so this was all evil and death and the cause of death in those who die. Or perhaps, since it is the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, we should understand that in respect of its form of good it is from God, for he is the cause of every form and all beauty. Whether that form and that beauty are perceived by the mind or the sense in some substance or whether they lie in the fantasies of sensible matter which are received by the senses and of which the bodily sense is the proper abode, since it is from the bodily sense that they are carried to the interior sense, but in respect of the evil itself which is clothed in the form of the good, but which in itself has no form and is unknown, it is neither from God nor from any sure or definite cause. For evil is inconstant and without cause, for as a substance it does not occur anywhere in nature. Therefore that tree in respect of its evil is not to be referred to any cause, because it is entirely devoid of being, but the form of good by which the unwary are deceived because it is taken from matter, by the fantasy of which it is formed, which is both made and made good by the creator of all things, consequently can be by no means evil. Therefore the form by which evil seduces those whom it destroys is good, since it is the fantasy of a good, but the evil itself is absolutely evil and is not created by any good for it is the contrary of every good. And if you examine closely the nature of the fantasies by which evil is painted. For in her naked self she cannot appear, being without form or beauty or cause, you will see for yourself that it is altogether good. And this can be most clearly shown by the following argument, let us suppose two men, of whom the one is wise and by no means tickled or stung by the goads of avarice, while the other is foolish and greedy, pierced and torn by the needles of his perverse desire, are brought into one place and a vessel offered them made of pure gold and set with most precious jewels, endowed with the loveliest form, fit for the use of a king. Both, the wise man and the greedy one, see it, both receive through the corporeal sense the fantasy of the vessel itself, both store the fantasy in the memory, both bring thought to bear upon it. But the wise man by a simple mental process entirely refers its beauty, the fantasy of which he ponders within himself, to the glory of the creator of natures, no enticement of cupidity steals upon him. No poison of voluptuousness infects the purpose of his pure mind. No lust contaminates it. With the greedy one on the other hand it is altogether different. Directly he has absorbed the fantasy of the vessel he blazes with the fire of cupidity, he is consumed, he is poisoned, he dies, for instead of referring the beauty of that nature and of its fantasies to the glory of him who said gold is mine and silver is mine, he plunges and is swallowed up in that most stinking swamp of cupidity. Notice that for both the fantasy of the same vessel was good and beautiful. But whereas in the sense of the wise man it is simple and natural and free from all evil, in the greedy one it is a double fantasy, mixed with the contrary evil of cupidity, which is mixed with it and given form by it and coloured by it so as to seem good whereas it is a most poisonous evil. Evil, then, is not implanted in man's nature, but established in the perverse and irrational motion of the free and rational will. And it appears that this motion comes not from within human nature but is induced from outside. By a bestial intemperance and by the subtle devising of the ancient enemy it is tinged, and mingled with good so as to deceive the lustful affections of the carnal senses, and thus to destroy them by death. Now in saying this I do not wish to refute the interpretation of those who maintain that this tree of the knowledge of good, and of evil is of its nature wholly a good, and that its creation in a local paradise was an historical event, and that its fruit is the knowledge, that is to say, the experience, of good and evil. For if the first human beings had abstained from touch and taste of it, as they were bid, their experience would have been of the eternal life, of everlasting bliss without the interruption of death. But should they consent to the wiles of the devil and illicitly in their most wretched concupiscence partake of the deadly food of its fruit, they would encounter the experience of eternal death and unhappiness. But whoever has thought it worth while to read with close attention the discussion that we have been conducting is in a position to choose from the above-mentioned opinions of the Holy Fathers which we have set on. 
record the one which it seems best to him to follow, and to see that he cannot bring it against us that what we have said is not corroborated by any authority or is presumptuously invented as a counterblast to the traditions handed down by the fathers of the church. Here you have, then, what I think is as clear and brief a modest explanation of paradise as my capacity can supply. Yes. But I should like you to make an or recapitulation which may embrace in the form of a conclusion and recapitulation make precise all the scattered remarks which you have made about paradise. We have said that the plantation of God, namely, paradise, in Eden, that is to say, in the joy of the eternal and blessed happiness, is human nature made in the image of God. That the fount that is therein is Christ, concerning whom the prophet, addressing the Father, says, For in thee is the fount of fife who also invites all those who thirst after righteousness, saying, If any man thirst let him come unto me and drink. That its rivers which flow from the fount of wisdom are the four cardinal virtues of the soul, and that from them every virtue and every good act is disseminated. That its all tree, of which it is written, to him that overcometh I will give to eat of the tree of fife, which is in paradise, planted by streams of water, by which is meant that all the oracles of the prophets, all the symbols of either tav, the interpretations of those symbols, and all the exoteric and simple doctrines that flow about it, is the word of God found in human nature and incarnate in human nature. That the tree of mixed knowledge in this paradise is the undiscriminating or confused hankering of the carnal senses to satisfy the various lusts which are concealed under the appearance of good and which deceive and destroy unwary souls. That the man in this paradise is mind, which presides over the whole of human nature. That the woman therein is the sense, to which if mind incautiously consent, it is lost. That the serpent therein is the forbidden pleasure by which those things which charm the senses are illicitly and damnably desired. And do not think that my theory that there were only two trees in paradise, and, is disproved by the reply which the woman is reported to have given to the devil, we feed on the fruit of the trees which are in paradise, for she did not say, we feed, that is are bidden to feed on the fruit of the all tree, but of trees, in the plural, as though those were many trees of various kinds upon which they were permitted to feed. But it is possible to believe that what the woman called the all tree was in fact a great number of trees. For the word all is not used in a singular significance but has reference to that which has a plural content. For all, every, man is the manifold number of human nature, and again this manifold number, since it partakes of a single nature, is wont to be described as one man. What would be surprising, then, if the term all tree meant a large number of trees? For God the word, who is all tree, that is, all good, and is one, is at the same time many, and is the source of all good, that is to say of every virtue and wisdom and essence which bears fruit in human nature. Therefore all the rational motions of rational nature which man is permitted and commanded to perform, since they are the derivatives of the common good of all, that is, the divine wisdom, in human nature, that is, the plantation and paradise of God, are described as a great number of fruit-bearing trees, but these trees all subsist, as it were, in that one in which all goods are one. Therefore the woman said well when, not yet deceived and still conscious of the virtues implanted in her nature, she called the single tree many trees, for in it are all good things. I do not wish it to be thought that I am only following the doctrines of the Greek writers about paradise, and am either ignoring the Latin writers or am incapable of finding among them support for this interpretation, for I should then seem to have spoken rashly. Proposing a doctrine that would not be supported by the masters of both tongues. Therefore it is necessary as well as relevant to insert into our discussion the opinions of St. Ambrose about paradise, if you agree. Certainly, I agree. For who but a madman would dare to reject the opinions of so great and wise a man? St. Ambrose, then, writes in his book on paradise as follows, There are some who think that that precept, to eat of the tree of life and not to eat of the forbidden tree, is neither appropriate to the creator of heaven and earth and all things nor suitably addressed to the inhabitants of paradise, for the life that they led there was similar to that of the angels. Therefore they cannot accept the view that this food was earthly and corruptible and for eating, for the inhabitants of paradise neither eat nor drink but shall be as the angels of God in heaven. Since, therefore, there is in food neither a great prize, for it is not by what we eat that we are commended to God, nor a great danger, for not that which enters into the mouth defiles a man, but that which proceeds forth from the mouth. There seems to be no question but that the precept was unworthy of such an author unless you identify this nourishment with that perfect food which the Lord promises to his saints as their great reward. Behold, those who serve me shall feed, but you shall go hungry. For this is the food which contains eternal life, which if any man lose he shall die the death, for the living and heavenly bread is the Lord himself who gives life to this world. 
therefore he himself says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you shall not have eternal life. There was, then, a certain bread which God commanded the inhabitants of paradise to eat. What was that bread? Hear what it is, man ate the bread of angels. Good bread is also doing the will of God. Do you wish to know how good that bread is? The Son himself feeds on it, for he says, My food is to do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Observe what kind of food the great Master teaches that it was which the Lord commanded the inhabitants of paradise to eat, not a corporeal or corruptible food, but spiritual, none other than the word of God and his will. I observe. And I greatly marvel how well he agrees with the interpretation of Gregory the theologian. Who also, as we saw, unhesitatingly asserts that the food and fruit and drink of paradise are spiritual and intelligible. Furthermore, if the food of paradise is spiritual and intelligible, it necessarily follows that that all tree, whose fruit that food is, must also be regarded as intelligible and spiritual. For it is incredible and is contrary to reason for an incorporeal and intelligible fruit to grow from a corporeal and sensible tree. Again, if both the fruit and the trees are spiritual, does not this compel us to believe and maintain that the place in which they subsist is not corporeal either but spiritual? What you say is to the point, is reasonable, and very like the truth. But in order that we may have the unshakable support of this Father Ambrose, let us look more closely into what he has written in this book about paradise and almost everything which the divine history declares that it contains. Many careful students are puzzled as to how, if at first it was God's gift to men that they should be set in paradise, or at the end it was as a reward for their great merits that every just man is snatched up into paradise. Animals also, both the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, are said to have been in paradise. Hence for the most part they believe that paradise is the soul of man, in which the seeds of the virtues, as it were, germinate, but that man, that is, the mind of man, is placed there to till and to guard paradise. For it is by the virtue of the mind that the soul seems to be tended, and not only tended, but thereafter protected. But the beasts of the field and the birds of the air which are brought to Adam are our irrational emotions. Because the beasts and cattle are the various passions of the body, either the more violent or the more sluggish ones and as to the birds of the air. What else should they be but the empty thoughts which hover bird-like about our souls, and often lead it in varied motion to one thing or another? Therefore there was found no other similar helpmeet for our minds but the sense or, only that could our mind find like to itself. But perhaps you will argue that these things also, the passions of the body and the vanity of the empty vacillating thoughts, were placed in this paradise by God, and that therefore he himself was the author of our transgressions. Consider what he says, you have power over the fishes of the sea and over the birds of the air and over all creeping things which creep upon the face of the earth. You see that he has given you power to make judgments upon them and by the sober definitions of your judgment discern the genus of each. God called all things to you that you might learn that your mind should be supreme over them all. Why have you desired to cleave to those things which are not of your kind? And to join yourself to them? He gave you a sure sense by which you might know all things and judge your thoughts. With justice you were driven forth from that fertile field of paradise, for you could not keep his commandment. For God knew that you were a fragile thing, he knew you were incapable of judgment, and it was for that that he said to you, as to rather fragile creatures, judge not, that ye be not judged. Therefore because he knew you to be uncertain in your judgments, he desired that you should be obedient to his mandate, and so laid a command upon you, and if you had not transgressed it you could not have incurred the dangers of your unsure judgment. But since you will to judge and so dared, he therefore added, Behold Adam has become one of us, so as to know good and evil. You will to arrogate judgment to yourself, you should not then refuse the punishment for perverse judgment. But he has placed you over against paradise so that you may not lose the memory of it. Finally the righteous are often snatched into paradise as Paul was, and heard their ineffable things spoken. And you, if through the vigour of your mind you be wrapped from the first heaven to the second and from the second to the third, seeing that in the first each man is a body, in the second a living body, and in the third a spirit, you will be so wrapped to the third heaven that you may see the splendour of the spiritual grace, for the animal man does not know the things of the Spirit of God. And therefore the ascension to the third heaven is necessary for you in order that you may be wrapped into paradise and you may now be taken there to judge all things without peril, for the Spirit judgeth all things and is judged of none. See how Ambrose confirms the interpretation of Origen but weakens that of Epiphanius.
For Origen maintains that paradise is in the third heaven, which is the intellectual heaven, that is, in man himself as mind. But Epiphanius, as we have shown above, giving an oversimple interpretation, considers paradise to be some earthly place, and the trees to be earthly and the fountain sensible, but this is not acceptable to right reason. For it is not to be believed that the paradise into which the apostle was wrapped was other than that in which the first man was made in the image of God and from which he was thrust out in punishment for his sin. For the divine history mentions but one paradise and but one man created in it, though the one man includes both male and female, if the words of the Holy Fathers are to be followed. For the male is the intelligible principle of human nature which the Greeks call, the female is sense which they call by a word in the feminine gender, by whose mystical marriage the future union of Christ and his church is prefigured. And this man and woman, that is, mind and sense, were not only permitted but enjoined by the divine law to eat of the tree of life, that is to say, of the wisdom and word of God, which is the Lord Christ. For he is planted in the midst of the paradise of human nature. And is the spiritual bread which is the food of angels and of perfect men whose conversation is in heaven. They are forbidden, however, to hanker after the undiscriminating and confused knowledge of good and evil which is implanted in imperfect souls by delight in the beauty of material objects. To abstain from this is to merit eternal life, wrongly to use it is to incur eternal death. But as to the other things which scripture has to say about paradise, although they are introduced by anticipation and as having taken place in paradise, they are more and more reasonably understood to have occurred outside after the fall, seeing that they were added to human nature as a penalty for its transgression and concern the outward man. For instance, therefore the Lord God formed man of the clay of the earth, and breathed in his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. How is that which is created in the image of God formed out of the clay of the earth? And how could the same thing be said of him, man became a living soul, as was said of the other beasts, which had been brought forth from the earth? Let the earth bring forth living soul? Have we not here good reason to believe that there were two creations of man? For first it is written, and God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him. This is the first creation, in which there is no mention of the clay of the earth nor of the living soul. But then follows a second creation which began with the division of his nature into two sexes as a punishment for transgression, male and female, he says, created he them. First, by the use of the singular, the unity of human nature before the fall is indicated, in the image of God created he him, but then the plural is used with reference to the division of that nature after the fall, male and female created he them. From this division followed the assimilation to the irrational animals, man, he says, was made a living soul. He does not say, a life-giving spirit. The first man, says the apostle, is of the earth earthy, the second man, in whom the whole of human nature is restored, is of heaven heavenly. And first, that is to say, in the first man, the transgressor, there was not that which was spiritual but that which was animal, then, that is, in the second man, the restoring, that which is spiritual. Moreover this is made perfectly plain by the text of the divine history. For after the second creation of the earthy man from the clay of the earth as a living soul in the likeness of the rest of the animals has been introduced, to avoid confusion with the first creation in the image of God there is a particular reference to the latter, now the Lord God had planted a paradise of pleasure from the beginning, that is, from the first creation. Clearly this means, do not relate to the first creation the text, and man became a living soul, but to the second. Take the first to be the plantation of paradise. For God planted a paradise of pleasure. That is to say, God planted human nature in Eden, in the joy of eternal bliss. And where had he planted it? In the beginning, that is to say, in the word, in which God made heaven and earth. Notice the precise meaning of the verbs. In speaking of the second creation the prophet used the verb in the past tense, man became a living soul but in the first the verb is in the pluperfect, the Lord God had planted a paradise, so that you may know that the first is prior to the second, not of course in time, but in dignity and blessedness. And in the first man had been a creature of so spiritual a nature that he did not require the use of any corporeal sense, but could depend wholly on the function of his intelligence. To this too Saint Ambrose bears witness, and their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. And before that they were naked, he says, but they were not without the covering of the virtues. They were naked because of the simplicity of their habits and because their nature was innocent of the cloak of deceit. But now the human mind is veiled in many concealments of pretense. 
So after integrated and incorrupt natures are robbed of their sincerity and simplicity, they begin to seek after earthly and artificial things with which to cover the nakedness of their minds with delights and conceal their hidden genital organ. For how did Adam use his body, who saw all living things and endowed each with a name? How did they know? By an inner and a higher knowledge they knew that they lacked not tunics but the coverings of the virtues. So in the same way in which he saw all the animals, he recognized his own nakedness, that is to say, with the sole eye of the interior knowledge and the simple eye of the mind, without the aid of the perishable and corporeal sense. By this we are given to understand that the first man before he was despoiled of the garment of the virtues was able to contemplate all the animals and birds which, we are told, were created from earth and water and were distributed about the spaces of the earth in their own places and natural lairs, by contemplation not of a localized kind nor by the corporeal sense, but by the observation of the mind alone, which excels every corruptible sense, and all place and all time, of the principles according to which they were created. There is also a reference to the first man's nakedness in Gregory the Theologian's treatise on Easter. Such a condition became man in the beginning, to be naked by reason of his simplicity and his artless life and his freedom from every veil and barrier. Maximus explains these words in the 41st chapter of the Ambiga, naked perhaps, as the Master says, by reason of the manifold contemplation and knowledge of natural objects, and a life that was artless in regard to act and power, subsisting apart from varied artificiality, having for its raiment the immaculate principles of the virtues. And without any veil or barrier, because it is not in need of that knowledge which resides in the sensible perceptions and visible objects to introduce the understanding to divine matters, since it possesses access to the simple vision of the uniform and continuing power and knowledge of the things which are next after God, an operation which requires only to be put into action to manifest itself spontaneously. Therefore they who desire to rise again through philosophical reasoning from the fall of our first father. Let them begin by the total removal of sensual passions, then flying above preoccupations with the reasons of the arts and finally natural contemplation, let them look upon the eternal and immaterial knowledge that is absolutely without forms impressed from sense, or intellection deriving from the lead of reason. Then just as God made the first man in the beginning, they will be naked in the simplicity of knowledge, unbounded life, and the death of the law of the flesh. And the trance which the Lord God sent upon Adam must be interpreted in the same way. For that sleep appears to be both the cause of sin and also sent upon, or rather, permitted after, sin. For scripture often employs a figure of speech which describes what God permits to be done as though he himself does it. So that trance was the deflection of the intention of the mind, which ought always and inflexibly to have been fixed upon its creator, to the delights of material objects. And it was the lust for carnal copulation. As the blessed Ambrose explains, what is that trance, he asks, other than the turning of our mind for a while to sexual intercourse when we seem to incline the eyes that were intent on God's kingdom and bend them to some sleep of this world, and to fall asleep for a while to divine matters, taking our rest in profane and worldly things? After this trance. That is, this turning away of the mind from eternal to temporal things, from God to the creature, there follows a sleep. After God, he says, sent the trance upon Adam, Adam slept, that is to say, he separated himself entirely from the vigor of eternal and blessed contemplation and, emptied of every virtue, fell into the delight of sensible things, abandoning completely the spiritual senses. And here it is to be noted that after Adam fell asleep scripture introduces the creation of woman, by which it is implied that if human nature had not by the irrational motion of the free will deserted the simple and pure integrity of its constitution in which it was made in the image of God, but had always and unchangeably remained in the contemplation of the truth, it would on no account have suffered division into two sexes in which it becomes like the irrational animals, but would propagate in the same way as the number of the angels is multiplied without the aid of sex. But since of his own accord he fell asleep. That is, human nature willingly fell from its dignity, it acquired the division of that nature and a generative process similar to that of the beasts of the field. And when he had fallen asleep, he says, he took one of his ribs and replaced it with flesh, and the Lord God fashioned the rib which he had taken from Adam into woman. Now although under the figure of this one rib which God took from Adam seemed to be signified both the division of his nature into two sexes, and the taking away from him of the guardianship of the universal inner virtue which was within him before he had sinned, and by the flesh which was put in the place from which the rib was taken seems to be meant that most unhappy alteration, whereby the guardianship of virtue and blessedness was exchanged for the deadly folly of vice and wretchedness. Yet I think we are rather to understand here a prophetic prefiguration of the mystery of Christ and the Church. For as the Apostle teaches, the first man, Adam, 
is always a figure of the man to come, Christ, but an inverse figure. For in the first man nature was split into male and female, in the second man it is brought together, for in Christ Jesus there is neither male nor female. In the first man all nature was expelled from the blessedness of paradise, in the second man it is recalled and re-established into that same blessedness. In the first man flesh is put in the place of rib, that is to say, weakness in the place of power, in the second man weakness and death are swallowed up while power and eternal life are bestowed upon human nature, for as in Adam all men die, so in Christ are all men made alive. Therefore, as Saint Augustine says, Adam sleeps and Eve is made, Christ dies and the church is made. While Adam sleeps Eve is made from his side, when Christ is dead his side is pierced that the sacraments may flow forth upon which the church is built. For the blood stands for the consecration of the cup, the water for the consecration of baptism. In the first man human nature puts on tunics of skin, that is to say, mortal bodies, renouncing the nakedness, that is, the purity and simplicity, of its proper nature, in the second man she has the tunics of skin taken from her, and all the folly of mortal bodies is removed, and the nakedness, or simplicity, of her former state is resumed. So, as I have said before, although we read the events described by Scripture as taking place after the trance had been sent upon Adam as apparently occurring in Paradise, it is more reasonable and accords better with the truth to believe and understand that they were added to human nature as a punishment for disobedience after the transgression and therefore outside Paradise. For if the Paradise of God which he planted in delights is the human nature which was created in the image of God and was not disfigured by spot of sin. I do not see how we can understand that anything which is held to be outside the dignity of that nature and the cause of its fall was not also outside paradise. But I am not unaware that Holy Scripture very frequently makes use of that figure of speech which is called by the Greeks and by the Latins preposterum or anticipation, the equivalent of the Greek, Matthew the Evangelist uses it when he describes the passion and resurrection of the Lord. For he writes of the events which took place at the moment of the resurrection as though they occurred at the time of the Passion, now Jesus crying again in a loud voice yielded up his spirit, and behold the veil of the temple was rent in two parts from the top to the bottom, and the earth was moved, and stones were split, and tombs were opened up, and many bodies of the saints which had been asleep arose and coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection came into the holy city, and were seen by many. All these things occurred in a series of events after the resurrection of the Lord. But the evangelist wished to adopt this figure of speech and so described them as taking place just after the Passion. For it is not to be believed that the tombs of others were opened before he opened his own tomb, or that witnesses to the truth of the resurrection were already resurrected before he of whose resurrection they are witnesses should himself have arisen. So the drowsiness of Adam, and the sleep that followed it, and the removal of the rib, and the division of the one nature into two sexes, and the mystical recognition of his wife, and all the other events which prefigure Christ and the Church, as well as their recognition of their nakedness, that is, of the purity of their nature, which did not at first cause them to blush because they were clothed in the raiment of the virtues which is unspotted by the delights of the irrational emotions, which in sinning they lost, and in losing became conscious of, and the deceptive and crafty persuasion of the serpent, and the conversation between the woman and the serpent, and her seduction by him. And the illicit plucking of the fruit of the forbidden tree. And the fatal tasting of it, the willing consent and fall of the man, not because he did not know that it was a sin, but because he thought it but a light one to consent unto his only wife, for it was not Adam but the woman who was seduced, for he did not sin unwittingly, and therefore was worthy of a severer punishment the opening of their eyes wherein they saw their nakedness, the sewing of girdles from fig leaves, the hearing of the voice of the Lord walking in paradise, the flight of them both, Adam and his wife, from the face of the Lord God and their hiding of themselves in the tree, and all the other events up to the expulsion of man from paradise, all these things holy scripture records by anticipation and out of their proper sequence as having taken place in paradise, whereas they are the consequences of sin. For if paradise is human nature as it is made in the image of God and established on an equality with the blessed state of the angels, then as soon as it willed to turn away from its creator, in that very moment it fell from the dignity of its nature. For even before he consented unto his wife he began to wax proud. For if the divine history records no temporal interval between his creation and his fall, how else can this omission in scripture be interpreted than that soon after man was created he waxed proud and was therefore ruined? But the weightiest proof of this is in the devil's guilt of manslaughter. For he was a manslayer from the beginning, and did not abide in the truth. 
he too without any intervening delay fell by pride as soon as he was created and by his not surprising envy of the man who was created together with himself and by his destruction of him with the poison of his guile. But you have heard enough of paradise, I think. It would perhaps be enough if only you would give your opinion about that fig tree from the leaves of which they sowed their girdles. And of the Lord God's walking in paradise. For the tunics of skin have been dealt with already. That fig tree is not inappropriately regarded as the divine precept of the law given to the first human beings in paradise. Now that precept was as follows, of every tree of paradise thou shalt eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil thou shalt not eat. And that they might keep the precept the more carefully the peril involved in transgression was not hidden from them, for on the day on which thou eatest of it thou shalt die the death. There was then a law given to the first human beings in paradise, and that they kept the words of it in their memories is clear from the reply which the woman gave to the serpent, of the fruit of the trees that are in paradise we may feed, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of paradise God commanded us not to eat nor to touch it, lest we die. But the serpent put a wrong interpretation on the words of the law so that first he might seduce the woman, that is, the sense. And then through her gain access to the man. Or mind. He belittled the true and saving power of the divine precept, which if that woman had known and loved and revered, she would not perhaps have been seduced by the serpent, nor have enticed her husband to his downfall, nor would they have sewn together for themselves girdles, that is to say, practices according with the desires of the flesh and its pernicious obscenities, of fig leaves, that is, of the words only of the precept, but would have taken and eaten of the fruit of the fig tree. That is of the true and life-giving power and understanding of the divine law and would have lived in bliss for all eternity. Thus when the divine law is perversely interpreted and is only observed according to the letter and is corrupted by the superstitions of man or devil, it becomes favourable to the lusts of the flesh and wears girdles sewn together from irrational emotions, as though from empty leaves, being devoid of every virtue and true intelligible principle. But when it is well and spiritually understood, and is purged of every carnal sense and superstition, it brings forth saving and life-giving food for those who eat of it, that is, who understand it rightly according to the Spirit. Of this fruit the first human beings were unwilling to eat, and were therefore all the more ready to believe the interpretation of the false-tongued serpent. They did not accept the fruit of the fig of the law for the nourishment of their spirit, but only leaves, empty of nourishment and full of deceit, that is to say. They accepted only the verbal sense. Words woven together by the subtlety of the devil, by which they could cover up the obscenity of their lusts. And here we are in agreement with Saint Ambrose, who in his book on Paradise explains the fig tree as follows, they sowed fig leaves and made themselves girdles. As to the interpretation of fig in this place, we have a whole series of divine texts to instruct us. The scriptures record that those are secure who shelter beneath the vine and the fig, and Solomon has said, who plants a fig tree and does not eat of the fruit of it, and the Lord came to a fig tree and was offended at it because he found no fruit but leaves only. So I learned from Adam what those leaves are, for after he had sinned, he made himself girdles of the leaves of the fig, who should rather have tasted of its fruit. The righteous man chooses the fruit, the sin of the leaves. What is the fruit? The fruit of the Spirit, says the Apostle, is charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, modesty, continence, and love. He did not have fruit who did not have joy, he did not have faith who was about to transgress the precept of God, he did not have continence who tasted of the tree which was forbidden him. Therefore whosoever transgresses the precept of God is despoiled and stripped and naked, and becomes a thing abhorrent to himself, and wishes to cover himself with certain fig leaves, perhaps certain empty and obscure treatises, which the sinner stitches together with fabricated pronouncements, taking them word by word. To form a veil wherewith to cover up the shamefulness of his consciousness of thought and deed, that his shameful parts may be hidden. Thus he who desires to hide his own guilt, or records the fact that the devil is the author of his sin or draws attention to the traps into which the flesh may fall, or suggests some other agent for his transgression sows leaves on himself. And he often produces instances from the scriptures of just men falling into sin, quoting, If a man be taken in adultery, and Abraham sleeping with a handmaid, and David's love for the wife of another, and his taking her as wife. These leaves he sows to himself, these examples from the text of the prophetic scriptures, but the fruit of them he thinks he can do without. Do you not think that the Jews also sow on leaves when they interpret in a corporeal sense the words of the spiritual law? Their interpretation loses all the fruit of its verdure and is damned with the curse of eternal sterility. Therefore the good interpretation. 
namely the spiritual, is the fruitful fig tree under which the righteous and the saints take their rest, and he who has planted it in the souls of others, as Paul says I planted, Apollo watered, shall eat the fruit thereof. But the evil interpretation will not be able to bear fruit nor preserve its verdure. It was all the more serious then that Adam girdled himself with this interpretation in the place where he should have girdled himself with the fruit of chastity. You have heard Ambrose on the fig tree. Hear him now on the walk of God in paradise, that is, in human nature as he had created it in his own image, which he never abandoned nor gave over to destruction, in which after a mystic and spiritual manner he is always walking, examining the hearts and the reins of each, inquiring in an intelligible voice after the causes of our transgression, and rebuking and correcting us with a mercy greater than the justice of his vengeance. These, then, are the words of the said master. And they heard the voice of God as he was walking towards evening. What is meant by the walking of him who is always everywhere? But I think there is a kind of walking of God through the sequence of the holy scriptures, for they seem to be pervaded by the divine presence, as when we hear that he beholds all things, and that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and when we read that Jesus knew their thoughts, and when we read, Why think ye evil in your hearts? So when we recall these passages, we recognize the voice of the Lord as he is walking. So the sinner had run away not in order to hide from the sight of God, but because he desired to hide his works within his own conscience, not wishing them to be brought into the open. For to the righteous man it belongs to see God face to face, because the mind of the righteous man is not only present to God, but even reasons with God, as it is written, judge the child and justify the widow and come. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Therefore when the sinner reads the holy scriptures, he hears the voice of God as though walking towards evening. What can the words, towards evening, mean but the lateness of the recognition of his fault and of the shame that he has of it now that it has been committed, but which he should have felt before he committed it? For while sin boils up in the body, and the soul is agitated by the corporeal passions, the sense of the transgressor does not think of God, that is to say, he does not hear him walking in the holy scriptures, he does not hear him walking in the minds of men. For God says, seeing that I shall dwell among them, and walk among them, and I shall be their God. Therefore when the fear of the divine power returns into the senses of our soul, then we blush, then we try to hide ourselves, then are we taken in the consciousness of our sins, in the midst of the tree of paradise. Where we have committed our offences. Wishing to lie concealed, and thinking that God does not look into the hidden places. From these words of our master you may understand that that tree in the midst of paradise in which the fugitive sinners had thought they could hide themselves is none other than the secret places of man's thought and conscience but, he goes on, he who looks into our souls and our thoughts and penetrates even to the division of the mind said to the voice of Adam, Adam, where are you? In what way does God speak? With a corporeal voice? Not so, but by that power which is greater than the voice of the body, and which pours forth oracles, the voice which the prophets have heard, the voice which the faithful hear, the voice which the impious do not understand. Anyone who examines closely the meaning of such treatises may see for himself that paradise is not a localized or particular piece of woodland on earth, but a spiritual garden sown with the seeds of the virtues and planted in human nature. Or, to be more precise, is nothing else but the human substance itself created in the image of God, in which the tree of life, that is the word and wisdom of God, gives fruit to all life, and in the midst of which streams forth the fountain of all good things, which again is the divine wisdom. There that fig tree which is the divine law has its roots, of which the true and spiritual interpretation is the fruit of life to those who eat of it, that is to say, to those who devoutly and perfectly understand it, while the perverse and carnal interpretation according to the letter is the empty and unfruitful leaves with which the transgressors of the divine law strive to cover their faults by deceitful excuses, daring even to place the blame upon the lawgiver himself, or upon the devil or upon some other person, or comparing them with deeds which the holy patriarch symbolically performed, interpreting them literally in a carnal sense without at all understanding the spiritual meaning, and bringing forward such examples taken from the holy scriptures as relevant to their transgression, of whom the apostle aptly says, the letter kills but the spirit makes alive. In this intelligible paradise God goes walking. For he is the guardian and inspector of the garden which he has made in his image and likeness. His is the voice which cannot be expounded, Adam where are you? This is the voice of the Creator rebuking human nature. It is as if he said, where are you now after your transgression? For I do not find you there where I know that I created you, nor in that dignity in which I made you in my image and likeness, 
but I rebuke you as a deserter from blessedness, a fugitive form the true light, hiding yourself in the secret places of your conscience. And I inquire into the cause of your disobedience. Do you suppose that I do not know what you have done or whether you have fled or how in fear of my voice you have concealed yourself or in what way you came to a late recognition of your nudity, that is, of the purity and simplicity of the nature in which you were created? Have you not gone through all this because you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded that you were not to eat? For if you had not eaten perhaps you would not fear the voice of your Creator as He walks within you, nor flee from His face, nor have become aware of the nakedness which you lost when you sinned. Now although about the forbidden tree itself we have already said a great deal in the preceding chapters, taking Gregory of Nyssa as our guide, I think we must speak a little more about it, introducing this time the exposition of that most noble master, the monk Maximus. For he understands the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil to be the visible creature which man followed when he abandoned his creator. For within the visible creature is voluptuous delight and the occasion of anxiety and the fruit of death which is a kind of compound of the false good of lust and the evil of the sorrow which is to follow. For there is no pleasure provided by the visible creature which is not followed by want, and want is followed by anxiety and the sorrow of death. And although when pleasure smiles, the anxiety and cause of death lie hid, they are already there in the human soul, being born at the same instant. The anxiety lies concealed beneath the false beauty of pleasure and it is a kind of fruit compounded of manifest lust and latent anxiety, but when pleasure and delight in the visible creature begin to fade there remains revealed in all her nakedness the anxiety, which is born of the craving for the visible good which is no more. Saint Maximus writes as follows, were a man to say that the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil is the visible creature, he would not be far wrong. For it has the perception which naturally produces pleasure and anxiety. Or since the creature possesses both spiritual principles of visible things and the principles which nourish the mind, and again a natural power of delighting the sense, but of corrupting the mind, it is called the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. For considered under its spiritual aspect it has the knowledge of good, but taken corporally it has the knowledge of evil. For to those who receive that knowledge with their bodies it becomes the mistress of the passions, bringing upon them forgetfulness of divine things. Therefore God meanwhile intervened to forbid man to have perception of the visible creature, so that at first, as was very just, he might by participation of grace learn his proper cause, and the immortality with which he was through grace endowed, and might then through perception of this tree be perfected in impassibility and immutability. And as though made God by deification he might by communion with the blameless deity contemplate the creatures of God and have knowledge of them as a God and no longer as a man, having through grace in wisdom the same knowledge of the things that are as God has, because of the same transmutation of mind and sense to deification. This is the interpretation of the tree which must be accepted according to a solution which meets all the considerations. See how beautifully and how clearly he explains the meaning of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. It is, he says, the nature of visible things. Which when comprehended in a spiritual sense in its principle provides the knowledge of good, and a spiritual fruit to those who comprehend it. But those who incontinently lust after it in carnal concupiscence, and put it to a use contrary to the laws of God it infects with a deadly knowledge. Thus the cause of evil is not implanted in nature itself, but in the intemperance of those who use her wrongly. And this is that woman, or, I might say, that tree, of whom the Lord says, Whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. For the outward appearance of material things, although it is in its nature beautiful, gives occasion of death to the senses of those who incautiously and lustfully consider it. For God created the visible creature to this purpose, that through it, as through the invisible, his glory might abound, and that he, who cannot be known as to what he is, but that he is, might be known as the one creator of the whole creature, visible and invisible. And for that reason God forbade human nature to take pleasure in knowledge of the visible creature until it had attained the perfection of wisdom. In which having achieved deification it might reason together with God concerning the principles of visible things. Nor could that woman, that is to say, carnal sense, have enticed that man, that is to say, mind, to delight in the material creature exteriorly considered, if he had wished to possess the knowledge of the Creator before that of the created. The order of the divine law, then, was first to know the Creator and his ineffable beauty, and then to contemplate the creature with the reasonable sense controlled by the dictates of the mind and to refer all its beauty to the glory of God, whether the inner beauty of the principles or the outward beauty of the sensible forms. 
but man in his pride despises this order of the divine law, and places the love and knowledge of his creator beneath the outward beauty of the material creature, and thus incurs the danger of the wrath of God, and falls into the death of the body and the soul and the destruction of his whole nature, for he has neglected to observe the most just and beautiful order of the divine law. In speaking thus of the forbidden tree I have had regard for the interpretations of reputable commentators of Holy Scripture. The same interpretation is introduced by St. Augustine into the eleventh book of his Hexameron, but I am not unaware that it is the opinion of some that it was by their overhastiness that those first human beings anticipated their desire for the knowledge of good and evil, and because they wished, before the time was ripe. For that which was being reserved for them at a later and more opportune occasion, and that the object of the tempter's action was that by plucking too soon fruit that was not suitable for them they might offend against. God, and, exiled and damned, they might be debarred from the use of his creature, which had they approached at the proper time, as God willed, they could have profitably enjoyed. These things we have spoken for the benefit of such as may wish to take that tree not in the literal sense of a real tree with real fruit, but in a figurative sense, so that they may come to some conclusion that can be approved by right belief and truth. But our master Augustine seems neither to support nor reject this theory of a spiritual paradise, this is consistent with his belief that there were two paradises, the one earthly and local and possessing the properties of sensible nature, the other entirely spiritual, in the image of which the earthly and sensible one was made. Those who hold such opinions concerning the forbidden tree do not seem to me to depart from the truth. For it is likely and quite in accordance. I think, with sound reason, that man should have been driven by the most righteous judgment of his Creator away from the sweetness of the tree of life. That is to say, from the delights of the internal contemplation, in which and for which he was created, at the very moment that he began to feed on the forbidden tree, that is, to presume to make improper use of the sensual knowledge of sensible matter. For if he had followed the natural and rational procedure, that is, if he had first devoted the whole of his attention to the contemplation of the cause of all things, and then of the principles according to which and in which all things were made, he would neither have been excluded from the intelligible food of the tree of life, which is the internal awareness of the divine wisdom, nor have been prohibited from tasting the forbidden apple, which is the knowledge of visible matter. At the ripe and convenient time when that wisdom should have been perfected by which he should know first God and then the creature without error and without taking delight in the lusts of the flesh. For it is impossible that knowledge of the creature could be an impediment to the rational soul, in which the perfect contemplation of the Creator begins to shine forth. But where the observation of created nature precedes the knowledge of the Creator, there is no way of escaping the fantasies and illusions of sensible things. Consequently there cannot be freedom from error save in those who, bathed in the splendor of the divine ray, take the path of right contemplation and seek themselves and their God, for in these the knowledge of the Creator precedes the knowledge of the creature. Therefore, the creature is not evil, nor is the knowledge of it evil. But the perverse motion of the rational soul abandons the contemplation of her Creator and turns herself with lustful and illicit longing to the love of sensible matter. Pursuing a fatal path from which unless she is first set free by the grace of God there can be no return. For, as St. Augustine says, because human nature possesses free will she is capable of doing herself injury. But once she is wounded and disabled she is no longer capable through free will of healing herself. But now we must discuss the matters which still remain to be discussed. What remains? Fear has not enough been said about paradise? For of the action of the man when, rebuked by the voice of God, he brought the charge against the woman in order to attenuate his and her guilt by laying the blame upon him who had given him the woman, and of the action of the woman herself in transferring the cause of transgression to the serpent. I do not think it is necessary to speak, for the matter has been sufficiently discussed by the commentators of Holy Scripture. On the contrary, I think it both useful and necessary. For there may be those who think that these accusations by which the man laid the blame for sin upon the woman whom God had given him, and thus upon the giver of the woman, and the woman upon the serpent, are reasonable and justifiable defenses excusing them from punishment. Unless they are convicted by right reason and rejected as unjustified and reprehensible and shown to deserve the highest penalty which sin may be awarded. 
Let us consider the words of scripture itself, Adam said, the woman thou gavest me to be my companion, gave me of the tree and I did eat. Pray tell me, Adam, who gave you the woman? The Lord, you say, who made her? And why did he make her and give her to you? Why, when you were sleeping, that is to say, when you were turning the attention of your mind from the contemplation of truth to the love of a carnal spouse, did he take the rib from your side and make of it a woman and give her to you when you were sinning and abandoning him? Why did he not make the woman whom he gave you in the same way as he made yourself? You yourself, as is fit in one who chose earthly things for heavenly things, were made of the dust of the earth. It is fitting that the woman should have been taken out of your side, seeing that the cause of your transgression originated from yourself. You will reply, I think, that God made all these things because he willed them. And so he made them. Because he foresaw that they were so to be made, who made all things whatever he willed. But I am still asking you why he thus desired to make for you a woman. You will answer, who can investigate the causes of the will of God? For who knows the sense of the Lord? You do not know, therefore, for what reason God made the woman whom he gave you. I do not, you will say, unless it were for assistance in procreation and in the multiplication of the human nature which was made in me in the beginning and received from me the beginning of its propagation. Here I disagree with you and refute your contention by sound reason. For human nature would not have required the shameful mode of procreation by male and female which resembles that of the irrational animals if it had not by pride and contempt of the beauty of its simplicity in which it was created in the image of God abandoned the angelic mode of propagation which, as I have now said many times, is entirely independent of the sexual act. So you must look for another reason why the woman was given you. For the one which you have put forward is false. The image of God in which man was made is free and independent of all sexuality. I know of no other reason, you reply, save that which I have given and which I perceive that you have refuted. I am surprised to hear you say that you are ignorant of those things which happened as a result of your pride and disobedience. For I, who have sinned in you and in sin have died, am not ignorant. For there cries out in me a very clear and irrefutable reason, and one which bears the authority of many of the fathers. If human nature had remained in that most pure and most simple bliss of the divine image, it would never have succumbed to sexuality, nor ever have been subjected to the shameful manner of procreation of the irrational living creatures. But since it was not willing to continue in that dignity in which it was created, but chose to propagate its species ingloriously among the other animals, its creator himself, foreseeing all things which man would do and be, when he had been destroyed by the perverse motion of his free will, added to his nature the twofold sex to enable him to breed like the beasts. Why then do you transfer to the woman the guilt of your transgression, when it was from yourself, from your own pride and contempt and consequent desertion of God that the cause of the making of the woman proceeded? This is also made quite clear by God's ironical words, it is not good for man to be alone. Let us make for him a companion like unto him. The meaning is, man whom we have made in our image and likeness does not think it good to be alone, that is, to be a simple and perfect nature abiding everywhere without the division of his nature into sexes, being holy in the likeness of the angelic nature. But prefers to tumble down headlong into earthly couplings like the beasts and so to multiply out of his seed the unity of his nature through carnal generation and the sexual organs of his body. Holding in contempt the mode of propagation of the heavenly host. Let us then make for him a companion like unto him through whom he can perform what he longs to do, that is to say, a woman who is fragile and unstable like the male, and is eager for earthly lusts. This is indicated in the scriptures by anticipation, male and female created he them, vessels, that is, for the carnal procreation of offspring, since the dignity of the spiritual propagation and of the divine image were now despised. Why then do you attempt to transfer the cause of your transgression, which is attributable to yourself, upon the woman whom your Creator gave you, and indeed upon the Creator himself? Such a shift of the guilt is no defence but rather an aggravation of the offence. But perhaps someone will say that in maintaining that the division of human nature into male and female, by which sexual intercourse and matrimony and procreation and the increase of the species are made possible, were the penalties of transgression, we are attacking wedlock and the procreation of children. To such we would reply, we do not attack wedlock so long as it is a legitimate union for the purpose of procreating children and not for the gratification of lust. And so long as the faith and chaste modesty of each sex is preserved. Indeed we praise these institutions since they are permitted and ordained by God. For he says, increase and multiply and replenish the earth and none of the orthodox would doubt that each sex, without which carnal intercourse could not take place, is created by God. 
For the scripture says, male and female created he them, and in another place, what God hath joined let no man put asunder. On the other hand we unhesitatingly affirm that carnal intercourse, although it be the legitimate union of God-fearing persons, cannot be unaffected by the lustful and illicit itch of the flesh. For it is in this that children born after the flesh inherit the guilt of everlasting death, a guilt from which they are freed only by baptism into the Catholic Church. We further declare that those carnal couplings whereby human nature is propagated in space and time would not have been necessary if man had not chosen to adopt a method of procreation similar to that of the beasts of the field in exchange for the angelic mode of increasing his nature. Thus David says, man did not understand that he was in honour and so came to compare himself with the irrational beasts of the field, and was made like unto them. But let us turn now to the reply of the woman, in which she passes the blame for her sin on to the serpent. The Lord God said to the woman, Why have you done this? She replied. The serpent deceived me and I did eat. And you, woman, why do you transfer the charge to the serpent when you yourself are the creator of your sin? The very serpent to whom you attribute the fault creeps within yourself, carnal concupiscence and delight are your serpent, which is begot upon the corporeal sense by the motion of the irrational soul. Vainly, then does the woman, that is, the carnal sense, transfer her blame upon the serpent. That is, upon irrational delight, of which she herself is the origin. For the illicit delight in material things does not spring from nature but from the imperfect and irrational motions of the sinning soul who in her fatal lustfulness bursts through the corporeal sense into the love of sensible things. And the ancient enemy would not have had access to the male part of the soul, that is, the mind which is created in the image of God, unless first he had seduced the corporeal sense, which is, so to speak, a woman, and the mind would not have consented to the pernicious delight in material things and the monstrously abused enjoyment of the corporeal sense if proud presumption had not already existed in him. So the pride of the mind and the illicit delight of the corporeal sense by coupling together gave human nature over to death from which only the humility of Christ and the love of spiritual things in faithful souls won her back and set her free. So there is nothing and nobody. Woman, to blame for yourself save yourself, for you are proved to be yourself the author of that illicit desire upon which you attempt to shift the blame. In this connection you ought to study well the text of the divine words, which because of the sluggishness of our wits and the carnal senses which subject us, corrupted by our original sin, to this spatio-temporal existence, has set out as though taking place in space and time, but in a marvellous order full of mystic meaning, things which occurred simultaneously and which are not divided by any intervals of time. Thus the first to be interrogated is appropriately enough the man, that is, mind, for he presides over the whole paradise of human nature and should properly be the guardian who sees that the divine precept is not violated. And he is interrogated thus, Adam, where are you? Of which the meaning is, Adam, you who before you sinned were established beyond all space and time, where are you now? Transgressor. Answer me. You were in heaven, a blessed creature, like unto the angels, you are now on earth, proud creature, like unto the brutes. Then it is the woman's turn to he questioned, and she is asked why she did what she did. Note here that the sentence of the examining judge is not given upon the man and the woman together, but time seems to be allowed for the correction of their wicked excuses, and space is given for indulgence. At last, however, when the serpent's turn comes, he is not interrogated, nor is any time allowed him to shift the blame onto some other person or thing, for that he could not do, being the primordial cause of all evil, but the sentence of the righteous judge follows on him immediately. For God says to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed art thou among all animals and among the beasts of the field. Notice that neither the man nor the woman but only the serpent is cursed. For God does not curse the things which he made, but blesses them, and mind and sense are both creatures of God. But carnal delight arises outside of divine creation from the irrational passions of the human soul, and therefore comes under the severity of the divine sentence, because it supervenes from outside on the nature which was created by God. So this cursing of God is nothing else but the most righteous and irrevocable condemnation of the things which are outside nature and defile it. But the significance of those living creatures and beasts of the field in which principally resides the carnal delight by means of which the devil seduces the soul and lives as it were in his principal abode is excellently and exhaustively expounded by Saint Ambrose in his book on Paradise. They are all the irrational passions of our rational nature which is signified in scripture by the word earth.
Do not let it surprise you that both carnal delight and the subtlety of the devil are indiscriminately signified as though mingled together under the figure of the serpent, for sometimes the serpent is a direct representation of the devil himself, at others of the lustful appetite of the carnal soul, that is, the soul which lives according to the flesh, which is caught in his toils, at others again it is a confused and indistinct representation of both, implying that the one is involved in the other, for the one cannot exist in separation from the other. For wherever there is a lustful thought in the soul, there at once will be an entrance for the unclean spirit, and wherever there is an entrance for his diabolical subtlety, there will be present the itch of universal evil. And in whatever corporeal sense, which is signified by the woman, these two come together, there must necessarily follow the illicit tasting, or wrong use, of the forbidden fruit of the beauty of material objects, and this brings death to the soul, of which death the death of the body is the shadow. But concerning the curse which damned the serpent and the sentences which were delivered upon the woman and her husband Adam, sentences in which there was more of mercy than of vengeance, I think it would be superfluous for me to speak now. For it will not be considered necessary for me to expound what has already been satisfactorily expounded by the Holy Fathers, for why, it might be asked, should we repeat what has been made so clear and plain in their writings, as though we thought we could produce a better explanation? God forbid that this should be thought of us, who are barely able to follow in their footsteps. It certainly would not seem necessary if this were not the only occasion when you have experienced such diffidence. But it will seem strange and inconsistent with the method and exposition of your discourse if, after having considered it proper to speak of practically all that the Scripture has recorded concerning the nature of the spiritual paradise and the things that were created in it, although your disquisition was little more than a cursory and brief epitome of the opinions of the Holy Fathers, this one passage you should have left wholly untouched, passing it by in odd silence. Therefore, it is not right that you should entirely ignore these matters but rather give a brief, but plain account of them. Let us hear the consideration of the divine indignation against the serpent. On thy belly shalt thou go. On earth shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. We have already said that in this passage the scripture describes the serpent as signifying both the subtlety of the devil and the indulgence of the flesh, and both bound together in an indiscriminate and indissoluble embrace. Good. And lucid and not inconsistent with the truth. Good, and lucid, and not inconsistent with the truth. The belly of this serpent is the prudence of the flesh in which the cunning of the devil's deceitfulness is dominant. And his belly is also empty and false-sounding wisdom which does not edify the mind but only inflates it. Thus the serpent's belly is both carnal prudence and empty and false wisdom, both of which God shall bring to destruction, I shall destroy the wisdom of the wise and the prudence of the prudent shall I reprove. But if you ask what is the difference between the prudence of the flesh and empty philosophy, here is a formula which discriminates the one from the other, the prudence of the flesh is the false virtue which paints the vices with the colours of virtues, which shades wickedness to resemble goodness, which clothes baseness in the garment of honour, but the true and simple virtues it conceals by drawing them out of the sight of the mind so that it may not be able to recognise their pure face. And thus it deceives the carnal senses and deludes and ruins souls with deceitful images of false virtues and brings them down to the darkness of eternal death. Empty and useless wisdom is best exemplified among the perfidious Jews and venomous heretics, it is the wisdom which follows only the letter of Holy Scripture, and hates, despises, neglects and has no knowledge of the spirit or mystical sense of it, it is that which deludes the souls of carnal men by inventions entirely devoid of truth about the nature of the universe despising the truth of the natural principles in accordance with which the universal creature was created, and drawing attention by the use of strange and far-fetched expressions to its pompous and grandiloquent style, or disguising itself by means of the tortuous intricacies of false propositions and syllogisms under the form of truth which shall deceive the unwary. Of these two vices, therefore, the belly of the serpent, that is to say, the subtlety of the devil and the enticement of fleshly indulgence, is composed. It is upon this, his belly, that is, that the serpent goes, that is, on which he is raised and in which he boasts, usurping the human state. This may be understood from the words of the prophet, for he did not simply say, upon your belly shall you creep or crawl, but, figuratively, on your belly shall you walk. This of course is a figurative expression for no one would claim that the serpent was literally a walking animal and not a creeping one. But no creeping animal goes erect upon the earth, they all drag themselves along the ground. But everything which walks must before it starts to walk be raised from the ground. 
therefore upon thy belly shalt thou walk means, you shall be raised up in pride upon your subtlety and cunning, which is composed of empty wisdom and carnal prudence, by which you have deceived deluded man and reduced him to your power, and have bound him in the chains of sin, and have merged him in the whirlpool of eternal death, and you shall walk towards the increase of vices and the accumulation of your damnation, elated and vainglorious in the success of your evil in the hearts of infidels. An earth shalt thou eat means you shall feed upon the earthly cogitations, and the carnal desires and the deadly deeds of those who hanker after earthly things. All the days of thy life means for as long as your kingdom, like a false light, shall shine and prevail over human nature. For not forever will you reign a conqueror over the divine image. But either man will while yet in this life be set free from your power that is in Christ the Redeemer, or generally at the end of the world, when death the last enemy will be destroyed through the same Christ who is the Word of God, and human nature will be universally restored to its pristine state. I shall place enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Woman is the corporeal sense which is naturally implanted in human nature, through which, in those, that is, who are perfect, the beauty of the visible creature is referred to the glory of God. Between this, that is to say, the woman, and the serpent, who is the lustful indulgence in material beauty and the subtlety of the devil which resides in it, a great enmity has been established by God. For the woman, that is to say, the perfect sense of the perfect, hates the carnal desire for material things, but the serpent has a hostile intent towards spiritual and divine virtues. And between thy seed and her seed. The seed of the woman is the perfect, natural and multiple knowledge of visible things, free from all error. For it is to this end that corporeal sense is established in man, that by means of fantasies it might become the intermediary between the sensibles and the intelligibles. But the seed of the serpent is the deadly increase of innumerable transgressions, a fact of which no true philosopher is ignorant. She shall bruise thy head. The head, or beginning, of the serpent is compounded as it were of two parts, for every evil has taken its origin from the irrational motion of rational nature and the hateful subtlety of the devil. And this head is bruised by the sense of the perfect and faithful because the subtlety of the devil does not deceive them, nor do they offer any entry to the secret and creeping approach of the first promptings of sin, nor do they accommodate access to the irrational motion. Although that head is regarded as one, it is divided into a number that is infinite, for the universal evil is so manifold that there is no part of it from which the seeds of the vices may not spring. And this multitude is crushed by that woman to whom Solomon is referring when he says, Who shall find a virtuous woman, that is to say, the virtue and wisdom which lodge in the senses of the perfect and faithful. The prophetic author of the Psalms also refers to this woman when he says, Thou hast broken the heads of the dragon and thou hast given him as food for the people of the Ethiopians. The people of the Ethiopians are the multitudes of the nations which believed in Christ. And which are symbolized figuratively under the form of this woman. Of whom Isaiah says, The people which sat in darkness have seen a great light. For by Ethiopians are meant those who are darkened or humiliated by virtue of their changed condition, and it is a description which may be appropriately applied to the people of the Gentiles who, before the coming of the true light, which is God the Word, were in darkness, that is to say, were surrounded by the darkness of ignorance and the most dense cloud of eternal death. But when they have humbled themselves and accept the faith, they are enlightened and refreshed by a spiritual repast, which the divine wisdom prepares from the bruised heads of the dragon, that is, from the pluralities of universal evil which he has overcome. The psalmist says of this dragon, the dragon himself which thou hast formed to be deluded. The dragon himself, the devil, that is, and his universal body, that is, the plenitude of universal evil. Is that which thou hast formed to be deluded by thy saints who outwit his pernicious and deceitful ambush? lay bare and destroy the stratagems of evil with which he attempts to demolish the bastions of goodness, and shatter with the hammers of the virtues the principles of evil which sprout from him in abundance. This opinion is consistent with the words of the holy Job, this is the beginning of the creation of God, which he created that it might be deluded by his angels. But how can that spiritual dragon with all his members which follow after him in evil be called a divine creation or formation? There are two ways in which he may be called so. Firstly, because all the rebellious angels and all men who follow them have been created, in so far as they subsist in their natures, by God, they are not improperly called a divine creation and formation. Secondly, because symbolical expressions like these, which occur in such passages of scripture as these, do not always signify the natures of demons or wicked men in which the creator of all things established them. But those parts which were added as a punishment for the disobedience of both the angelic, and the human creature to the essence which was created in them. For example, 
the aerial bodies of demons and the earthly members of mortal men which should unhesitatingly be accepted, and understood as the penalty for transgression, which has been added to the simplicity of the nature which was created by God. But as to whether the nature of the demons shall be set free from the aerial bodies which have been added to it in the same way as human nature, assisted by the grace of its Redeemer, shall at the moment of the resurrection be liberated from its animal and corruptible bodies, must be discussed in another place. And now a brief summary. Not only the celestial powers which never abandoned their creator, but also the rebellious powers shall eternally and inseparably possess those natural bodies which were made at the creation of the angels, for these bodies are spiritual and therefore incorruptible. But what is added thereto from the qualities of this world in punishment for their wickedness grows old as doth a garment with that from which it was taken and so may be regarded as perishable. Therefore when the prophet says, that dragon which thou formedst to be deluded, it seems that we should not be far from the truth in taking him to mean by the dragon the deadly subtlety of the devil and his members whether found in angels or in evil men, by the creation or formation, for there is a disagreement in the interpretations of the Hebrew expression which have been made for the service of the church, either their nature in which before their fall they were established by God, or that which was added to them in consequence of their pride. But in whatsoever way we interpret creation and formation, whether as nature, or as what is added to nature, the devil with his whole body was made to be outwitted by the saints and the holy angels not as to the nature in which he was created, but as to his future state when through pride he should have abandoned the dignity of his nature. For he will be outwitted by the angels of God because by the goodwill and grace of their creator they remain fixed in that state of happiness in which they were created, whereas he Deceived by his proud ignorance which prevented him from foreknowing his fall, for had he known perhaps he would have taken steps to avoid it, and puffed up with the rage of envy, of his own will tumbled into his misery. But righteous men who have been set free and enlightened by their devotion towards their Creator and Redeemer outwit him when, seeing through his disguise of goodly shape and the speciousness with which he tempts them into vice, and the deadly poison of wickedness, at once bruise his head, and grind with the teeth of inward discrimination the spiritual food, which is the divine providence, and which distinguishes vices from virtue so that no subtle guile may deceive them, and feed on the pure banquets of the good which are cleansed from all admixture of evil. Nor is their woman, that is, their sense, deceived by the beauty of material objects. Through which by the mediation of lustful delight the ancient serpent pours the deadly poison of the vices into the minds of imprudent men. Therefore the woman, or sense, which incited, moved, assisted, supported and led to the perfection of action and contemplation by the virtues of the stronger woman which is the word of God, distinguishes evil from good, and bruises the head of the serpent and the primordial heads of diabolical suggestion and crafty delights, whereby these righteous men win joy and divine refreshment. For what greater joy can there be for those who spend their lives after the spirit than first to conquer in themselves the serpentine and lustful wiles of the devil, and then to ward them off from those of the faithful who are less advanced in action and contemplation than they, lest they too be captivated by the same tricks of the deceiver? And thou shalt lay siege to her heel. The heel of the woman, who is, is the fantasies of sensible things, that is to say, the images which are imprinted by the corporeal manifold upon the five senses. Therefore, that heel must be fivefold. For it is divided into the familiar five organs of sense, namely, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. Now, some of these extend far beyond the framework of the perceiving body, like sight and hearing. For I behold the sun and the moon and the other stars, which are situated far from that place where the mass of my little body roams. For where they are, there I behold them in the rays of my eyes which dart out thither without a moment's delay, and in which are formed the fantasies of the aforementioned stars. You see then how far, in the organ of vision, this woman can extend her heel. The same applies to those things which are near, or in the middle distance. We find the same property in the function of the natural organ of hearing. For hearing fares forth from the confines of the body to receive imprinted upon it the forms of sounds or voices which are produced by the clashing of symbols either from near or from afar. But others of the senses, in the opinion of many who study their nature, are retained within the limits of the body, such as smell and taste. But there are some who think that the sense of smell leaps out of the body, and their opinion is not to be despised, for we can smell odors, either good or otherwise, which originate at some little distance from our bodies but as to touch no physicist doubts but that it operates both inside and outside the body. 
for it exercises its power alone and without the other senses, whereas none of the other four can without its cooperation fulfill their function, neither can vision see unless it touches what it sees, nor hearing hear unless it touches what it hears, nor smell smell unless it touches what it smells, nor taste taste unless it touches what it tastes. This, then, is the heel of the woman, the fivefold sense formed by the fantasies of sensible things, to which the subtle serpent lay siege. To the sense of sight it lay siege when it persuades unwary souls to lust dangerously after the beauty of shapes and colours. And we must think in the same way of the harmony of voices, the suavity of odours and the delights of savours and of those things which are in the reach of the sense of touch. All these things, when perceived by the soul through the corporeal sense with imprudent desire, that is, with carnal concupiscence, distill the mortal poison of disobedience to the divine precepts, and nourish the seeds of all the sins. This is what is meant by the earlier scriptural passage, in which it is said, Therefore the woman saw that the tree was good to eat and fair to look upon and of a pleasing aspect, and she took of the fruit and did eat, and gave unto her husband. The woman here is a figurative expression of the exterior sense, which is entranced and deceived by the fantasies of sensible things, while the man signifies the mind, which by illicitly consenting unto the corporeal senses, is corrupted, that is to say, separated from the contemplation of the innermost truth. To the woman also he said, I will multiply thy sorrows and thy conceptions, in labour shalt thou bring forth thy sons. Here it is clearly given to understand that if man had not sinned he would have contemplated the natures and the principles of all things in a most pure manner with the utmost ease not only by the interior intellect but also with the exterior sense, for he would have been freed from the necessity of all logical discourse. But after he had sinned, the mind perceives through the corporeal sense only the surfaces of sensible things, with their quantities and qualities, their positions, their conditions, and the other aspects which submit to corporeal perception and all these it reaches not in themselves, but through their fantasies, in interpreting which, its judgment very frequently errs. Therefore not without the manifold labours of study, which scripture calls the sorrows of the woman, can he arrive by means of the same sense at a multitude of conceptions, that is, at the rudiments of an understanding of intelligible beings, and at the procreation of sons, that is to say, of right judgment concerning nature. Now it is for this that the divine authority imposes upon the exterior sense the sorrows and the conceptions and the sons, because every work of wisdom and every conception of the mind and pure knowledge of truth take their origin from the bodily sense, for reason ascends step by step from lower to higher things, and from outer to inner. And thou shalt be under authority of the man, and he shall be lord over thee. Here the divine voice promises the restoration of the natural order of human nature, and the return to the condition in which it was first created. For the natural order should be as follows, the mind subordinated to the authority of its creator and remaining ever obedient to him, and then the sense freely subject to the authority and injunction of the mind, and finally the body subordinated to the sense. For so the creature would be at peace and in harmony in itself and with its creator. But now after the transgression of the divine mandate, this order, for the preservation of which man was created, and this peace and communion between creator and created, is upset. For of his own accord and under no compulsion but corrupted by his love of sensible things, man has abandoned his God, although there is no other good in our substance but to abide in him. Therefore God, wishing to humiliate the pride of human nature, permitted man to abuse his own irrational but willed motions, so that he might himself become a proof of what the grace of his Creator and the reward of obedience would have conferred on him, and what the irrational emotions and the proud transgression of God's mandate had brought him. And hereupon there followed a kind of divorce between the male and the female, that is, between mind and sense. For the corporeal senses did not obey the precepts of mind according to the laws of nature. And this divorce has been clearly and beautifully alluded to by the Apostle, in my mind I serve the law of God, but in my flesh the law of sin. By flesh he means the carnal sense which disobediently resists the rational motions of the mind even in those who are perfect. In another place he writes, I see in my members another law which contendeth with the law of my mind, making me captive unto the law of sin. You see here the discord between the law of the mind and the law of carnal sense, which dominates the members of those who live according to the flesh, and contends with the minds of those who live according to the spirit in mortal members for the exercise of virtue, and for that reason is called by the apostle the law of sin, that is, of carnal sense. But when our nature is restored and recalled to its proper order, this discord and divorce shall be changed into the peace of a spiritual and natural wedlock, in which the body will conform and be subject to the sense the sense to the mind, and the mind to God. 
This becomes clearer to us if we examine the Septuagint text, and thy conversion shall be towards thy husband, and he shall be the Lord over thee, words which express most clearly the return of human nature to its former order. Now in the words to man which seem to be written in the form of a curse, and the earth shall be accursed in thy work, etc., it is not easy to see what is meant by that earth which is accursed in punishment for the transgression of the mind. Which is the male part of human nature, nor what is meant by the curse itself, whether it is the severity of God's wrath, or a kind of mystical rebuke, nor is it clear to see why the mind itself, which committed the fault by listening to the voice of the woman and eating the forbidden fruit, did not incur the curse, nor what those labours may be in which he devours the accursed earth, nor what the days of the life of the mind, nor of what kind are the thorns and tares which the earth is. To bring forth, nor its grass which he devours, nor the sweat, nor the face, nor the return of the mind into the earth from which it was formed, nor the dust. No problem, or at least, no very serious one, arises if these things are given, as by many authors, an historical interpretation, that is to say, are regarded as sensible objects occurring on this earth which is inhabited by man and arise from it. But if they are taken as referring to human nature itself, as in the case of the earlier discussion about paradise, they require a considerable amount of elucidation. In the opinion of St. Augustine, they are, on the one hand, to be taken as actual historical events, and, on the other, as containing a prophetic meaning, as he writes in the eleventh book of the Hexameron, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I had commanded you that of that only you should not eat, the earth is accursed in your works. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth for you, and you shall eat the grass of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return to the earth from which you were taken, for earth you are and unto earth shall you return. Who, asks Saint Augustine, does not know this, that these are labours of the human race on earth? Nor can it be doubted that they would not have been if that felicity had been preserved which had existed in paradise. There is therefore no objection in taking the words in the first instance in their normal meaning. But we should also look for and preserve the prophetic significance which particularly at this point is intended by God when he speaks. You see how he bids us that this text of Holy Scripture be given both a literal and a figurative interpretation? He does not, however, in this book explain what the prophetic and figurative meaning is. Had he done so, I think it would have been sufficient for us. And we should not have asked for another explanation. But since he does not, let us, with the help of God, hold a brief inquiry into the meaning of these words which were spoken by God. Let us do so. For they should not be passed over altogether. It will be sufficient, I think, to put forward the solution of the blessed monk Maximus. And in order that that solution may be expressed the more clearly, let us propose his inquiry. We could do no otherwise. In the fifth chapter of his Scolia, then, he proposes the following problem. What is the allegorical interpretation of the earth which is accursed in the works of Adam, and his eating of it in sorrow, and his feeding on the grass of the field after the growth of thorns and thistles, and lastly his eating of bread in the sweat of his face? For no man was ever seen eating earth or grass, nor is it recorded in the judgment of history that man ever ate bread in the sweat of his face. Answer, the earth itself, accursed in the works of Adam, is the flesh of Adam, which is always created by the works of Adam. These works are the passions of his knowing mind. It is cursed with a barrenness of virtues, that is of the works of God. This earth he eats in anxiety and much sorrow, enjoying its own brief pleasure. And this flesh, through this corrupting enjoyment, spawns in him thoughts and cares like thorns, and great temptations and dangers like thistles an irrational fury and luxurious concupiscence which all prick him on all sides. So that it is well nigh impossible for him to get and feed on, that is, achieve, the health and integrity of that flesh, for it is like withered grass, and then after many appalling vicissitudes he eats bread in the sweat of his face, that is, in that very lowliness of the flesh in its sense and in the toil of tedious consideration for sensible things, he gets the bread to sustain this present life, either by skill or by some other device provided for the maintenance of this life. Or is the earth rather the accursed heart of Adam which through transgression is exiled from the celestial goods? This earth, through practical philosophy, he eats with many tribulations, purged as it is through consciousness by the cursing of the baseness of its works, and again, subjecting to reason thoughts germinated in it, like thorns, concerning the generation of bodies and teeming ideas, like thistles. Concerning the providence and judgment of incorporeals, it plucks, spiritually, as it were grass, a physical contemplation. And thus, 
as though in the knowable sweat of the face of intelligence he eats the bread of theology in accordance with the knowledge whose face is incorruptible, the bread which alone is the bread of life and which preserves the generation of those who eat of it to incorruptibility. So the earth if well eaten is itself a purge through the action of the heart, but the grass is knowledge itself based on the contemplation of the nature of those things which have been created, but the bread is true doctrine based on the theology of the mysteries. Thus far Maximus. Now I think that the days of the life of the mind in which it tolls purging the earth of its heart signify not only those days through which the seasons, of the present life pass and in which the body is sustained by the soul, but also that temporal interval in which the souls, relinquishing the control of their bodies, abide in another life until they take back their bodies. For we believe that souls can be purged both in this present life, which soul and body spend in company, and in the other life after the death of the body, that is, after its dissolution and its return into the four cosmic elements from which it was gathered up and composed, until the end of the world and the resurrection of the bodies and the day of judgment. These then are the days in which the mind eats the earth of its heart, that is, performs the function of purgation. For after the end of the sensibles we read that no further purgation will be practiced for then will have occurred the return of nature to its original purity. And perhaps this is the meaning of the text, until you return to the earth from which you were taken, which could be interpreted, for such a length of time your face, that is, the rational inquiry into truth, will sweat from the labors of your purgation in practice and theory. Until you return to the earth from which you were taken. That is to say, into the immutable stability of the primordial causes, from which you derive your origin. When you have arrived there you will sweat no longer. Now there are many scriptural passages which clearly indicate that by the term earth, is meant the bliss of eternal life and the stability of the primordial causes, from which all things which are have their origin. For instance, to Abraham it is said, Go forth from thy country and from thy kin and from thy father's house, and come unto the land which I shall have shown unto thee. And later, Abraham set out thence and came to a southern country, and dwelt between Cades and Assur, that is, between sanctification and beatification, where all the bliss of the saints is established in eternal rest. For being sanctified, that is, being purged from every disease of body and soul, they shall live in bliss according to the laws of nature. And if we consider another meaning of Assur, which is Mesopotamia, we shall find a more estimable subject for contemplation and one most apt to the present matter. For Mesopotamia is so called because it is in the midst between the rivers. Now, are we to believe that the abode of the holy souls and of the whole of restored human nature will be anywhere but in the midst between the rivers of the virtues? These rivers which flow from the source of all good things? And what else but this is mystically signified by the land of promise to which the people of God were led after they had been set free from the Egyptian captivity and slavery? This is the land of the living, in which the saints shall possess a double blessing, that of the body and that of the soul. It is of this too that the Lord himself speaks when he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But the following phrase, Earth thou art and unto earth shalt thou return, or, according to another version. For dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return, can be understood as follows, since the mind's nature, which is made in the image and likeness of God, took its origin from the fertile soil of the primordial causes we therefore believe that it must of necessity return there. And if it be asked why in the other translation this earth is given the name of dust, there can be no other reason than that, as it is from the dust of the sensible earth, that all things born of earth take the cause of their birth, so the numerical multiplicity of all things visible and invisible is generated from the fertility of the primordial causes, and at the end of the world shall return to it again. But this we say not in refutation of the simplicity of those who accept the historical truth of this scriptural passage and who try to maintain that these words signify the dissolution of the human body into the four elements of this world, which are included under the general term of earth, although they do not perceive what great difficulties lie in this interpretation. For if the voice of God spoke thus about the dissolution of the body, why was it predicted of the man alone? Why not of the woman also, whose body is no less destined for dissolution? Again, why does divine reproach condemn the whole man to dissolution, when it is only the lowest and least valuable parts of him, namely the body and the bodily sense, that are dissolved, while the natural simplicity of the soul, free from all compositeness, by no means undergoes dissolution but remains forever indissoluble, whether its movements are rational or irrational. Unless perhaps they would say that we are to take this passage as a synecdoche, a figure which occurs very frequently in Holy Scripture, whereby the part is understood from the whole. This is possible if the words are taken to refer not to the mind itself but to the male sex alone which is extended to include the female sex. 
Finally why do they not observe that the works speak not so much of dissolution or corruption as of restoration? For at the very moment when the corruptible and mortal body is done away, the incorruptible and immortal is restored. For no one's body is destined to return to corruption. So these words foretell the return, not into this earth, but rather to the spiritual nature. But let each choose the theory he will, I, however, taking my reasoning from the opinions of the Holy Fathers, of Ambrose and Augustine, and also of the Venerable Gregory Nazianzen who is also called the Nicene, Eringina sometimes confounds the two Gregories, and of his commentator Maximus the monk, have put what seemed to me the more probable opinion before you, sometimes in answer to your questions, sometimes in comments upon your expositions. And as there are certain things which at the beginning of this book we promised to discuss, but which its lengthiness has prevented us from mentioning, we must postpone the examination of them to the next volume. And in the same volume we have also determined to treat at some length of the return of the natures into their primordial causes and into that nature which neither creates nor is created, that nature which is God himself. But if you are impatient to know why it is said of the divine nature that it neither creates nor is created. I will say a few words here by way of foretaste. The divine nature, therefore, for this reason is believed not to be created because it is the primal cause of all, and there is no principle beyond it from which it can be created. On the other hand, because after the return of the created universe of things visible and invisible into its primordial causes which are contained within the divine nature, there is no further creation of nature from the divine nature nor any propagation of sensible or intelligible species, for in it all will be one, just as even now in their causes they are one and always have been so. Therefore we can rightly believe and understand that this nature creates nothing. For what should it create when it alone is all in all things? And now, if you agree, let us put an end to this book lest it run on too far. I quite agree. For I have been anticipating the end for some time.